The First Book of Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso, Book One by Ludovico Ariosto. The Argument Charles hath the foil, Angelica flies thence. Rinaldo's horse, hope him his love to find. Ferra with him doth fight in her defence. She flies again, they stay not long behind. Argalius' ghost reproves Ferra's offence. The Spaniard to new vows himself doth bind. His mistress' presence sacrament enjoyeth. With Bradamant, Rinaldo him annoyeth. Of dames, of knights, of arms, of love's delight, of courtesies, of high attempts I speak. Then when the Moors transported all their might on Afric's seas, the force of France to break, incited by the youthful heat and spite of Agramant their king, that vowed to wreak the death of King Triano, lately slain upon the Roman Emperor Charlemagne. I will no less Orlando's acts declare, a tale in prose no verse yet sung or said, who fell bestraught with love, a hap most rare to one that erst was counted wise and stayed, if my sweet saint that causeth my like care my slender muse affords some gracious aid, I make no doubt but I shall have the skill as much as I have promised to fulfill. Vouchsafe, O prince of most renowned race, the ornament and hope of this our time, to accept this gift presented to your grace by me your servant rudely here in rhyme. And though I paper pay and ink in place of deeper debt, yet take it for no crime. It may suffice a poor and humble debtor to say, and if he could, it should be better. Here shall you find, among the worthy peers whose praises I prepare to tell in verse, Rogero, him from whom in ancient years your princely stems derived I rehearse, whose noble mind by princely acts appears, whose worthy fame even to the sky doth pierce. So you vouchsafe my lowly style and base Among your high conceits a little place. Orlando, who long time had loved dear Angelica the fair, And for her sake about the world in nations far and near Did high attempts perform and undertake, Returned with her into the west that year That Charles's power against the Turks did make, And with the force of Germany and France Near Pyrene Alps his standard did advance. To make the kings of Afric and of Spain Repent their rash attempts and foolish vaunts, One having brought from Afric in his train All able men to carry sword or lance, The other moved the Spaniards now again To overthrow the goodly realm of France. And hither, as I said, Orlando went, But of his coming straight he did repent. For here, behold how human judgments are, And how the wiser sort are oft mistaken, his lady, whom he guarded had so far, Nor had in fights nor dangers great forsaken, Without the dint of sword or open war, Amid his friends, away from him was taken. For Charles the Great, a valiant prince and wise, Did this to quench a broil that did arise. Between Orlando and Rinaldo late, There fell about Angelica some brawl, And each of them began the t'other hate. This lady's love had made them both so thrall. But Charles, who much mislikes that such debate Between such friends should rise on cause so small, To Namus of Bevere in keeping gave her, And suffered neither of them both to have her, But promised he would presently bestow The damsel fair on him that in that fight The plainest proof should of his prowess show, And danger most the pagans with his might. But the while the Christians take the blow, their soldiers slain, their captains put to flight. The duke himself, Namus, a prisoner there was taken, his tent was quite abandoned and forsaken. Where, when the damsel fair a while had stayed, that for the victor pointed was a prey, she took her horse, no further time delayed, but secretly conveyed herself away, for she foresaw and was full sore afraid that this to Charles would prove a dismal day, and riding through a wood she happed to meet a knight that came against her on his feet, his curates on, his helmet not undone, 
Picked his sword and target ready to the same, And through the wood so swiftly he did run, As they that go half naked for a game. But never did a shepherd's daughter shun More speedily a snake that on her came, Than fair Angelica did take her flight When as she once had knowledge of the knight. This valiant knight was lord of Claremont, That is, Rinaldo. Duke Ammon's son, as you shall understand, who, having lost his horse on good account, that by mishap was slipped out of his hand, he followed him in hope again to mount, until this lady's sight did make him stand, whose face and shape proportioned were so well, they seemed the house where love itself did dwell. But she that shuns Rinaldo all she may, upon her horse's neck doth lay the rein. Through thick and thin she gallopeth away, Ne makes she choice of beaten way or plain, But gives her palfrey leave to choose the way. And, being moved with fear and with disdain, Now up, now down, she never leaves to ride, Till she arrived by a riverside. Fast by the stream, Farah she sees anon, a Saracen who, noyed in part with dust and part with sweat, out of the battle hither came alone, with drink his thirst, with air to swage his heat. And, minding back again to have been gone, he was detained with an unlooked-for let. Into the stream by hap his helmet fell, and how to get it out he cannot tell. And hearing now the noise and mournful cry of one with piteous voice demanding aid, Seeing the damsel eke approaching nigh, That not but health against Rinaldo prayed, What white it was he guessed by and by, Though looking pale like one that had been frayed, And though she had not late been in his sight, He thought it was Angelica the bright. And being both a stout and courteous knight, And love a little kindling in his breast, He promised straight to aid her all he might, And to perform whatever she request. And though he want an helmet, yet to fight with bold Rinaldo he will do his best, and both the one and the other straight defied, oft having either other's value tried. Between them two a combat fierce began, with strokes that might have pierced the hardest rocks. While they thus fight on foot and man to man, and give and take so hard and heavy knocks, away the damsel posteth all she can, their pain and travel she requites with mocks. So hard she rode, while they were at their fight, That she was clean escaped out of sight. When they long time contended had in vain, Who should remain the master of the field, And that with force, with cunning, nor with pain, That one of them could make the other yield, Rinaldo first did move the knight of Spain, Although he used such courtesy but seld, To make a truce. Ne was he to be blamed, for love his heart, to other fight inflame it. You thought, said he, to hinder me alone, but you have hurt yourself as much or more. You see the fair Angelica is gone, so soon we lease that erst we sought so sore. Had you me tain or slain, your gain were none, sith you were ne'er the near your love therefore. For whiles we two have made this little stay, she lets us both alone and goes her way. But if you love the lady as you say, Then let us both agree to find her out. To have her first will be our wisest way, And when of holding her there is no doubt, Then by consent let her remain his prey That with his sword can prove himself most stout. I see naught else, after our long debate, How either of us can amend his state. Ferraw, that felt small pleasure in the fight, Agreed a sound and friendly league to make. They lay aside all wrath and malice quite, And at the parting from the running lake The pagan would not let the Christian knight To follow him on foot for manner's sake, But praise him out behind his horse's back, And so they seek the damsel by the track. O oh, ancient knights of true and noble heart, They rivals were, one faith they lived not under, Beside they felt their bodies shrewdly smart Of blows late given, and yet, Behold a wonder, through thick and thin, Suspicion set apart, like friends they ride, And parted not asunder until the horse, With double spurring drived, Unto a way which parts in two arrived. And being neither able to describe Which way was gone Angelica the bright, Because the track of horses' feet, Whereby they seek her out, Appear alike in sight, They part, 
and either will his fortune try. The left hand won, the other takes the right. The Spaniard, when he wandered had a while, came whence he went, the way did him beguile. He was arrived but there with all his pain, where in the ford he let his helmet fall. And of his lady, whom he loved in vain, he now had little hope, or none at all. His helmet now he thinks to get again, and seeks it out. But seek it while he shall, it was so deeply sunken in the sand, he cannot get it out at any hand. Hard by the bank, a tall young poplar grew, which he cut down, thereof a pole to make, with which each place in feeling and in view to find his skull he up and down doth rake. But lo! A hap unlooked for doth ensue. While he such needless, fruitless pain doth take, he saw a knight arise out of the brook, breast high, with visage grim and angry look. The knight was armed at all points save the head, and in his hand he held the helmet plain, that very helmet, that such care had bred in him that late had sought it with such pain. And looking grimly on Ferrar, he said, Ah, faithless wretch, in promise false and vain, it grieves thee now this helmet so to miss, that should of right be rendered long ere this. Remember, cruel pagan, when you killed me, brother to Angelica the bright. You said you would, as I then dying willed, mine armor drown when finished were the fight. Now, if that fortune have the thing fulfilled which thou thyself shouldst have performed in right, grieve not thyself, or if thou wilt be grieved, grieve that thy promise cannot be believed. But if to want an helmet thou repine, get one wherewith thine honor thou mayst save. Such hath Orlando, County Paladine, Rinaldo such, or one perchance more brave. That was from Almontaine. This for Membrine, win one of these, that thou with praise mayst have. And as for this, so cease to seek it more, but leave it as thou promised me before. Ferrar was much amazed to see the sprite that made this strange appearance unexpected. His voice was gone, his hair did stand upright, his senses all were so to fear subjected. His heart did swell with anger and despite to hear his breach of promise thus objected, and that Argalia, so the knight was named, with just reproof could make him thus ashamed. And wanting time the matter to excuse, and being guilty of no little blame, he rested mute, and in a senseless muse, so sore his heart was tainted with the shame. And by Lanfusa's life he vowed to use no helmet, till such time he gat the same which from the stout Almont Orlando wan, when as they two encountered man to man. But he this vow to keep more firmly meant, and kept it better than the first he made. Away he parted hence a malcontent, and many days ensuing rested sad. To seek Orlando out is his intent, with whom to fight he would be very glad. But now... What haps unto Rinaldo fell, that took the other way, tis time to tell. Not far he walked, but he his horse had spied, that prancing went before him on the way. Holla, my boy, holla, Rinaldo cried, the want of thee annoyed me much to-day. But Bayard will not let his master ride, but takes his heels and faster goes away. His flight much anger in Rinaldo bred, but follow we Angelica that fled. That fled through woods and deserts all obscure, Through places uninhabited and waste, Ne could she yet repute herself secure, But farther still she galloppeth in haste. Each leaf that stirs in her doth fear procure, And maketh her affrighted and aghast. Each noise she hears, each shadow she doth see, She doth mistrust it should Rinaldo be, Like to a fawn or kid of bearded goat, That in the wood a tiger fierce espied to kill her dam, And first to tear the throat, and then to feed upon the haunch or side, To fear that she might light on such a lot, And seek itself in thickest bracks to hide, And thinks each noise the wind or air doth cause Itself in danger of the tiger's claws. That day and night she wandered here and there, And half the other day that did ensue, Until at last she was arrived where A fine young grove with pleasant shadow grew, 
near to the which two little rivers were whose moisture did the tender herbs renew and make a sweet and very pleasing sound by running on the sand and stony ground here she at last herself in safety thought as being from rinaldo many a mile tired with annoy the heat and travel brought she thinks it best with sleep the time beguile and having first a place convenient sought she lets her horse refresh his limbs the while who fed upon the banks well clothed with grass and drank the river water clear as glass hard by the brook an arbor she descried wherein grew fair and very fragrant flowers with roses sweet and other trees beside wherewith the place adorns the native bowers so fenced in with shades on either side safe from the heat of late or early hours the boughs and leaves so cunningly were mixed no sun no light could enter them betwixt within the tender herbs a bed do make inviting folk to take their rest and ease here means this lady fair a nap to take and falls to sleep the place so well doth please not long she lay but her a noise did wake the trampling of a horse did her disease and looking out as secret as she might to come all armed she saw a comely knight she knows not yet if he be foe or friend twixt hope and fear she doubtfully doth stand and what he means to do she doth attend and who it was she fain would understand the knight did to the river-side descend and resting down his head upon his hand all in a muse he sitteth still alone like one transformed into a marble stone he tarried in this muse an hour and more with look cast down in sad and heavy guise at last he did lament his hap so sore yet in so sweet and comely mournful wise so hard a heart no tiger ever bore but would have heard such plaints with waterish eyes his heart did seem a mountain full of flame his cheeks a stream of tears to quench the same alas said he what means this diverse passion i burn as fire and yet as frost i freeze i still lament and yet i move compassion i come too late and all my labor leaves i had but words and looks for show and fashion but others get the game and gainful fees if neither fruit nor flower come to my part why should her love consume my careful heart like to the rose i count the virgin pure that growth on native stem in garden fair which while it stands with walls environed sure where herdmen with their herds cannot prepare to favor it it seemeth to allure the morning dew the heat the earth the air young gallant men and lovely dames delight in their sweet scent and in their pleasing sight but when at once tis gathered and gone from proper stock where late before it grew the love the liking little is or none both favor grace and beauty all adieu so when a virgin grants to one alone the precious flower for which so many sue well he that getteth it may love her best but she forgoes the love of all the rest she may deserve his love but others hate to whom of love she showed herself so scant oh then my cruel fortune or my fate others have store but i am starved with want then leave to love this lady so ungreat nay live to love behold i soon recant yea first let life from these my limbs be rent ere i to change my love shall give consent if some perhaps desirous are to know what wight it was with sorrow so oppressed twas sacrament that was afflicted so and love had bred this torment in his breast that tickling wound that flattering cruel foe most happy they that know and have it least the love of her i say procured his woe and she had heard and knew it long ago her love allured him from the eastern land unto the western shores where sets the sun and here he heard how by orlando's hand a passage safe from lindy's she had won her sequestration he did understand that charles had made and how the same was done to make the knights more venturous and bold in fighting for the flower de luce of gold and furthermore himself had present been when charles's men were overthrown and slain since then 
he travelled far to find this queen but hitherto it hath been all in vain now much despair and little hope between so ruefully thereof he doth complain and with such wailing words as woes rehearsed as might the hardest stony heart have pierced and while in this most doleful state he bides and sighs full oft and sheddeth many a tear and speaks these same and many words besides which i to tell for want of time forbear his noble fortune so for him provides that all this came unto his mistress ear and in one moment he prevailed more than he had done in many years before angelica with great attention heard the moan and plaint that him tormented sore who long had loved her with great regard and she had trial many years before yet as a marble pillar cold and hard she not inclines to pity him the more like one that all the world doth much disdain and deemeth none worthy her love to gain but being now with danger compassed round she thought it best to take him for her guide for one that were in water almost drowned were very stout if for no help he cried if she let pass the fortune now she found she thinks to want the like another tide and furthermore for certain this she knew that sacripant had been her lover true he meant she though to quench the raging fires that i consumed his faithful loving heart ne yet with that a lover most desires to swage the pain in all or yet in part she means he first shall pull her from the briars and feed him then with words and women's art to make him first of all to serve her turn that done to wanted coyness to return under the riverside she doth descend and toward him most goddess-like she came and said all peace to thee my dearest friend with modest look and called him by his name and further said the gods and you defend my chastity mine honor and my fame and never grant by their divine permission that i give cause to any such suspicion with how great joy a mother's mind is filled to see a son for whom she long had mourned whom she heard late in battle to be killed and saw the troops without him home returned such joy had sacripant when he beheld his lady dear his tears to smiles are turned to see her beauty rare her comely favor her princely presence and her stately haviour like one all ravished with her heavenly face unto his loved lady he doth run who was content in arms him to embrace which she perhaps at home would not have done but doubting now the dangerous time and place she must go forward as she hath begun in hope by his good service and assistance to make her home return without resistance and in most lovely manner she doth tell the strange adventures and the diverse chance that since they two did part to her befell both on the way and since she came to france and how orlando used her right well defending her from danger and mischance and that his noble force and magnanimity had still preserved the flower of her virginity it might be true but sure it was incredible to tell to one that were discreet and wise but unto sacripant it seemed possible because that love had dazzled so his eyes love causeth what is seen to seem invisible and makes of things not seen a shape to rise it is a proverb used long ago we soon believe the thing we would have so but to himself thus sacripant doth say be it that my lord of agland were so mad to take no pleasure of so fair a prey when he both time and place and power had yet am i not obliged any way to imitate a precedent so bad i'll rather take my pleasure while i may then wail my want of wit another day i'll gather now the fresh and fragrant rose whose beauty may withstanding still be spent one cannot do a thing as i suppose that better can a woman's mind content well may they seem much grieved for a glows and weep and wail and dolefully lament there shall no foolish plaints nor feigned ire hinder me to incarnate my desire this said forthwith he did himself prepare to salt the fort that easily would be won but lo a sudden hap that bred new care and made him cease his enterprise begun for of an enemy he was aware he clasped his helmet late before undone and armed all he mounteth on his beast and standeth ready with his spear in rest 
behold a warrior whom he did not know came down the wood in semblance like a knight the furniture was all as white as snow and in the helm a plume of feathers white king sacrapent by proof doth plainly show that he doth take the thing in great despite to be disturbed and hindered from that pleasure that he preferred before all other treasure approaching nigh the warrior he defied and hopes to set him quite beside the seat the other with such lofty words replied as persons use in choler and in heat at last when glorious vaunts were laid aside they come to strokes and each to do his feet doth couch his spear and running thus they sped their coursers both encountered head to head as lions meet or bulls in pastures green with teeth and horns and stain with blood the field such eager fight these warriors was between and either spear had pierced the t'other shield the sound that of these strokes had raised been an echo loud along the vale did yield twas happy that their curates were so good the lances else had pierced to the blood for quite unable now about the wield they but like rams the one the other's head whereof the pagan's horse such pain did feel that ere long space had passed he fell down dead the t'other's horse a little gan to reel but being spurred full quickly up he sped the pagan's horse thus overthrown and slain fell backward greatly to his master's pain that unknown champion seeing the other down his horse upon him lying dead in view expecting in this fight no more renown determined not the battle to renew but by the way that leadeth from the town the first appointed journey doth pursue and was now ridden half a mile at least before the pagan parted from his beast like as the tiller of the fruitful ground with sudden storm and tempest is astonished who sees the flash and hears the thunder sound and for their master's sakes the cattle punished or when by hap a fair old pine he found by force of raging winds his leaves diminished so stood amazed the pagan in the place his lady present at the woeful case he fetched a sigh most deeply from his heart not that he had put out of joint or lamed his arm his leg or any other part but chiefly he his evil fortune blamed at such a time to hap so overthwart before his love to make him so ashamed and had not she some cause of speech found out he had remained speechless out of doubt my lord said she what ails you be so sad the want was not in you but in your steed for whom a stable or a pasture had been fitter than a course at tilt indeed nor is that adverse party very glad as well appears that parted with such speed for in my judgment they be said to yield that first leave off and to depart the field thus while she gives him comfort all she may behold there came a messenger in post blowing his horn and riding down the way where he before his horse and honour lost and coming nearer he of them doth pray to tell if they had seen pass by that coast a champion armed at all points like a knight the shield the horse and armour all of white i have both seen the knight and felt his force said sacrapant for here before you came he cast me down and also killed my horse and know i that doth grieve me most his name sir quoth the post the name i will not force to tell sith you desire to know the same first know that you were conquered in this fight by valour of a damsel fair and bright of passing strength but of more passing hue and bradamant this damsel fair is named she was the white whose meeting you may rue and all your life hereafter be ashamed this said he turned his horse and bade adieu but sacrapant with high disdain inflamed was first so wroth and then so shamed thereto he knew not what to say nor what to do and after he had stayed a while and mused that at a woman's hands he had received such a disgrace as could not be excused nor how he might revenge it he perceived with thought hereof his mind was so confused he stood like one of wit and sense bereaved at last he goeth a better place to find he takes her horse and makes her mount behind now having rode a mile or thereabout they heard a noise a trampling on the ground they thought it was some company or rout that caused in the wood so great a sound at last they see a warlike horse and stout with gilded barb that cost full many a pound no hedge no ditch no wood no water was that stopped him 
where he was bent to pass. Angelica, casting her eye aside, except, said she, mine eyes all dazzled be, I have that famous horse Bayardo spied, come trotting down the woods, as seems to me. How well for us our fortune doth provide. It is the very same, I notice he. On one poor nag to ride we two were loath, and here he cometh fit to serve us both. King Sacripant alighted by and by, and thinks to take him gently by the rein. But with his heels the horse doth straight reply, as who should say, his rule he did disdain. It happy was he stood the beast not nigh, for if he had, it had been to his pain, for why such force the horse had in his heel, he would have burst a mountain all of steel. But to the damsel gently he doth go, in humble manner and in lowly sort. A spaniel, after absence, fawneth so, and seeks to make his master play and sport. For Bayard called to mind the damsel, though, when she unto Albracca did resort, and used to feed him for his master's sake, whom she then loved, and he did her forsake. She takes the bridle boldly in her hand, and stroked his breast and neck with art and skill, the horse that had great wit to understand, like to a lamb by her he standeth still. And while by Ardo gently there did stand, the pagan got him up and had his will, and she that erst to ride behind was fain, into her saddle mounted now again. And being newly settled in her seat, she saw a man on foot all armed run, Straight in her mind she gan to chafe and fret, because she knew it was Duke Ammon's son, that is, Rinaldo. Most earnestly he sued her love to get, more earnestly she seeks his love to shun. Once she loved him, he hated her as much, and now he loves she hates, his hap was such. The cause of this first from two fountains grew, like in the taste, but in effects unlike placed in Ardenna, each in other's view. Who tastes the one, love's dart his heart doth strike, contrary of the other doth ensue. Who drink thereof, their lovers shall mislike. Rinaldo drank of one, and love him painted. She drunk the other, and his love disdained. The liquor thus with secret venom mingled makes her to stand so stiffly in the nay, on whom Rinaldo's heart was wholly kindled though scarce to look on him she can away, but from his sight desiring to be singled, with soft low voice the pagan she doth pray that he approach no nearer to this night, but fly away with all the speed he might. Why then, quoth he, make you so small esteem of me, as though that I to him should yield? So weak and faint my forces do you deem that safe from him yourself I cannot shield? Then you forget Albraca, it should seem, and that same night, when I amid the field, alone, unarmed, did defend you then against King Agrican and all his men. No, sir, said she, ne knows she what to say, because Rinaldo now approached so nigh, and threatened so the pagan in the way, that under him his horse he did espy, and saw the damsel taken as a prey, in whose defence he means to live and die. But what fell out between these warriors fierce within the second book I do rehearse. End of book one. The second book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto, translated by Sir John Harrington, Book Two. The Argument A friar between two rivals parts the fray, by magic art. Rinaldo hasteth home, but in embassage he is sent away when tempest makes the sea to rage and foam. Bradamant seeks her spouse, but by the way, while she about the country wild did roam, met Pinabel who by a crafty train both sought and thought the lady to have slain. O blind God, love, why takest thou such delight with darts of diverse force our hearts to wound? By thy too much abusing of thy might, this discord great in human hearts is found. When I would wade the shallow ford aright, 
thou drawst me to the deep to have me drowned from those love me my love thou dost recall and place it where i find no love at all thou makest most fair unto rinaldo seem angelica that takes him for a foe and when that she of him did well esteem then he disliked and did refuse her though which makes her now of him the less to deem thus as they say she renders quit pro quo she hateth him and doth detest him so she first will die ere she will with him go rinaldo full of stately courage cried down thief from off my horse down by and by so robbed to be i never can abide but they that do it dearly shall abide also this lady thou must leave beside else one of us in her defence will die a horse so good and such a goodly dame to leave unto a thief it were a shame what me a thief thou in thy throat dost lie quoth sacripant that was as hot as he thief to thyself thy malice i defy for as i hear the name is due to thee but if thou dare thy might and manhood try come take this lady or this horse from me though i allow in this of thine opinion that of the world she is the matchless minion like as two mastiff dogs with hungry maws moved first to hate from hate to raging ire approach with grinning teeth and grisly jaws with staring eyes as red as flaming fire at last they bite and scratch with teeth and claws and tear themselves and tumble in the mire so after biting and reproachful words did these two worthy warriors draw their swords one was on foot the t'other on a horse you think perhaps the horseman vantage had no sure no whit he would have wished to scorse for why at last to light he must be glad the beast did know thus much by nature's force to hurt his master were a service bad the pagan could not nor with spur nor hand make him unto his mind to go or stand he stops when he should make a full career he runs or trots when he would have him rest at last to throw his rider in the mire he plungeth with his head beneath his breast but sacripant that now had small desire at such a time to tame so proud a beast did work so well at last by sleight and force on his left side he lighted from his horse when from bayardo's over furious might the pagan had himself discharged so with naked swords there was a noble fight sometimes they lie aloft sometimes alow and from their blows the fire flies out in sight i think that vulcan's hammers beat more slow where he within the mountain etna's chaps doth forge for joe the fearful thunderclaps sometimes they proffer then they pause a while sometimes strike out like masters of the play now stand upright now stoop another while now open lie then cover all they may now ward then with a slip the blow beguile now forward step now back a little way now round about and where the one gives place there still the other presseth in his place rinaldo did the pagan prince invade and strike at once with all the might he could the other doth oppose against the blade a shield of bone and steel of temper good but through the same a way fusberta made rinaldo's sword and of the blow resounded all the wood the steel the bone like ice in pieces broke and left his arm benumbed with the stroke which when the fair and fearful damsel saw and how great damage did ensue thereby she looked pale for anguish and for awe like those by doom that are condemned to die she thinks it best herself from hence withdraw else will rinaldo take her by and by the same rinaldo whom she hateth so though love of her procured all his woe unto the wood she turns her horse in haste and takes a little narrow path and blind her fearful looks oft time she back doth cast still doubting lest rinaldo came behind and when that she a little way had passed alo the vale a hermit she did find a weak old man with beard along his breast in show devout and holier than the rest he seemed like one with fasts and age consumed he rode upon a slothful going ass and by his look a man would have presumed that of his conscience scrupulous he was yet her young face his old sight so illumined when as he saw the damsel by to pass though weak and faint as such an age behooved that charity his courage somewhat moved 
the damsel of the hermit asked the way that might unto some haven town lead most near that she might part from france without delay where once rinaldo's name she might not hear the friar that could enchant doth all he may to comfort her and make her of good cheer and to her safety promising to look out of his bag forthwith he drew a book a book of skill and learning so profound that of a leaf he had not made an end but that there rose a sprite from underground whom like a page he doth of errand send this sprite by words of secret virtue bound goes where these knights their combat did intend and while they two were fighting very hard he enters them between without regard good sirs quoth he for courtesy's sake me show when one of you the t'other shall have slain and after all the travel you bestow what guerdon you expect for all your pain behold orlando striking ne'er a blow nor breaking staff while you strive here in vain to paris where the lady fair doth carry while you on fighting undiscreetly tarry i saw from hence a mile or thereabout orlando with angelica alone and as for you they jest and make a flout that fight where praise and profit can be none twere best you quickly went to seek them out before that any farther they be gone within the walls of paris if they get your eye on her again you shall not set when as the knights this message had received they both remained amazed dumb and sad to hear orlando had them so deceived of whom before great jealousy they had but good rinaldo so great grief conceived that for the time like one all raging mad he sware without regard of god or man that he will kill orlando if he can and seeing where his horse still stood untied he thither goes such haste he made away he offers not the pagan leave to ride nor at the parting once adieu doth say now bayard fells his master's spurs inside and gallops main and maketh any stay no rivers rocks no hedge nor ditches wide could stay his course or make him step aside nor marvel if rinaldo made some haste to mount again upon his horse's back you heard before how many days had passed that by his absence he had felt great lack the horse that had of human wit some taste ran not away for any jadish knack his going only was to this intent to guide his master where the lady went the horse had spied her when she took her flight first from the tent as he thereby did stand and followed her and kept her long in sight as then by hap out of his master's hand his master did not long before alight to combat with a baron hand to hand that is rogero the horse pursued the damsel all about and holp his master still to find her out he followed her through valley hill and plain through woods and thickets for his master's sake whom he permitted not to touch the rein for fear lest he some other way should take by which rinaldo though with mickle pain twice found her out twice she did him forsake for first for awe then sacrament withstood that by twice finding her he did no good bayardo trusting to the lying sprite whose false but likely tale so late he heard and doubting not it was both true and right he doth his duty now with due regard rinaldo pricked with love and raging spite doth prick apace and all to paris ward to paris ward he maketh so great shift the wind itself seems not to go so swift such haste he made orlando out to find that scant he ceased to travel all the night so deeply stuck the story in his mind that was of late devised by the sprite betimes and late as first he had designed he rode until he saw the town in sight where charles whose chance all christened hearts did rue with the small relics of his power withdrew and for he looks to be assaulted then or else besieged he useth all his care to store himself with victual and with men the walls eke of the town he doth repair and take advice both how and where and when for his defence each thing he may prepare an army new to make he doth intend and for new soldiers into england send he minds to take the field again ere long and try the hap of war another day and all in haste to make himself more strong he sends rinaldo england's aid to pray rinaldo thought the emperor did him wrong to send him in such haste and grant no stay not that ill-will 
to the island he did carry, but for another cause he fain would parry. Yet now, although full sore against his mind, as loath to leave the lady he so loved, whom he in Paris hoped had to find, because to obey his prince it him behooved, he taketh this ambassage thus assigned, and having straight all other lets removed, he posted first to Callas with great haste, and thence embarked ere half next day was past. Against the mariners and masters' minds, such haste he made to return it back, he takes the sea, though swelling with great winds, and threatening ruin manifest and rack. Fierce Boreas, that himself despised finds, doth beat on seas with tempest foul and black. By force whereof the waves were raised so high, the very tops were sprinkled all thereby. The mariners take in their greater sail, and by the wind they lie, but all in vain. Then back again they bend without avail, now are they out they cannot in again. No, said the wind, my force shall so prevail, your bold attempts shall put you to some pain. It was a folly any more to strive, needs must they follow as the wind did drive. In the foreship sometimes the blast doth blow, straight in the poop, the seas break to the skies. Needs must they bear a sail, though very low, To void the waves that higher still did rise. But sith my web so diverse now doth grow, To weave with many threads I must devise. I, I leave Rinaldo in this dangerous place, And of his sister speak a little space. I mean the noble damsel Bradamant, Of Ammon daughter, and Dean Beatrice, In whose rare mind no noble part did want so full of value and so void of vice, King Charles and France of her might rightly vaunt, so chaste, so fair, so faithful, and so wise, and in the feats of arms of so great fame, a man might guess by that of whence she came. There was a knight enamoured on this dame, that out of Africa came with agrament, Rogero Height. So was his father's name, his mother was the child of Agolant. The damsel, that of worthy lineage came, and had a heart not made of adamant, disdained not the love of such a knight, although he had but sell been in her sight. Long travel and great pain she had endured, and rid alone her lover to have found. Ne would she think her safety more assured if with an army she were guarded round. You heard before how she by force procured King Sacrapent to fall and kiss the ground. The wood she passed, and after that the mountain, until at last she saw a goodly fountain, a goodly fountain running in a field, all full of trees, whose leaves do never fade, which did to passengers great pleasure yield, the running stream so sweet a murmur made. Upon the south a hill the sun did shield, the ground gave flowers, the grove a grateful shade. Now here the dame, casting her eye aside, a man at arms fast by the brook bestride. A man at arms she spied by the brook, whose banks with flowers of diverse hue were clad, of which sweet place he so small pleasure took his face did show his heart was nothing glad. His targe and helmet were not far to look upon a tree where tied his horse he had. His eyes were swollen with tears, his mind oppressed with bitter thoughts that had his heart distressed. The damsel fair, enticed by deep desire, that all, but chiefly women, have to know all stranger states, doth earnestly require the doleful knight his inward grief to show, who, marking well her manner and attire, her courteous speech with him prevailed so, he tells his state, esteeming by the sight that needs she must have been some noble knight. Good sir, said he, you first must understand, I served Charles against the king of Spain. I horsemen had and footmen in my band, in ambush placed the Spanish king to slain. I brought the fairest lady in this land, and my best loved with me in my train, when suddenly, ere I thereof was ware, there came a horseman that procured my care. Perhaps a man, or some infernal sprite in human shape, I cannot certain say, but this I say he took the damsel bright, even as a falcon seizeth on his prey. So he my loving lady did affright, and so affrighted, bear her quite away. And when I thought to rescue her by force, aloft in air he mounted with his horse. Even as a ravenous kite that doth spy a little chicken 
wandering from the other, doth catch him straight and carries him on high. That now repents he was not with his mother. What could I do? My horse wants wings to fly. Scant could he get one leg before the other. He travelled had before so many days among the painful hills and stony ways. But like to one that were his wit beside, I leave my men to do my first intent. Not caring of myself what should be tied, so strongly to my fancy was I bent, and took the blind god Cupid for my guide. By ways as blind, to seek my love I went, and though my sense, my guide, my way were blind, yet on I go in hope my love to find. A senite space, abating but a day, about the woods and mountains I did range, in savage deserts wild and void of way, where human steps were rare and very strange. Passed by the desert place, a plain there lay, that showed from the rest but little change, save only that a castle full of wonder did stand in rocks that had been cloven asunder. This castle shines like flaming fire afar, not made of lime and stone as ours are here. And still as I approached a little near, more wonderful the building did appear. It is a fort impregnable by war compacted all of metal shining clear. The fiends of hell this fort of steel did make, of metal tempered in the Stygian lake. The towers are all of steel and polished bright. There is on them no spot or any rust. It shines by day. By dark it giveth light. Here dwells this robber wicked and unjust, and what he gets against all laws and right, the lawless wretch abuseth here by lust. And here he keeps my fair and faithful lover, without all hope that I may her recover. Ah, woe was me, in vain I sought to help. I see the place that keeps that I love best, even as a fox that crying hears her whelp, now borne aloft into the eagle's nest. About the tree she goes, and fain would help, but is constrained for want of wings to rest. The rock so steep, the castle is so high, none can get in except they learn to fly. And as I tarried in the plain, behold, I saw two knights come riding down the plain, led by desire, and hope to win this hold. But their desire and hope was all in vain. Gradasso was the first, of courage bold, the king of Saracan that held the rein. Rogero next, a man of noble nation, of years but young, but of great estimation. A little dwarf they had to be their guide, who told me that they came to try their force against the champion that doth use to ride out of this castle on a winged horse, which when I heard, to them for help I cried, and prayed them of my case to take remorse, and that they would, if twere their chance to win, set free my love, that there was locked in, and all my grief to them I did unfold, affirming with my tears my tale too true. No sooner I my heavy hap had told, but they were come within the castle's view. I stood aloof the battle to behold, and prayed to God good fortune might ensue. Beneath the castle lies a little plain, exceeding not an arrow shot of twain. And as they talked, who first should fight, or last, they were arrived to the castle hill. At length, Gradasso, whether lots were cast, or that Regera yielded to his will, doth take his horn, and blew therewith a blast, the noise whereof the castle walls did fill, and straight, with greater speed than can be guessed, came out the rider of the flying beast. And, as we see strange cranes are wont to do, first stalk a while, ere they their wings can find, then soar from ground not past a yard or two, till in their wings they gathered half the wind, at last, they mount the very clouds unto, triangle-wise, according to their kind. So, by degrees, this mage begins to fly. The bird of Jove can hardly mount so high. And when he sees his time, and thinks it best, he falleth down like lead in fearful guise, even as the falcon doth the fowl arrest, the duck and mallard from the brook that rise. So he, descending with his spear in rest, doth pierce the air in strange and monstrous wise. And ere Gradasso were thereof admonished, he felt a stripe that made him half astonished. The mage upon Gradasso break his spear, who strikes in vain upon the air and wind. Away he flew without or hurt or fear, and leaves Gradasso many a pace behind. 
This fierce encounter was so hard to bear that good Alfana to the ground inclined. Uh, the same Alfana was Gradasso's mare, the fairest and best that ever saddled there. Aloft the stars the sorcerer doth ascend, and wheels about, and down he comes again, and on Ruggiero he as forth doth bend, that had compassion on Gradasso's pain. So sore the salt Ruggiero did offend, his horse the force thereof could not sustain, and when to strike again he made account, he saw his foe up to the clouds to mount. Sometimes the mage Rogero doth assail, straightway Gradasso he doth set upon, and oft they strike again without avail, so quickly he at whom they strike is gone. He winds about as ships do under sail, his sails are wings, and rest he gives them none, but sets upon them in so sudden wise that he amazed and dazzled both their eyes. Between this one aloft and two alow, this conflict did no little space endure, until at last the night began to grow, with misty clouds making the world obscure. I saw this sight, the truth thereof I know, I present was thereat. Yet am I sure that very few, except the wiser sort, will credence give to such a strange report. This heavenly, hellish warrior bare a shield on his left arm that had a silken case, I cannot any cause or reason yield why he would keep it covered so long space. It had such force that whoso it beheld such shining light it striketh in their face that down they fell with eyes and senses closed and leave their corpse of him to be disposed. The target like the carbuncle doth shine, such light was never seen with mortal eye. It makes to ground the lookers-on decline, be they far off, or be they standing nigh, and as it closed their sight, it closed mine, that in a trance no little space was I. At last, when I awaked and rose again, the air was dark, and voided was the plain. The sorcerer hath ta'en them, I surmise, into his castle, as is likely most, and by this light that dazzled all our eyes my hope is gone, their liberty is lost. This is the truth, and do I aught devise? You hear the same, I felt it to my cost. Now judge if I have reason to complain, That have and do endure such endless pain. When as this knight his doleful tale had done, He sate him down all cheerless in the place. This was Earl Pinabel, Anselmus' son, Born in Maganza of that wicked race, Who like the rest so lewd a course did run, He hoped the more his lineage to deface. For only virtue nobleness doth dignify, And vicious life a lineage base doth signify. The lady fair, attentive all this while, Doth hearken unto this Maganza's tale. Rogero's name sometime doth make her smile, Sometime again for fear she looketh pale. But hearing how the sorcerer base and vile Should in a castle so detain him thrall, She pitied him, and in her mind she fretted, And oft desired to hear the tale repeated. When at the last the whole she understood, She said, Sir Knight, mourn not, but take some pleasure. Perhaps our meeting may be to your good, And turn your enemy unto displeasure. Show me this fort, for why it frets my blood so foul a prison holds so fair a treasure, and if good fortune favor mine intent, you will right well suppose your travel spent. Ah, said the knight, should I return again to pass these mountains hard and overthwart, though for myself it is but little pain to toil my body, having lost my heart, for you to go whereas you may be slain or taken prisoner were a foolish part, which if it hap, Yet me you cannot blame, because I give you warning of the same. This said, he riseth up his horse to take, The noble lady on the way to guide, Who means to venture for Rogero's sake, Or death or thraldom, or whate'er betide. But lo, a messenger great haste doth make That comes behind, and tarry ho, he cried. This was the post that told to Sacrapent How she that foiled him was Dame Bradamant. This messenger brought tidings in great post, both from Narbona and from Montpelier, how they were up in arms along the coast of Aquamort, and all that dwelled near, and how Marsilia's men their hearts had lost because of her no tidings they could hear. And for her absence made them ill-apaid, they sent to have her presence and her aid. 
These towns and others many to the same, Between the streams of Rodan and of Vare, The emperor had assigned this worthy dame, Committing them unto her trust and care. Her noble value gat her all this fame, Because in arms herself she bravely bare. And so the cities under her subjection, This message sent, requiring her direction. Which, when she heard, it made her somewhat pause. Twixt yea and no she stood a pretty space, of one side honor and her office draws, on the other side love helps to plead the case. At last she means to ensue the present cause, and fetch Rogero from the enchanted place, and if her force cannot to this attain, at least with him a prisoner to remain. In courteous sort her answer she contrived, with gracious words, and sent away the post. She longs with her new guide to have arrived to that same place where both their loves were lost. But he, perceiving now she was derived from Claramont that he detested most, doth hate her sore, and feareth to the same, lest she should know he of Maganza came. There was between these houses ancient hate, this of Maganza, that of Claramont, and each of them had weakened other state by killing men in both of great account. This Pinabel, a vile and wicked mate, that all his kin in vices did surmount, means with himself this damsel to betray, or else to slip aside and go his way. And this same fancy, so his head did fill with hate, with fear, with anger, and with doubt, that he mistook the way against his will, and knew not how again to find it out, till in the wood he saw a little hill, bare on the top, where men might look about. But Bradamant such amorous passion feels, she follows like a spaniel at his heels. The crafty guide, thus wandering in the wood, intending now the lady to beguile, said unto her, for sooth he thought it good, sith night drew on, themselves to rest a while. Here is, quoth he, and showed which way it stood, a castle fair, and hence not many a mile. But tarry you a little here, until I may descry the country from the hill. This said, he mounted to the higher ground, and standing now the highest part upon, he cast about his eyes and looked round to find some path whereby he might be gone, when unawares a monstrous cave he found, and strange cut out and hollowed in the stone. Deep thirty cubits down it doth descend, having a fair large gate at lower end, such as great stately houses want to have out of which gate proceeds a shining light, that all within most lights makes the cave. And all this while, on this felonious night, this noble lady due attendance gave, and never suffered him go out of sight. She followed Pinabel hard at his back, because she was afeard to leave the track. When as this villain traitor did espy that his designments foolish were in vain, either to leave her or to make her die, he thought it best to try a further train, persuading her for to descend, and try what ladies fair within the cave remain. For why, said he, within this little space I saw a goodly damsel in the place, both rich arrayed and very fair of hue, like one of noble lineage and degree, and this her fortune made me more to rue, that here against her will she seemed to be. And when I thought for to descend and view the cause of this her grief to know and see, I was no sooner from my horse alighted, but with infernal hags I was affrighted. The noble Bradamant, that was more stout than wary, who it was did her persuade, hath such desire to help a damsel out, that straight the cave she meaneth to invade. She finds by hap a long bough thereabout, whereof a pole of mighty length she made. First with her sword she hews and pairs it fit. That done, she lets it down into the pit. She giveth Pinabel the bigger end, and prays him stand above and hold it fast, and by the same intending to descend, upon her arms her whole weight she doth cast. But he that to destroy her did intend, doth ask if she would learn to leap a cast, and laughing loosed his hands that were together, and wished that all the race of them were with her. Yet great good hap that gentle damsel found, as well deserved a mind so innocent, for why the pole strake first upon the ground, and though by force it shivered all and rent, yet were her limbs and life kept safe and sound, for all his vile and traitorous intent. 
sore was the damsel mazed with the fall as in another book declare i shall end of book two the third book of orlando furioso this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto, translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Three. The Argument Fair Bradamant was fallen in Merlin's cave. Melissa meets her there, her ancient friend. And there to her she perfect notice gave of such brave men as should from her descend. She told her where she should Rogero have, whom old Atlanta had in prison penned, and from Brunello how to take the ring that unto liberty her dear might bring. Oh, that my head were so well stored with skill of such a noble subject fit to treat! Oh, that my wits were equal to my will to frame a phrase fit for so high conceit! Ye muses that do hold the sacred hill, inspire my heart with flame of learned heat, while I presume in base and lowly verse the names of glorious princes to rehearse such princes as excel all princes far in all the gifts of body and of mind temperate in peace victorious eke in war themselves most noble come of noble kind and such except my guest to greatly err as are by heaven's eternal doom assigned in wealth in fame in rule and in prosperity to live themselves their children and posterity nor can i now their several acts most rare achieved by every one of them recite no though my verse with virgil's might compare or i as well as homer could indite with their great praise great volumes fill it are with large discourse by them that stories write i only mean to show what was foreshown long ere their persons or their deeds were known but first of pinabel a word to speak who, as you heard, with traitorous intent the bonds of all humanity did break, for which ere long himself was after shent. Thus, while base minds their wrongs do basely wreak, they do that once that often they repent, and curse that time a thousand times too late, when they pursued their unrevenged hate. With fainting heart, for sin is full of fear, by stealing steps from hence he doth depart, and as he goes he prieth here and there, his fearful look bewrays his guilty heart, nor yet his dread doth move him to forbear to heap more sin upon this ill desart, appalled with fear, but touched with no remorse, supposing she was slain, he takes her horse but let him go until another time for i do mean hereafter you shall hear how he was dealt with when his double crime in secret wrought most open did appear now unto bradamant i bend my rhyme who with her fall was yet of heavy cheer and had been taught a gamble for the nonce to give her death and burial at once now when she came unto herself again and had recovered memory and sense she gets her on her feet although with pain in mind to seek some way to get for thence when lo before her face she seeth plain a stately portal built with great expense and next behind the same she might descry a larger room and fairer to the eye this was a church most solemn and devout that stands on marble pillars small and round and raised by art on arches all about that made each voice to yield a double sound a lightsome lamp that never goeth out did burn on altar standing in the ground that though the rooms were large and wide in space the lamp did serve to lighten all the place the noble damsel full of reverent fear when as herself in sacred place she sees as one that still a godly mind did bear begins to pray to him upon her knees whose holy side was pierced with cruel spear and who to save our lives his own did lease and while she stays devoutly at her prayer the sage melissa doth to her repair her gown ungirt her hair about her head much like a priest or prophetess arrayed and in her book a little while she read and after thus unto the damsel said o thou by god's appointment hither led o bradamant most wise and worthy maid 
I long have looked here for this thy coming, foretold thereof by prophet Merlin's cunning. Here is the tomb that Merlin erst did make by force of secret skill and hidden art, in which sometimes the lady of the lake, that with her beauty had bewitched his heart, did make him enter fondly for her sake, from whence he never after could depart. And he was by a woman overreached, that unto others prophesied and preached. His carcass dead within this stone is bound, but with dead corpse the living soul doth dwell, and shall, until it hear the trumpet sound that brings reward of doing ill or well. His voice doth live and answer and expound, and things both present, past, and future tell, resolving men of every doubtful case that for his counsel come unto this place. About a month, or little more or less, it is, since I repaired to Merlin's grave, of him about the study I profess some precepts and instructions to have, and for I willing was, I must confess to meet you at your coming to this cave, for which he did prefix this certain day, this moved me of purpose here to stay. Duke Ammon's daughter silent stands and still, the while the wise Melissa to her spake astonished at this unusual skill and doubting if she were asleep or wake a modest shame with grace her eyes doth fill with which downcast this answer she doth make alas what good or merit is in me that profits should my coming so foresee and glad of this adventure unexpected she followeth her guide with great delight and straight she saw the stately tomb erected of marble pure that held his bones and sprite and that which one would little have suspected the very marble was so clear and bright that though the sun no light unto it gave the tomb itself did lighten all the cave for whether be the nature of some stone a darksome place with lightsomeness to fill or were it done by magic art alone or else by help of mathematic skill to make transparencies to meet in one, and so convey the sunbeams where you will. But sure it was most curious to behold, set forth with carved works and gilt with gold. Now when the damsel was approached nigher to this strange tomb where Merlin's bones were placed, forth of the stones that shine like flaming fire his lively voice such speeches out doth cast. Let fortune ever favor thy desire, O Bradamant, thou noble maid and chaste, from out whose womb an issue shall proceed that all the world in glory shall exceed. The noble blood that came of ancient Troy, by two clear springs in thee together mixed, shall breed the flower, the jewel, and the joy of all on whom the sun his beams hath fixed, twixt those that heat and those that cold annoy from Tage to Ind, Danube and Nile betwixt, emperors and kings, and dukes and lords for a, of this thy lineage carry shall the sway. And many a captain brave and worthy knight shall issue from this stock that shall restore by warlike feats the glory shining bright that Italy possessed heretofore and magistrates to maintain peace and right as Numa and Augustus did before, to cherish virtue, vice so to assuage as shall to us bring back the golden age. Wherefore, sith God hath by predestination appointed thee to be Rogero's wife, and means to bless thine heirs and generation with all the graces granted in this life, Persist thou firm in thy determination, and stoutly overcome each storm of strife, and work his worthy punishment and pain that doth thy life's delight from thee detain. This said, the prophet Merlin holds his peace, and gives Melissa time to work her will, who, when she did perceive the voice to cease, she purposeth by practice of her skill to show the damsel part of that increase that should with fame the world hereafter fill and for this purpose she did then assemble a troop of sprites their persons to resemble who straight by words of secret virtue bound in numbers great unto the cave repair of whence i know not whether underground or else of those that wander in the air then thrice she draws about a circle round and thrice she hallows it with secret prayer 
Then opens she a triple clasped book, And softly whispering, in it she doth look. This done, she takes the damsel by the hand, Exhorting her she should not be afraid, And in a circle causeth her to stand, And for her more security and aid, And as it were for more assured band, Upon her head some character she laid. Then, having done her due and solemn rites, she doth begin to call upon the sprites. Behold, a crew of them come rushing in, in sundry shapes with persons great and tall, and now they fill it all the room within, so readily they came unto her call. When Radamant to fear did straight begin, her heart was cold, her color waxed pall, but yet the circle kept her like a wall, so that she needed not to fear at all. Howbeit, Melissa caused them be gone from thence unto the next adjoining cave, and thence to come before them one by one, the better notice of their names to have, that more at leisure they may talk thereon, when as occasion so may seem to crave. Although, quoth she, this short time cannot serve to speak of every one as they deserve. Lo, here the first, thy first begotten son, that bears thy favor and his father's name, by whom the Lombards shall in fight be won to Desiderius their king's great shame, who shall at Pontier make the streams to run with blood in fields adjoining to the same, and shall revenge the deeds and minds unpure of such as did his father's fall procure. And for this noble act among the rest, the emperor shall give him in reward the honors great of Caelion and Est, by which his family shall be prefarred. The next Umberto is, whose valiant breast shall be unto the holy church a guard, defending it with valiant heart and hand, to the honor of the Sparian arms and land. Alberto, he is named, that third comes in, whose triumphs are most famous everywhere. Then his son Hugo, that did Milan win, and for his crest two vipers used to bear. Next Atso is, and next to him of kin that erst of Lombardy the crown shall wear. Then Albert Tasso, by whose means are won the Berengers, both father and the son. To him shall Othon's favor so incline, he shall in marriage give to him his daughter. Now Hugo comes again, O oh, happy line, and happy man that saved so great a slaughter. When at Christ's vicar's rule Rome did repine, he daunted them, and so restored them after. The which, by wit, without the dint of sword, he shall effect in Othon's time the third. Now Folco comes, that to his brothers gave his land in Italy, which was not small, and dwelt in Almany his land to save of Sansony, that unto him did fall a dukedom great that did with castles brave accrue to him for want of issue mail. By him that noble house is held and cherished, that but for him would be extinct and perished. Then cometh Atso that misliketh war, but yet his sons Berthold and Albertas with second Henry shall be still at jar and bring the Dutchmen to a woeful pass. Next, young Rinaldo, shining like a star, shall be unto the church a wall of brass, and work the utter overthrow and loss of wicked Frederick, named Barbaros. Behold, another Atso shall possess Verona, with a stately territory, of Othon and Honorius no less shall be a Marquis made to his great glory. It would be long their names all to express that shall protect the sacred consistory, and in most valorous and martial manner display and eke defend the church's banner. Obiso next, and Folco you may view, with Henry's too, the father and the son, both Guelphs that fruitful Umbria shall subdue, and keep the dukedom there by conquest won. Behold him that the good state doth renew of Italy that late was quite undone, called Atso fifth, that bravely overthrew the cruel Esselino and him slew. That cruel Esselino that was thought to have been gotten by some wicked devil, that never any goodness had been taught, but sold his soul to sin and doing evil, comparing with the cruel acts he wrought, fierce Nero were but mild, and Scylla civil. 
beside this atso shall in time to come the power of second frederick overcome and then he shall his brother albandrine unto the florentines for money gage and othon with the faction gibeline he shall suppress amid the furious rage and raise the church nor letting it decline but spending to defend it all his age for which good service he shall justly merit the dukedom of ferrara to inherit next him rinaldo now in sooth whose lot shall be at naples to be made away a death his virtuous deeds deserved not but woe to them that guiltless blood betray now followeth a worthy crew and not whose acts alone to tell would spend a day obiso nicholas and albandrine whose noble deeds shall honor much their line then nicholas is he that next in sooth that ruled in tender years both near and far that finds and eke revengeth their untruth that sought his state by civil strife to mar the sports and exercises of his youth are blows and fights and dangers great and war which makes that heir to manly state he came for martial deeds he gets the only name lo lionel the glory of his age maintaining peace and quiet all his time and keeping that with ease by wisdom sage to which some others by much pain do climb that fettered fury and rebuked rage that locks up mars in walls of stone and lime that all his wit his care and travel bent to make his subjects live in state content now hercules comes and hercules indeed whose deeds shall merit ever during fame that by his pains his country's ease shall breed and put his enemies to flight and shame sharp to devise to execute with speed both stout to tempt and patient to the same no prince shall ever rule his country better no prince had ever country more his debtor not only that he shall their moorish grounds by great expense to pasture firm reduce not that the town with wall environ round and store with things behooveful to their use not that when war in each place shall abound he shall maintain them peaceable in truce not that he shall according to their asking disburden them of payments and of tasking but that he shall more and above all these leave them behind him such a worthy race as search within the circuit of the seas you shall not find two to supply their place so shall the one the other strive to please so shall the one the other's love embrace as may for loving brotherly regard with castor and with pollux be compared the elder of these two alfonso hight the next of them hippolito we call both passing stout and valiant in fight both passing wise and provident withal and both in due defence of country's right shall seem a bulwark and a brazen wall they both shall have of enemies good store they both shall still subdue them evermore their mother the church if i may a mother name one more like progne and medea fell unto her endless infamy and shame against her son alfonso shall rebel and join with venice force for this to blame though for the same ere long they paid full well for those they thought to hurt they did this good to make the ground more fruitful with their blood not far for thence the spanish soldier hired by pastor's curse and in that pastor's pay that with a forcible assault aspired to take a fort and eke the captain slay but lo he comes and they perforce retired and have so short a pleasure of this prey scarce one of them in life is left abiding to carry notice of so heavy tiding his wit and valor shall him so advance to have the honor of romagna field where by his means under the force of france the pope and spaniards forced are to yield and there in christian blood o oh, fatal chance shall horses swim such number shall be killed nor shall not men enough alive remain to bury those that are in battle slain the while his brother under cardinal's cap shall cover nay shall show a prudent head hippolito i mean who shall have hap with band of men but small yet wisely led to give to the venetian such a clap 
as few the like in stories have been read, to take three times five galleys at one tide, and barks and boats a thousand more beside. Behold, two Sigismonds, both wise and grave, Alfonso next, whose fame is talked of rife, with his five sons, then Hercules, that shall have the king of France's daughter to his wife, that towards him herself shall so behave, shall make him live most happy all his life. Hippolito it is that now comes in, not least for praise and glory of his kin. Next, Francis named third, Alfonso's two, with many others worthy of renown, the which to name might find one work to do from Phoebus rising to his going down. Now, therefore, if you will consent thereto, I here will end and send the spirits down. To this the worthy damsel said not nay, and straight the spirits vanished all away. Then Bradamant, that all well market had, of whom herself should be the ancient mother, did say to learn she would be very glad what two those were that differed from the other that came with backward steps and looked so sad upon the good alfonso and his brother melissa sighs misliking that suggestion which put it in her heart to ask this question and then as in a trance these words she spake o thou more worthy son of worthy sire they are thy blood on them compassion take let grace assuage though justice kindle ire then unto bradamant as new awake i must said she deny you this desire i say no more content you with the sweet for you this sour morsel is not meat to-morrow when the sun at break of day with light shall dim the light of every star i mean myself to guide you on your way so as i shall be sure you shall not err the place whereas your love is forced to stay is from the salt seashore not very far that were you passed a mile beyond this wood the other way would easy be and good of this night's stay the damsel was content and in the cave with her she doth remain and most thereof in merlin's tomb she spent whose voice with talk did her still entertain emboldening her to give her free consent to love where she should sure be loved again now gan the messenger of day to crow when as her guide and she awaited go the way they went was dark and unaccessible by secret vaults and hollows of the hill to find it out had been a thing impossible but with a guide of knowledge great and skill at last they came unto a path more passable by which they ceased not to ascend until they quite had left the dark and loathsome place and saw the beams of Phoebus' cheerful face. And while that up this hill they slowly stalk, with pausing, panting oft, and taking wind, to make less weary seem their weary walk, Melissa still doth store of matter find. And now of this and then of that doth talk, but chiefly she the damsel puts in mind of her Rogero, how he had been trained into the prison where he now remained. Atlanta, that magician strange, is he that holdeth him, I trust, unto his cost. But had you palace strength or Mars, quoth she, and eke of armed men a mighty host, yet to attempt by force to set him free, your travel and your labor all were lost. Art must be won by art, and not by might. Force cannot free your well-beloved knight. For first the castle mounted is on high, impregnable with walls all over steeled and next the horse he rides hath wings to fly and gallops in the air as in the field and last he dazzleth every mortal eye by hidden force of his enchanted shield with light whereof men's senses are so dazed with sight thereof they fall down all amazed in all the world one only mean hath been and is yet still to work so rare a feat a ring there is which from an indian queen was stole some time of price and virtue great this ring can make a man to go unseen this ring can all enchantments quite defeat king agramant hath sent his secretary unto rogero this same ring to carry 
Brunello is his name that hath the ring, Most lewd and false, but politic and wise, And put in trust especial by his king, With it Rogero's safety to devise. Which, sith I wish not he but you should bring, To bind him to you by this enterprise, And for I would not have the Turk protect him, Because I know he greatly doth affect him, do therefore this when you do meet this man, Whose marks I wish in memory you bear. His stature is two cubits and a span, His head is long and gray and thin of hair, His nose is short and flat, his color wan, With beetle brows, eyes watery not with tear, His beard grows on his face without all stint, And to conclude, his look is all a squint. Now, when as you this comely man shall meet as sure you shall within a day or two you may with courteous words him seem to greet and tell him partly what you mean to do but speak not of the ring although you see it for so you may the matter all undo then he great courtesy to you will offer and straight his company to you will proffer but when into the castle you come nigh, then see you set upon him on the way, and take away the ring, and make him die, nor give him any time, lest he convey the ring into his mouth, and so thereby out of your sight he vanish quite away. The worthy damsel marks her speeches well, and so the one the other bids farewell. Next day she happed Brunello to a spy, she knew him straight, she found him at her inn. She grows to question with him by and by, And he to lie doth by and by begin. And she dissembles too, And doth deny her country stock and name, And sex and kin. Brunello pleasantly doth talk and tipple, Not knowing he did halt before a cripple. Now, when they almost broken had their fast, She marking more his fingers than his eyes, when much good talk between them two had passed, the most whereof were false and forged lies, behold, mine host came unto them in haste, and told them news that made them soon arise. But here I mean to make a little pause before I tell what was thereof the cause. End of Book Three The Fourth Book of Orlando Furioso this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Four. The Argument. Bradamant overcomes the false magician, and sets Ruggiero free, who by and by leapt on a horse, not knowing his condition, who bare him quite from sight of any eye. Rinaldo sailed as he had commissioned to Englandward, but borne by wind awry, at Caledon in Scotland he arrived, where fair Ginevra's foul death was contrived. Though he that useth craft and simulation doth seldom bend his acts to honest ends, but rather of an evil inclination his wit and skill to others' mischief bends, yet, sith in this our worldly habitation we do not ever dwell among our friends, dissembling doubtless oftentimes may save men's lives their fame and goods and all they have if man by long acquaintance and great proof to trust some one man scant can be allured to whom he may in presence or aloof unfold the secrets of his mind assured then doth this damsel merit no reproof that with brunello to all fraud inured doth frame herself to counterfeit a while for to deceive deceivers is no guile now while these two did to confer begin, she to his fingers having still an eye, the host and other servants of the inn came on the sudden with a woeful cry, and some did gaze without and some within, as when men see a comet in the sky. The cause of this, their wondering and their crying, was that they saw an armed horseman flying, and straight by the host and others they were told how one that had in magic art great skill not far from thence had made a stately hold of shining steel, and placed it on a hill, to which he bringeth ladies young and old, and men and maids according to his will. And when within the castle they have been, they never after have been heard or seen. No sooner can he spy a pretty maid, but straight he takes her up into the air, the which is custom, 
makes them all afraid that either are, or think that they be fair. Those hardy knights that went to give them aid, of which sort many hither did repair, went like the beasts to the sick lion's den, for all went in, but none returned again. This tale in worthy Bradaman did breed a kind of pleasure, and confuse a joy in hope, which after she performed indeed, the sight of her beloved to enjoy. She prayed the host procure a guide with speed, as though each little stay did breed annoy. She swears that in her heart she longed to wrestle with him that kept the captives in his castle. Because the deucer knight should want no guide, Brunello said, I will myself be he, I know the way, and somewhat have beside, by which may fortune you may pleasured be. He meant the ring of force and virtue tried, although he meant not she the same should see. Great thanks, quoth she, that you will take the pain, in hope hereby the precious ring. Thus each from other hiding their intent, they forward set like friends by break of day. Brunello sometime foremost of them went, sometime behind, as chanced on the way. Now had they certain hours in travel spent, when they arrived where the castle lay, for as Mount Pyrene stands above the plain so high as may discover France and Spain. When as the castle did in sight appear, so strange, so fair, so stately, and so high, in which that knight whom she esteemed so dear, with many others prisoner did lie, she thought her fittest time drew very near to take the ring and make Brunello die. Wherefore with open force she doth assail him, whose strength with age and fear soon gan to fail him. Her meaning was the caitiff to have killed, but unto that her noble heart said nay small praise would come from blood so basely spilled she means to get the ring another way but first she bound him where he willed or nilled and though with tears he did for pity pray yet left she him unto a tree fast tied and with the ring away she straight did ride and being in the green fast by the tower straight as the fashion was her horn she blew out came that armed knight that present hour, and seeing there a challenger in view, he seemeth to assault her with great power. But by the ring she all his falsehood knew. She saw he carried neither sword nor spear, nor any weapon that one need to fear. He only carried at his saddle bow a shield, all wrapped in a crimson case, and read a book by which he made to show some strange and strong illusions in the place. And many that these cunnings did not know, he had deceived and pain in little space, and caused both swords and lances to appear, when neither sword nor lances them were near. But yet the beast he rode was not of art, but gotten of a griffith and a mare. And like a griffith had the former part, as wings and head and claws that hideous are, and passing strength and force and venturous heart, but all the rest may with a horse compare. Such beasts as these the hills of Riffy yield, though in those parts they have been seen but seld. This monster rare from farthest regions brought this rare magician ordered with such skill that in one month or little more he taught the savage monster to obey his will. And though by conjurations strange he wrought in other things his fancy to fulfill, as cunning men still try each strange conclusion, yet in this Griffith horse was one collusion. The lady fair, protected by the ring, found all his slights, although she seemed not so, her purpose to the better pass to bring. And first she seems to ward a coming blow, and then to strike, and oft to curse the wing that carried still away her flying foe. Anseth to fight on horseback did not boot, she seems as in a rage to light on foot. The necromancer, as his manner is, disclosed at the last his shining shield, supposing that the virtue would not miss to make her as it had done others yield. So have I seen a crafty cat ere this play with a silly mouse of house or field, and let it go a while for sport and play, but kill at last, and bear it quite away. I say that he, the cat, the other mice resembled had in every former fight, but now this ring had made this one so wise that when she saw the strange enchanted light she falleth not of force but of device as though she were astonished at the sight and lay like one of life and sense bereaved by which the poor magician was deceived 
for straight he lighted from the flying horse to take her as he had done many mo the shield and book in which was all his force he left behind him at his saddle-bow but thinking to have found a senseless corse amazed and dead he finds it nothing so for up she starts so quite the case was altered that with the cord he brought himself was haltered and when with those self bonds she had him tied by which he thought before her to have snared she strong and young he withered old and dried alas an unmeet match to be compared forthwith determining he should have died to strike his head from shoulder she prepared till she was moved to mercy with his tears and with the sight of white and hoary hairs for when she saw his force was overlaid and that her strength was not to be withstood o oh, pardon life thou heavenly wight he said no honor comes by spilling aged blood which words to mercy moved the noble maid whose mind was always merciful and good then why he built the castle she demanded and what he was to tell her him commanded with woeful words the old man thus replied i made this castle for no ill intention for covetous or any fault beside or that i loved rapin or contention but to prevent a danger shall betide a gentle knight i framed this invention who as the heavens hath showed me in short season shall die in christian state by filthy treason rogero named is this worthy youth whose good and safety fain i would advance my name atlanta is to tell you truth i bred him of a child till his hard chance and valiant mind that breeds alas my ruth with agrament enticed him into france and i that like mine own child always loved him from france and danger fain would have removed him by art and help of many a hellish elf this castle for rogero i did build and took him as i meant to take thyself but that with greater art i was beguiled from dainty fair and other worldly pelf because he should not think himself exiled for company i brought him worthy whites both men and women ladies fair and knights they have all plenty of desired pleasure i bend to their contentment all my care for them i spend my travel and my treasure for music clothes and games and dainty fare as heart can think and mouth require with measure great store for them within this castle are well had i travailed well my time bestowed but you have marred the fruits that i have sowed but if your mind be gracious as your look if stony heart abide not in tender breast behold i offer thee my shield and book and flying horse and grant my just request some two or three or all the knights i took i give thee free but let rogero rest whose health whose wealth whose safety and welfare have ever been and ever shall my care your care quoth she is very ill bestowed in thraldom vile to keep a worthy wight as for your gifts you offer but mine own sith by my conquest you are mine in right those dangers great you say to be foreshown and upon him in time to come must light with figures cast and heavenly planets view it cannot be known or cannot be eschewed how can you others harms foresee so far and not prevent your own that were so nigh i certain shall suppose your art doth err and for the rest the end the truth to try i now intend your matter all to mar and that before these bonds i will untie you shall set free and loose your prisoners all whom in this castle you detain and thrall when as the poor old man was so distressed that needs he must for fear and dread obey and that the same imperious dame's behest could neither bear denial nor delay to do as she commands he deems it best and therefore takes the enchanted place away he breaks some hollow fuming pots of stone and straight the walls and buildings all were gone this done himself eke vanished out of sight as did the castle at that present hour then ladies lords and many a worthy knight were straight released from his enchanted power and some there were had taken such delight in those so stately lodgings of that tower that they esteemed that liberty a pain and wished that pleasant slavery again here were at freedom set among the rest gradasso sacrapant two kings of name Presildo and iroldo 
that from the east into this country with Rinaldo came. Here Bradamant found him she loved best, her dear Rogero of renowned fame, who, after certain notice of her had, did show to see her he was very glad as one of whom he great account did make, and thought himself to her most highly bound, since she put off her helmet for his sake, and in her head received a grievous wound. T'were long to tell what toil they both did take, both night and day each other to have found, but till this present time they had no meeting, nor given by word nor writing any greeting. Now when before him present he beheld her that from danger had him so redeemed, his heart with so great joy and mirth was filled, the happiest wight on earth himself he deemed, and crystal tears from her fair eyes distilled, embracing him whom she most dear esteemed. As oft we see a strong and sudden passion bring forth effects quite of another fashion. The Griffith horse, the while upon the plain, stood with the target at his saddle-bow. The damsel thought to take him by the rein, but then he mounteth up, and like a crow chased by a dog, forthwith descends again, and standeth still, or soareth very low. And when that some come nigh in hope to take him, he flies away, that none can overtake him. But near unto Ruggiero soon he stayed, which by Atlanta's care was so procured, who for Ruggiero's danger was afraid, and thinks his safety never well assured. Wherefore he sent this monster for his aid, and by this means from Europe him allured. To his welfare his cares and thoughts he bendeth, to succor and preserve him he intendeth. Rogero from this horse forthwith alighted, the horse he rode on was Frontino named, and with this flying horse was so delighted that though he saw him wanton and unpaimed, yet up he leaped and soon was sore affrighted. He finds he would not to his mind be framed. For in the air the Griffith soared so high as doth the falcon that had fouled a fly. The damsel fair that now beheld her dear born far away by force of monster's wing was sorrowful and of so heavy cheer that to their course her wits she scant could bring. The tale of Ganymede she once did hear, whom poets feign to tend the heavenly king, she doubts may true of her Rogero be, that was as comely and as fair as he. As long as eyesight could at all prevail, so long she viewed him still in all and part, but when his distance made the sight to fail, at least she followed him in mind and heart. To sob, to sigh, to weep, lament, and wail, she never leaves these chances overthwart. And seeing plain her love and she were parted, she took Frontino and away departed. Now was Ruggiero mounted up so high, he seemed to be a moat or little prick for no man could distinguish him by eye except his sight were passing fine and quick. All southerly this Griffith horse doth fly, was never jade that served man such a trick, but let him on his way, God speed him well, for of Rinaldo somewhat I must tell, who all the while with raging tempest strived, born where himself nor no man else did know, by cruel stormy winds and weather drived, that days and nights are ceased not to blow. At last, in Scotland weary he arrived, where woods of Caledony first do show, a famous wood wherein in times of old brave deeds were done by venturous knights and bold. Here have those famous knights great honor won, at whose rare worth the world itself did wonder. Here were most valiant acts achieved and done by knights that dwelt there near or far asunder. And many a man hath here been quite undone, Whose feeble force his enemy was under. Here were, as proved is by ancient charter, The famous Tristram, Lancelot, and Sir Arthur. At this same wood, Rinaldo, from his fleet, Well mounted on his Bayard's back, did part. He points his men at Warwick him to meet, The while himself, alone, with valiant heart, Sometime on horseback, sometime on his feet, doth march in mind to do some worthy part. But seeing now the knight came on so fast, unto an abbey he repairs at last. The abbot and his monks, with comely grace, as holy men of humane manners skilled, did welcome him, and in a little space, with costly fare, his empty stomach filled. Rinaldo straight inquired of the place what feats of arms had there been late fulfilled and where a man by valiant acts may show if his exploits deserve dispraise or no 
They said that in that wood and forest find adventures strange and feats of arms he might. But as the place, so are the actions blind, that oft their doings never come to light. But if, say they, we may persuade your mind, attempt an action worthy of a knight, where, if you pass the peril and the pain, eternal fame shall unto you remain. For if you would perform an act in deed whereby great name and honor may be won, then this would be the best and noblest deed that late or long time past was ever done. Our prince's daughter standeth now in need of great defense, a danger great to shun, against a knight, Lucanio by name, that seeks to take away her life and fame. This knight hath her unto the king accused, I think of malice rather than of right, that he hath seen how she herself abused, and closely took her lover up by night. Now by the laws that in this land are used, except she have a champion that by might within a month Lucanio prove a liar, she shall be straight condemned to the fire. The Scottish law that breedeth all this strife appoints that all of base or better sort that take a man, except she be his wife, and spends her time with him in Venus' sport, by cruel torment finish shall her life, except she find some knight that will support that she the heinous act hath not committed, but that in law she ought to be acquitted. The king for fair Ginevra takes great thought, both for her safety and her estimation, and seeks by all good means that may be wrought for her defence, and maketh proclamation that by whose help from danger she is brought, provided he be one of noble nation, shall have the goodly damsel for his wife, with livings large to keep him all his life. But if within this month that now ensueth so little time for her defence is left her, no knight will come that will defend her truth, then friends and fame and life will be bereft her. This enterprise would much commend your youth, the praise whereof would last a great while after, and from Atlanta's pillars unto Eind, a fairer lady you shall never find. Now then, beside the honor and the praise, to have a state may make you live content. The prince's love that helpeth many ways, whose honor now is half consumed and spent. Again, true knights should help at all assays, when any harm to ladies fair is meant. The very law of knighthood hath commanded to grant this aid that we have now demanded. Rinaldo paused, and after thus he spake. Why then, said he, must this fair damsel die, that for her true and secret lover's sake did condescend within his arms to lie? Accursed be they that such a law did make, accursed be they that mean to live thereby, nay, rather point a punishment and pain for such as do their lover's true disdain. If fair Ginevra had her friend or no, I stand not now the matter to decide. Yea, I would praise her, had she done it so that by her foes it had not been espied. Be as be may, my meaning is to go to fight for her, if I may have a guide that will but show me where is her accuser, and I shall quickly prove he doth abuse her. I know not if the fact she have committed, nor can I say in this the certain sure. But this I say, it ought to be remitted much rather than she should distress endure. I further say they were but meanly witted that did so straight a statute first procure. I also say this law they ought recall, in place thereof a better to install. Sith like desire the fancies doth possess both of the male and of the female gender, to do that thing that fools count great excess, and quench the flame that Cupid doth engender, to grant the men more scope, the women less, is law for which no reason we can render. Men using many never are ashamed, but women using one or two are blamed. This law, I say, is partial, and not, and doth to women plain and open wrong. I trust in God they shall be better taught, and that this law shall be revoked ere long. The abbot and his monks, in word and thought, allowed Rinaldo's speech, both old and young. They all condemn the law, and partly blame the king, that may and mendeth not the same. Next morning, when Rinaldo doth perceive the sun appear, and stars their heads to hide, he thanks them for his cheer, and taketh leave, and takes a target-bearer for his guide, for fear lest unknown paths should him deceive. Himself all armed doth on Bayard ride, and to the Scottish court he goes a stranger, for to defend the damsel fair from danger. 
and for they thought to take a way more nigh, they leave the common way a mile or twain, when suddenly they heard a piteous cry, well like to one that feared to be slain. In haste they spur their horses by and by along the vale, and looking down the plain, a maid between two murderers they saw that meant to take her life against all law. The caitiffs put the damsel in great fear, and showed that they were come to end her days, which made her weep and shed full many a tear. To move their mind she trieth many ways, and though the fact a while they did forbear, yet now they had removed all delays, when as Rinaldo came unto her aid, and made the malefactors sore afraid. Away they fled, and left the wench alone, for dread of death appalled and sore affrighted who all her cause of danger and of moan unto Rinaldo straight would have recited. But so great haste he maketh to be gone, he gave no ear, nor from his horse alighted, but to ensue the journey first assigned him, he caused the guide to take her up behind him. And now on horseback, marking well her face, and marking more her gesture and behavior, her pleasing speech, and modest, sober grace, she now hath won a great deal more his favor and after he had rode a little space, to tell her hard adventure he would have her, and she began with humble voice and low, as more at large hereafter I will show. End of Book Four The Fifth Book of Orlando Furioso This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Five. The Argument. Delinda tells what slights her duke devised to get with fair Ginevra reputation. Lurcanio of his brother's fall advised accused her publicly of fornication. A knight unknown in armor black disguised comes and withstands Lurcanio's accusation until Rinaldo made all matters plain by whom the unjust duke was justly slain. We see the rest of living creatures all, both birds and beasts that on the earth do dwell, live most in peace, or if they hap to brawl, the male and female still agreeeth well. The fierce, the faint, the greater, nor the small against the law of nature will rebel. The savage lions, bears, and bulls most wild, unto their females show themselves most mild. What fiend of hell, what rage reigns here so rife, disturbing still the state of human hearts? How comes it that we find, twixt man and wife, continual jars bred by injurious parts? The undefiled bed is filled by strife, and tears that grow of words unkind and thwarts. Nay, oft all care and fear is so exiled, their guilty hands with blood have been defiled. No doubt they are accursed, and past all grace, and such as have of God nor man no fear, that dare to strike a damsel in the face, or of her head diminish but a hair. But who, with knife or poison, would unlace their line of life or flesh in pieces tear? No man, nor made of flesh and blood, I deem him, but sure some hound of hell I do esteem him. Such were these thieves that would the damsel kill that by Rinaldo's coming was recovered. They secretly had brought her down the hill in hope their fact could never be discovered. Yet such is God, so good his gracious will, that when she looked least she was delivered. And with a cheerful heart that late was sorry, she doth begin to tell the woeful story. Good sir, said she, by conscience to discharge the greatest tyranny I shall you tell that erst in Thebes, in Athens, or in Arge was ever wrought, or where worst tyrants dwell. My voice and skill would fail to tell at large the filthy fact, for I believe it well. Upon this country Phoebus shines more cold, because he doth such wicked acts behold. Men seek we see, and have in every age to foil their foes, and tread them in the dust. But there to wreak their rancor and their rage, where they are loved, is foul and too unjust. Love should prevail, just anger to assuage. If love bring death, where too can women trust? Yet love did breed my danger and my fear, as you shall hear if you will give me ear. 
for entering first into my tender spring of youthful years unto the court i came and served there the daughter of our king and kept a place of honour with good fame till love alas that love such care should bring envied my state and sought to do me shame love made the duke of alban seem to me the fairest wight that erst mine eye did see and for i thought he loved me all above i bent myself to hold and love him best but now i find that hard it is to prove by sight or speech what bides in secret breast while i poor i did thus believe and love he gets my body bed and all the rest not thinking this might breed my mistress wrong e'en in her chamber this i practised long where all the things of greatest value lay and where ginevra sleeps herself sometime there at a window we did find a way in secret sort to cover this our crime here when my love and i were bent to play i taught him by a scale of cord to climb and at the window i myself would stand and let the ladder down into his hand so oft we meet together at this sport as fair ginevra's absence gives us leave who used to other chambers to resort in summer time and this for heat to leave and this we carried in so secret sort as none there was our doings did perceive for why this window standeth out of sight where none do come by day nor yet by night twixt us this use continued many days yea many months we used this privy train love set my heart on fire so many ways that still my liking lasted to my pain i might have found by certain strange delays that he but little loved and much did feign for all his slights were not so closely covered but that they might full easily be discovered at last my duke did seem inflamed sore on fair ginevra neither can i tell if now this love began or was before that i did come to court with her to dwell but look if i were subject to his lore and look if he my love requited well he asked my aid herein no whit ashamed to tell me how of her he was inflamed not all of love but partly of ambition he bears in hand his mind is only bent because of her great state and high condition to have her for his wife is his intent he nothing doubted of the king's permission had he obtained ginevra's free assent nor was it hard for him to take in hand that was the second person in the land he sware to me if i would be so kind his high attempt to further and assist that at his hands i should great favor find and of the king procure me what i list how he would ever keep it in his mind and in his former love to me persist and notwithstanding wife and all the rest i should be sure that he would love me best i straight consented to his fond request as ready his commandment to obey and thinking still my time employed best when i had pleased his fancy any way and when i found a time then was i pressed to talk of him and good of him to say i used it all my art my wit and pain ginevra's love and liking to obtain god knoweth how glad i was to work his will how diligent i followed his direction i spared no time no travail nor no skill to this my duke to kindle her affection but always this attempt succeeded ill love had her heart already in subjection a comely knight did fair ginevra please come to this country from beyond the seas from italy for services i hear unto the court he and his brother came in tourneys and in tilt he had no peer all britain soon was filled with his fame our king did love him well and hold him dear and did by princely gifts confirm the same fair castles towns and lordships him he gave and made him great such power great princes have our sovereign much his daughter liked him more and ariadont this worthy knight is named so brave in deeds of arms himself he bore no lady of his love need be ashamed the hill of stowell burneth not so sore nor is the mount vesuvio so inflamed as ariadont's heart was set on fire ginevra's beauty kindling his desire his certain love by signs most certain found caused that my suit unwillingly was heard she well perceived his love sincere and sound inclining to his suit with great regard in vain i seek my duke's love to expound the more i seek to make 
the more I marred. For while with words I seek to praise and grace him, no less with works she striveth to deface him. Thus being oft repulsed, so ill sped I, to my too much beloved duke I went, and told him how her heart was fixed already, how on the stranger all her mind was bent, and prayed him now, sith there was no remedy, that to surcease his suit he would consent, for Ariadne so loved the princely maid, that by no means his flames could be allayed. When Polynesso, so the duke we call, this tale unpleasant oftentime had heard, and of himself had found his hopes were small, when with my words her deeds he had compared, grieved with repulse and vexed therewithal to see this stranger thus to be preferred, the love that late his heart so sore had burned was cool at all and into hatred turned. Intending by some vile and subtle train to part Ginevra from her faithful lover, and plant so great mislike between them twain, yet with so cunning show the same to cover, that her good name he will so foul disdain, alive nor dead she never shall recover. But lest he might in this attempt be thwarted, to none at all his secret he imparted. Now thus resolved, Delinda fair, quoth he, I so am called. You know, though trees be topped and shrouded low, yet sprout young shoots we see, and issue from that head so lately lopped. So in my love it fareth now with me. Though by repulse cut short and shrewdly cropped, The parried tops such buds of love do render, That still I prove new passions there engender. Ne do I deem so dear the great delight, As I disdain I should be so reject, And lest this grief should overcome me quite, Because I fail to bring it to effect, to please my fond conceit, this very night I pray thee, dear, to do as I direct. When fair Ginevra to her bed is gone, take thou the clothes she wear, and put them on. As she is wont her golden hair to dress, in stately sort to wind it on her wire, so you, her person lively to express, may dress your own, and wear her head attire. Her gorgets and her jewels rich, no less, you may put on to accomplish my desire, and when unto the window I ascend, I will my coming there you do attend. Thus I may pass my fancy's foolish fit, and thus, quoth he, myself I would deceive. And I, that had no reason nor no wit his shameful drift, though open to perceive, did wear my mistress' robes that served me fit, and stood at window there him to receive and of the fraud I was no whit aware, till that fell out that caused all my care. Of late, twixt him and Ariadant, had passed about Ginevra fair these words or such, for why there was good friendship in times past between them two, till love their hearts did touch. The duke such kind of speeches out did cast. He said to Ariadant, he marvelled much that, seeing he did always well regard him, he should again so thanklessly reward him. I know you see, for needs it must be seen, the good consent and matrimonial love that long between Ginevra and me hath been, for whom I mean ere long the king to move. Why should you fondly thrust yourself between? Why should you rove your reach so far above? For if my case were yours, I would forbear, or if I knew that you so loved were. And I much more, the other straight replies, do marvel you, Sir Duke, are so unkind, that know our love, and see it with your eyes, except that wilfulness have made you blind, that no man can more sure it not devise than her to me, and me to her to bind, into this suit so rashly are intruded, still finding from all hope you are excluded. Why bear you not to me the like respect, as my good will requireth at your hand? Since that our love is grown to this effect, we mean to knit ourselves in wedding's band, which to fulfil ere long I do expect, for no, I am, though not in rents or land, yet in my prince's grace, no whit inferior, and in his daughter's, greatly your superior. Well, said the duke, errors are hardly moved, that love doth breed in unadvised breast. Each thinks himself to be the best beloved, and yet but one of us is loved best. Wherefore, to have the matter plainly proved, 
which should proceed in love and which should rest, let us agree that victor he remain that of her liking showeth signs most plain. I will be bound to you by solemn oath, your secrets all in counsel to conceal, so you likewise will plight to me your troth, the thing I show you never to reveal. To try the matter thus, they agree at both, and from this doom hereafter not repeal. But on the Bible first they were deposed, that this their speech should never be disclosed. And first the stranger doth his state reveal, and tell the truth in hope to end the strife, how she had promised him in woe and weal to live with him and love him all her life, and how, with writing, with her hand and seal, she had confirmed she would be his wife, except she were forbidden by her father. For then, to live unmarried, she had rather. And furthermore, he nothing doubts, he said, of his good service, so plain proof to show, as that the king shall nothing be afraid on such a night his daughter to bestow, and how in this he needeth little aid, as, finding still his favour greater grow, he doubts not he will grant his liking after that he shall know it pleaseth to his daughter. And thus, you see, so sound stands mine estate, that I myself in thought can wish no more. Who seeks her now is sure to come too late, for that he seeks is granted me before. Now only rests in marriage holy state to knit the knot that must dure evermore. And for her praise I need not to declare it, as knowing none to whom I may compare it. Thus Ariadant a tale most true declare it, and what reward he hoped for his pain. But my false duke, that him had foully snared, and found by my great folly such a train, doth swear all this might no way be compared with his. No, though himself did judge remain. For I, quoth he, can show signs so express, as you yourself, inferior, shall confess. Alas, quoth he, I see you do not know how cunningly these women can dissemble. They least do love where they make greatest show, and not to be the thing they most resemble. But other favours I receive, I trow, when as we two do secretly assemble, as I will tell you, though I should conceal it, because you promise never to reveal it. The truth is this, that I full oft have seen her ivory corpse, and been with her all night, and naked lain her naked arms between, and full enjoyed the fruits of love's delight. Now judge who hath in greatest favour been, to which of us she doth pertain in right, and then give place, and yield to me mine own, sith by just proofs I now have made it known. Just proofs, quoth Ariadon, nay, shameful lies, nor will I credit give it to any word. Is this the finest tale you can devise? What, hoped you that with this I could be dored? No, no, but sith a slander foul doth rise by thee to her, maintain it with thy sword. I call thee lying traitor to thy face, and mean to prove it in this present place. Tush, quoth the duke, it were a foolish part for you to fight with me that am your friend, sith plain to show without deceit her art as much as I have said I do intend. These words did gripe poor Ariadante's heart. Down all his limbs a shivering doth descend, and still he stood with eyes cast down on ground, like one would fall into a deadly sound. With woeful mind, with pale and cheerless face, with trembling voice that came from bitter thought, he said he much desired to see this place, where such strange feats and miracles were wrought. Hath fair Ginevra granted you this grace, that I, quoth he, so oft in vain have sought? Now, sure, except I see it in my view, I never will believe it can be true. The Duke did say he would with all his heart both show him where and how the thing was done, and straight from him to me he doth depart, whom to his purpose wholly he had won. With both of us he playeth so well his part, that both of us thereby were quite undone. First he tells him that he would have him placed among some houses fallen and quite defaced. Some ruined houses stood opposed direct against the window where he doth ascend, but Ariadon discreetly doth suspect 
that this false duke some mischief did intend, and thought that all did tend to this effect by treachery to bring him to his end, that sure he had devised this pretense with mind to kill him ere he parted thence. Thus, though to see this sight he thought it long, yet took he care all mischief to prevent, and if perhaps they offer force or wrong, by force the same for to resist he meant. He had a brother valiant and strong, Lucanio called, and straight for him he sent, not doubting, but alone by his assistance, against twice twenty men to make resistance. He bids his brother take his sword in hand, and go into a place that he would guide, and in a corner, closely there to stand, aloof from t'other, three score paces wide. The cause he would not let him understand, but praise him there in secret sort to bide, until such time he happed to hear him call, else, if he loved him, not to stir at all. His brother would not his request deny, and so went Ariadant into his place, and undiscovered closely there did lie, till, having looked there a little space, the crafty duke to come he might descry, that meant the chaste Ginevra to deface, who, having made to me his wanted signs, I let him down the ladder made of lines. The gown I wear was white, and richly set with aglets, pearl, and lace of gold well garnished, my stately tresses covered with a net of beaten gold most pure and brightly varnished. Not thus content, the veil aloft I set which only princes wear, thus stately harnished, and under Cupid's banner bent to fight, all unawares I stood in all their sight. For why Lurcanio, either taking care lest Ariadant should in some danger go, or that he sought as all desirous are the counsels of his dearest friend to know, close out of sight by secret steps and where, hard at his heels, his brother followed so, till he was nearer come by fifty paces, and there again himself he newly places. But I, that thought no ill, securely came unto the open window, as I said. For once or twice before I did the same, and had no hurt, which made me less afraid. I cannot boast, except I boast of shame, when in her robes I had myself arrayed, methought before I was not much unlike her, but certain now I seemed very like her. But Ariadant, that stood so far aloof, was more deceived by distance of the place, and straight believed against his own behoof, seeing her clothes, that he had seen her face. Now let those judge that partly know by proof the woeful plight of Ariadante's case, when Polynesso came my faithless friend in both their sights the ladder to ascend. I, that his coming willingly did wait, and he once come thought nothing went amiss, embraced him kindly at his first receipt, his lips, his cheeks, and all his face did kiss. And he, the more to colour his deceit, did use me kinder than he had ere this. This sight much care to Ariadante brought, thinking Ginevra with the duke was not. The grief and sorrow sinketh so profound into his heart, he straight resolves to die. He puts the pummel of his sword on ground and means himself upon the point to lie, which, when Lucanio saw and plainly found, but all this while was closely standing by, and Polynesso's coming to discern, though who it was he never yet could learn, he held his brother for the present time, that else himself for grief had surely slain. Who, had he not stood nigh and come betime, his words and speeches had been all in vain. What? Shall, quoth he, a faithless woman's crime cause you to die or put yourself to pain? Nay, let them go, and cursed be all their kind. I, born like clouds, with every blast of wine. You rather should some just revenge devise, as she deserves, to bring her to confusion. Sith we have plainly seen, with both our eyes, her filthy fact appear without collusion. Love those that love again, if you be wise. For of my counsel this is the conclusion. Put up your sword against yourself prepared, and let her sin be to the king declare it. His brother's words in Ariadante's mind seem for the time to make some small impression. But still the cureless wound remained behind. Despair had of his heart the full possession. 
and though he knew the thing he had assigned contrary to a christian knight's profession yet here on earth he torment felt so sore in hell itself he thought there was no more and seeming now after a little pause and his brother's counsel to consent he from the court next day himself withdraws and makes none privy unto his intent his brother and the duke both knew the cause but neither knew the place whereto he went diverse thereof most diversely to judge some by good will persuaded some by grudge seven days entire about for him they sought seven days entire no news of him was found the eight a peasant to ginevra brought these news that in the sea he saw him drowned not that the waters were with tempest wrought nor that his ship was stricken on the ground how then forsooth quoth he and therewith wept down from a rock into the sea he leapt and further he unto ginevra told how he met ariadont upon the way who made him go with him for to behold the woeful act that he would do that day and charged him the matter to unfold and to his prince's daughter thus to say had he been blind he had full happy been his death should show that he too much had seen there stands a rock against the irish isle from thence into the sea himself he cast i stood and looked after him a while the height and steepness made me sore aghast i then so travelled hither many a mile to show you plainly how the matter passed when as the clown his tale had verified ginevra's heart was truly terrified o oh lord what woeful words by her were spoken laid all alone upon her restless bed oft did she strike her guiltless breast in token of that great grief that inwardly was bred her golden tresses all were rent and broken recounting still those woeful words he said how that the cause his cruel death was such was only this that he had seen too much the rumour of his death spread far and near and how for sorrow he himself had killed the king was sad the court of heavy cheer by lords and ladies many tears were spilled his brother most as loving him most dear had so his mind with sorrow overfilled that he was scantly able to refrain with his own hands himself for to have slain and oftentimes repeating in his thought the filthy fact he saw the other night which as you heard the duke and i had wrought i little looking would come to light and that the same his brother's death had brought on fair ginevra he doth wreak his spite not caring so did wrath him overwhelm to lease the king's good will and all his realm the king and nobles sitting in the hall right pensive all for ariadon's destruction Hyrcanio undertakes before them all to give them perfect notice and instruction who was the cause of ariadante's fall and having made some little introduction he said it was unchaste ginevra's crime that made him kill himself before his time what should i seek to hide his good intent his love was such as greater none could be he hoped to have your highness free assent when you his value and his worth should see but while a plain and honest way he went behold he saw another climb the tree and in the midst of all his hope and suit another took the pleasure and the fruit he further said not that he had surmised but that his eyes had seen ginevra stand and at a window as they had devised let down a ladder to her lover's hand but in such sort he had himself disguised that who it was he could not understand and for due proof of this his accusation he bids the combat straight by proclamation how sore the king was grieved to hear these news i leave it as a thing not hard to guess Mercanio plain his daughter doth accuse of whom the king did look for nothing less and this the more his fear and care renews that on this point the laws are so express except by combat it be proved a lie needs must ginevra be condemned to die how hard the scottish law is in this case i do not doubt but you have heard it told how she that doth another man embrace beside her husband be she young or old must die 
except within two fortnights space she find a champion stout that will uphold that unto her no punishment is due but he that doth accuse her is untrue the king of crime that thinks Geneva clear makes offer her to wed to any knight that will in arms defend his daughter dear and prove her innocent in open fight yet for all this no champion doth appear such fear they have of this lurcanio's might one gazeth on another as they stand but none of them the combat takes in hand and further by ill fortune and mischance her brother zurban now is absent thence and gone to spain i think or else to france who were he here she could not want defence or if perhaps so lucky were her chance to send him notice of her need from hence had she the presence of her noble brother she should not need the aid of any other the king that means to make a certain trial that fair geneva guilty be or no for she still stiffly stood in the denial of this that wrought her undeserved woe examines all her maids but they reply all that of the matter nothing they did know which made me seek for to prevent the danger that duke and i might have about the stranger and thus for him more than myself afraid so faithful love to this false duke i bear i gave him notice of these things and said that he had need for both of us beware he praised my constant love and farther prayed that i would credit him and take no care he points two men but both to me unknown to bring me to a castle of his own now sir i think you find by this effect how soundly i did love him from my heart and how i proved by plain course and direct my meaning was not any ways to start now mark if he to me bear like respect and mark if he requited my desart alas how shall a silly wench attain by loving truly to be loved again this wicked duke ungrateful and perjured beginneth now of me to have mistrust his guilty conscience could not be assured how to conceal his wicked acts unjust except my death though causeless be procured so hard his heart so lawless was his lust he said he would me to his castle send but that same castle should have been mine end he willed my guides when we were past that hill and to the thicket a little way descended that there to quite my love they should me kill which as you saw they to have done intended had not your happy coming stopped their will that god and you be thanked i was defended this tale delinda to rinaldo told and all the while their journey on they hold this strange adventure luckily befell to good rinaldo for that now he found by this delinda that this tale did tell geneva's mind unspotted clear and sound and now his courage was confirmed well that wanted erst a true and certain ground for though before for her he meant to fight yet rather now for to defend the right to great st andrew's town he maketh haste whereas the king was set with all his train most careful waiting for the trumpet's blast that must pronounce his daughter's joy or pain but now rinaldo's spirit had so fast he was arrived within a mile of twain and through the village as he then was riding he met a page that brought him fresher tiding how there was come a warrior all disguised that meant to prove lucanio said untrue his colours and his armour well devised in manner and in making very new and though that sundry sundrily surmised yet who it was for certain no man knew his page demanded of his master's name did swear he never heard it since he came now came rinaldo to the city wall and at the gate but little time he stayed the porter was so ready at his call but poor delinda now grew sore afraid rinaldo bids her not to fear at all for why he would her pardon beg he said so thrusting in among the thickest rout he saw them stand on scaffolds all about it straight was told him by the standers by how there was thither come a stranger knight that meant geneva's innocence to try and that already was begun the fight and how the green that next the wall did lie was railed about of purpose for the fight this news did make rinaldo hasten in and leave behind delinda at her inn he told her he would come again ere long 
and spurs his horse that made an open lane he pierced in the thickest press among whereas these valiant knights had given and ta'en full many strokes with sturdy hand and strong lucanio thinks to bring ginevra's bane the other means the lady to defend whom though unknown they favor and commend there was duke polinesso bravely mounted upon a courser of an excellent race six knights among the better sort had counted on foot in arms do marshal well the place the duke by office all the rest surmounted high constable as always in such case who of ginevra's danger was as glad as all the rest were sorrowful and sad now had rinaldo made an open way and was arrived there in lucky hour to cause the combat to surcease and stay which these two knights applied with all their power rinaldo in the court appeared that day of noble chivalry the very flower for first the prince's audience he prayed then with great expectation thus he said send noble prince quoth he send by and by and cause forthwith that they so cease the fight for know that whichsoe'er of these doth die it certain is he dies against all right one thinks he tells the truth and tells a lie and is deceived by error in his sight and look what cause his brother's death procured that very same hath him to fight allured the t'other of a nature good and kind not knowing if he hold the right or no to die or to defend her hath assigned lest so rare beauty should be spilled so i harmless hope to save the faultless mind and those that mischief mind to work them woe but first o prince to stay the fight give order before my speech proceedeth any farther Rinaldo's person with the tale he told moved so the king that straight without delay the knights were bidden both their hands to hold the combat for a time was caused to stay then he again with voice and courage bold the secret of the matter doth bewray declaring plain how polynesso's lust was first contriver of this deed unjust and proffereth of this speech to make a proof by combat hand to hand with sword and spear the duke was called that stood not far aloof and scantly able to conceal his fear he first denies as was for his behoof and straight to battle both agreed were they both were armed the place before was ready now must they fight there could be no remedy how was the king how were the people glad that fair ginevra faultless there did stand as god's great goodness now revealed had and should be proved by rinaldo's hand all thought the duke of mind and manners bad the proudest and cruelst man in all the land it likely was as every one surmised that this deceit by him should be devised now polynesso stands with doubtful breast with fainting heart with pale dismayed face the trumpets blew they set their spears in rest rinaldo cometh on a mighty pace for at this fight he finish will the feast and where to strike him he designs a place his very first encounter was so fierce rinaldo's spear the t'other's sides did pierce and having overthrown the duke by force as one unable so great strokes to bide and cast him clean six paces from his horse himself alights and the other's helm untied who making no resistance like a corse with faint low voice for mercy now he cried and plain confessed with this his later breath the fault that brought him this deserved death no sooner had he made this last confession but that his life did fail him with his voice ginevra's double scape of foul oppression in life and fame did make the king rejoice in lieu of her to lease his crown's possession he would have wished if such had been his choice to lease his realm he could have been no sadder to get it lost he could have been no gladder the combat done rinaldo straight untied his beaver when the king that knew his face gave thanks to god that did so well provide so doubtless help in such a dangerous case that unknown knight stood all this while aside and saw the matters passed in the place and every one did muse and marvel much what wight it was whose courtesy was such the king did ask his name because he meant with kingly gifts his service to reward affirming plainly 
that his good intent deserved thanks and very great regard. The knight, with much entreaty, did assent, and to disarm himself he straight prepared. But who it was, if you vouchsafe to look, I will declare it in another book. The End of the Fifth Book The Sixth Book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Six. The Argument. Ginevra fair to Ariodont is given, and he a duke is made that very day. Rogero with the Griffith horse is driven into Alcina's isle and there doth stay a myrtle in the middle strangely riven asina's frauds doth unto him bewray of which informed he thence would have departed but by the way he finds his purpose thwarted most wretched he that thinks by doing ill his evil deeds long to conceal and hide for though the voice and tongues of men be still by fowls or beasts his sin shall be described and god oft worketh by his secret will that sin itself the sinner so doth guide that of his own accord without request he makes his wicked doings manifest the graceless white duke polinesso thought his former fault should sure have been concealed if that delinda unto death were brought by whom alone the same could be revealed thus making worse the thing before was not he hurt the wound which time perhaps had healed and weaning with more sin the less demand he hastened on his well-deserved end and lost at once his life his state and friends and honour too a loss as great or more now as i said that unknown knight intends sith every one to know him sought so sore and sith the king did promise large amends to show his face which they saw oft before and ariodant most lovely did appear whom they thought dead as you before did hear he whom ginevra woefully did wail he whom lucanio demon to be dead he whom the king and court did so bewail he that to all the realm such care had bred doth live the clown's report in this did fail on which false ground the rumour false was spread and yet in this the peasant did not mock he saw him leap down headlong from the rock but as we see men oft with rash intent are desperate and who resolve to die and straight to change that fancy and repent when unto death they do approach more nigh so ariadne to drown himself that meant now plunged in sea repented by and by and being of his limbs able and strong under the shore he swam again ere long and much dispraising in his inward thought this fond conceit that late his mind possessed at last a blind and narrow path him brought all tired and wet to be a hermit's guest with whom to stay in secret sort he sought both that he might his former grief digest and learn the truth if this same clown's report were by ginevra tain in grief or sport there first he heard how she conceived such grief as almost brought her life to woeful end he found of her they had so good belief they thought she would not in such sort offend he further heard except she had relief by one that would her innocence defend it was great doubt lucanio's accusation would bring her to a speedy condemnation and look how love before his heart enraged so now did wrath inflame and though he knew well to wreak his harm his brother's life was gauged he nathless thought his act so foul and cruel that this his anger could not be assuaged unto his flame love found such store of fuel and this the more increased his wrath begun to hear how every one the fight did shun for while lucanio was so stout and wise except it were for to defend the truth men thought he would not so the king despise and hazard life to bring ginevra's ruth which caused every one his friend advised to shun the fight that must maintain untruth 
that Ariodant, after long disputation, means to withstand his brother's accusation. Alas, quoth he, I never shall abide her through my cause to die in woe and pain. For danger and for death what may betide, be she once dead, my life cannot remain. She is my saint, in her my bliss doth bide, her golden rays my eyes light still maintain. Fall back, fall edge, and be it wrong or right, in her defence I am resolved to fight. I take the wrong, but yet I'll take the wrong, and die I shall, yet if I die I care not. But then, alas, by law she dies ere long. O oh, cruel laws, so sweet a white that spare not. Yet this small joy I find these griefs among, that Polynesso to defend her dare not, and she shall find how little she was loved of him that to defend her never moved. And she shall see me dead there for her sake, to whom so great a damage she hath done and of my brother just revengement take I shall, by whom this strife was first begun. For there, at least, my death plain proof shall make that he this while a foolish thread hath spun. He thinketh to avenge his brother's ill, the while himself his brother there shall kill. And thus resolved, he gets him armor new, new horse, and all things new that needful been, all clad in black, a sad and mournful hue, and crossed with wreath of yellow and of green. A stranger bare his shield that neither knew his master's name, nor him before had seen. And thus, as I before rehearsed, disguised, he met his brother as he had devised. I told you what success the matter had, how Ariadunt himself did then discover, for whom the king himself was even as glad as late before his daughter to recover. And since he thought in joyful times and sad, no man could show himself a truer lover than he that after so great wrong intended against his brother her to have defended, both loving him by his own inclination, and prayed thereto by many a lord and knight, and chiefly by Rinaldo's instigation, he gave to Ariadan Ginevra Bright. Now, by the duke's attaint and condemnation, Albania came to be the king's in right, which duchy, falling in so lucky hour, was given unto the damsel for her dower. Rinaldo for Delinda's pardon prayed, who for her error did so sore repent, that straight she vowed with honest mind and stayed to live her life in prayer and penitent. Away she packed, nor further time delayed. In Dacia, to a nunnery there she went, but to Ruggiero now I must repair that all this while did gallop in the air. Who, though he were of mind and courage stout, and would not easily fear or be dismayed, yet, doubtless, now his mind was full of doubt. His heart was now appalled and sore afraid. Far from Europa he had travelled out, and yet his flying horse could not be stayed, but passed the pillars twelve score leagues and more, pitched there by Hercules many years before. This Griffith horse, a bird most huge and rare, doth pierce the sky with so great force of wing, that with that noble bird he may compare whom poets feign Jove's lightning down to bring, to whom all other birds inferior are, because they take the eagle for their king. Scarce seemeth from the clouds, to go so swift the thunderbolt sent by the lightning's drift. When long this monster strange had kept his race, straight as a line bending to neither side, he spied an island distant little space, to which he bends in purpose there to bide. Much like in semblance was it to the place where Arethusa used herself to hide, and seeks so long her love to have beguiled, till at the last she found herself with child. A fairer place they saw not all the while that they had travelled in the air aloft. In all the world was not a fairer isle, if all the world to find the same were sought. Here, having travelled many a hundred mile, Rogero by his bird to rest was brought, in pastures green and hills with cool fresh air, clear rivers, shady banks, and meadows fair. Here diverse groves, there were of dainty shade, of palm or orange trees, of cedars tall, of sundry fruits and flowers that never fade. The show was fair, the 
plenty was not small, and arbors in the thickest places made, where little light and heat came not at all, where nightingales did strain their little throats, recording still their sweet and pleasant notes. Amid the lily-white and fragrant rose, preserved still fresh by warm and temperate air, the fearful hare and coney careless goes, the stag with stately head and body fair doth feed secure, not fearing any foes that to his damage hither may repair. The buck and doe doth feed among the fields, as in great store the pleasant forest yields. It needless was to bid Rogero light, when as his horse approached nigh the ground he cast himself out of the saddle quite, and on his feet he falleth safe and sound, and holds the horse's reins, lest else he might fly quite away, and not again be found, and to a myrtle by the water side, between two other trees, his beast he tied. And finding thereabout a little brook that near unto the shady mountain stands, his helmet from his head forthwith he took, his shield from arm, his gauntlet from his hands, and from the higher places he doth look full oft to sea, full oft to fruitful lands, and seeks the cool and pleasant air to take that doth among the leaves a murmur make. Oft with the water of that crystal well he seeks to quench his thirst and swage his heat, which his veins inflamed did rise and swell, and caused his other parts to fry and sweat. Well may it seem a marvel that I tell, yet will I once again the same repeat. He travelled had above three thousand mile, and not put off his armour all the while. Behold, his horse he lately tired there, among the boughs in shady place to bide, strave to go loose, and started back for fear, and pulls the tree to which the reins were tied, in which, as by the sequel shall appear, a human soul itself did strangely hide. With all his strength the steed strives to be lucid, by force whereof the myrtle sore was bruised, and as an arm of tree from body rent by peasant strength, with many a sturdy stroke, when in the fire the moisture all is spent, the empty places filled with air and smoke to boil and strive, and find at last a vent, when of the brand a shiver out is broke, so did the tree strive, bend, writhe, ring, and break, till at a little hole it thus did speak. Right courteous knight, for so I may you deem, and must you call not knowing other name, if so you are as gracious as you seem, then let your friendly deed confirm the same. Unloose this monster, sent as I esteem, to add some farther torment to my shame. Alas, mine inward griefs were such before, by outward plagues they need be made no more. Rogero amazed, looked round about if any man or woman he might see. At last he was resolved of his doubt. He found the voice was of the myrtle tree, with which abashed, though he were wise and stout, he said, I humbly pray thee pardon me, whether thou be some human ghost or sprite or power divine that in this wood hast right. Not willfulness, but ignorance did breed thine injury, uh, mine error in this case, and made me do this unadvised deed, by which unwares thy leaves I did deface. But let thy speech so far forth now proceed, to tell me how thou art that in this place dost dwell in tree, amid the desert field, as God from hail and tempest thee may shield. And if that I for this amends may make, or now or after, or by pain or art, I swear to thee, by her and for her sake that holds of me and shall the better part, that I shall not so cease all pains to take, to work thy joy, or to assuage thy smart. This said, he saw again the myrtle shake, and then again he heard that thus it spake. Sir Knight, your courtesy doth me constrain to show to you the thing that you desire. Although I sweat, as you may see, with pain, like greenest boughs upon the flaming fire, I will discover unto you her train woe worth the time that ever I came nigh her, that did for malice and by magic strange my lively shape to lifeless branches change. I was an earl, 
Astolfo was my name, well known in France in time of war and peace, Orlando's cousin and Rinald's, whose fame while time shall last, in earth shall never cease. Of Othon, king of English isle, I came, and should succeed him after his decease. O oh, comely, young, careless of worldly pelf, to none an enemy but to myself. For as we turned from the eastern isles, whose banks are worn with surge of Indian wave, where I and many more with witching wiles were straight enclosed in an hollow cave, until Orlando did avenge the guiles, and found by force a mean his friends to save, we westward went upon the shore and sand that lieth on the north side of the land. And as we travelled homeward on our way, as chance did lead or destiny us drive, it was our fortune once on break of day hard by Alcina's castle to arrive, where she alone to sport herself and play such kind of gins for fishes did contrive, that though we saw no net, no bait, no hook, yet still we saw that store of fish she took. The dolphin strong, the tunny good of taste, the mullet, sturgeon, salmon, princely fish, with porpoise, seals, and thorn pool, came as fast as she was pleased to command or wish, and still she took of each kind as they passed, some strange for show, some dainty for the dish, the horse-fish, and the huge and monstrous whales, whose mighty members harnessed are with scales. Among the rest, that were too long to count, we saw the fish that men Balina call. Twelve yards above the water did amount his mighty back, the monster is so tall. And for it stood so still, we made account it had been land, but were deceived all. We were deceived, well I may rue the while, it was so huge, we thought it was an isle. I say, this potent witch Alcina took all sorts of fish without or net or aid, but only reading in a little book or mumbling words, I know not what she said. But seeing me, so well she liked my look, that at her sport but little time she stayed, but sought forthwith to trap me by her skill, which straight fell out according to her will. For toward me with pleasant cheer she came, in modest manner and in comely sort, and did with all her speech demurely frame, and prayed me to her lodging to resort. Or if I would be partner of her game, she offered me to show me all the sport and all the kinds of fish in seas that were, some great, some small, some smooth, and some with hair. And if you list a mermaid fair to see, that can with song the raging storms appease at yon same little bank you may quoth she to which we too will safely pass with ease the bank which she pretends to show to me was that same fish the monster of the seas and i that too much loved to adventure upon the fish's back with her did enter my cousins dudon and rinaldo beckoned to draw me thence I heard not what they said, but of their speech and signs I little reckon. I had not wit enough to be afraid. But soon my courage was appalled and weakened. I straight was fain, in vain, to cry for aid. The monstrous fish that seemed to me an isle straight bear me from the shore full many a mile. There was Rinaldo like to have been drowned, who swam to save me, if perhaps he might. But suddenly, of him and of the ground, a misty cloud did take away the sight. Alcina and I, with seas environed round, did travel on that monster all the night. And then, with gracious speeches, she began to give me all the comfort that she can. And thus, at last, to this place we repair, of which by wrong Alcina keeps possession, deposing forcibly the rightful heir, her elder lawful sister, by oppression. The other two, more vicious than fair, are bastards and begotten in transgression. I heard it told, and have it not forgotten, she and Morgana were in incest gotten. And, as their first beginning was of sin, so is their life ungodly and defamed. 
of law nor justice passing not a pin but like the heifer wanton and untamed by war they seek their sister's right to win their elder sister logistilla named and have so far prevailed with their powers they have of hers about an hundred towers and had ere this time taken all away save that the rest is strongly fenced round for of one side the water stops the way on the other side the vantage of the ground which with a mighty bank doth make a stay much like the english and the scottish bound and yet the bastard sisters do their best and labor still to spoil her of the rest and why because they see her good and holy they hated her because themselves are vicious but to return and tell you of my folly that turned to me so hurtful and pernicious i now again grew somewhat bold and jolly i see no cause to fear or be suspicious and finding she loved me by signs most plain i wholly bent myself to love again when i her dainty members did embrace i deemed then there was none other bliss methought all other pleasures were but base of friends nor kin i had no want nor miss i only wished to stand in her good grace and have excess her coral lips to kiss i thought myself the happiest of all creatures to have a lady of so goodly features and this the more confirmed my joy and pride that toward me she showed such love and care by night and daily i was by her side to do or speak against me no man dare i was her stay i was her house's guide i did command the rest as subjects are she trusted me alone with me she talked with me within she sat without she walked alas why do i open lay my sore without all hope of medicine or relief and call to mind the fickle joy before now being plunged in gulfs of endless grief for while i thought she loved me more and more when as i deemed my joy and bliss was chief her waning love away from me was taken a new guest came the old was clean forsaken then did i find full soon though too too late her wanton wavering wily woman's wit accustomed in a trice to love and hate i saw another in my seat to sit her love was gone foregone my happy state the mark is missed that i was wont to hit and i had perfect knowledge then ere long that to a thousand she had done like wrong and lest that they about the world might go and make her wicked life and falsehood known in divers places she doth them bestow so as abroad they shall not make their moan some into trees amid the field that grow some into beasts and some into a stone in rocks or rivers she doth hide the rest as to her cruel fancy seemeth best and you that are arrived by step so strange to this unfortunate and fatal isle although in youthful sports a while you range and though alcina favour you a while although you little look for any change although she friendly seem on you to smile yet look no less but changed at last to be into some brutish beast some stone or tree thus though perhaps my labour is but lost yet have i given you good and plain advice who can themselves beware by others cost may be accounted well among the wise the waves that my poor ship so sore hath tossed you may avoid by heed and good device which if you do then your success is such as many others could not do so much rogero did with much attention hear astolfo's speech and by his name he knew to bradamant he was of kindred near which made him more his woeful state to rue and for her sake that loved him most dear to whom from him all love again was due he sought to bring him aid and some relief at least with comfort to assuage his grief which having done he asked him again the way that would to logistilla guide for were it by the hills by dale or plain he thither meant forthwith to run or ride 
Astolfo answered, it would ask much pain, and many a weary journey he should bide, because to stop this way Alcina sets a thousand kinds of hindrances and lefts. For as the way itself is very steep, not passable without great toil and pain, so she that in her mischief doth not sleep, doth make the matter harder to attain, by placing men of arms the way to keep, of which she hath full many in her train. Rogero gave Astolfo many thanks for giving him this warning of her pranks, and leading then the flying horse in hand, not daring yet to mount a beast so wild, lest, as before I made you understand, he might the second time have been beguiled, he means to go to Logistilla's land, a virtuous lady, chaste, discreet, and mild, and to withstand Alcina tooth and nail, that upon him her force might not prevail. But well we may commend his good intent, though missing that to which he did aspire. Who judgeth of our actions by the vent, I wish they long may want their most desire. For though Rogero to resist her meant, and feared her as children fear the fire, yet was he taken to his hurt and shame, even as the fly is taken in the flame. For going on his way, behold, he spies a house more stately than can well be told whose walls do seem exalted to the skies from top to bottom shining all of gold a sight to ravish any mortal eyes it seemed some alchemist did make this hold the walls seemed all of gold but yet i trow all is not gold that makes a golden show now though this stately sight did make him stay Yet, thinking on the danger him foretold, he left the easy and the beaten way that leadeth to this rich and stately hold, and to her house where virtue bears the sway he bends his steps with all the haste he could. But ere he could ascend the mountain's top, a crew of caitiffs sought his way to stop, a foul, deformed, a brutish, cursed crew, in body like to antique work devised of monstrous shape and of an ugly hue like masking matachinas all disguised some look like dogs and some like apes in view some dreadful look and some to be despised young shameless folk and doting foolish aged some naked some drunk some bedlam like enraged one rides in haste a horse without a bit another rides as slow an ass or cow a third upon a centaur's rump doth sit a fourth would fly with wings but knows not how the fifth doth for a spear employ a spit sixth blows a blast like one that gelds a sow some carry ladders others carry chains some sit and sleep while others take the pains the captain of this honourable band, with belly swollen and puffed, blubbered face, because for drunkenness he could not stand, upon a tortoise rode a heavy pace. His sergeants all were round about at hand, each one to do his office in his place. Some wipe the sweat, with fan some make a wind, some stay him up before and some behind. Then one of these that had his feet and breast of manlike shape, but like unto a hound in ears, in neck and mouth, and all the rest, doth utter barking words with currish sound, part to command and partly to request the valiant knight to leave the higher ground, and to repair unto Alcina's castle, or else they too for mastery must wrestle. This monster, seeing his request denied, strake at Rogero's beaver with a lance. But he that could no such rude jests abide, with Balisarda smote him in the paunch. Out came the sword a foot on the other side, with which he led his fellow such a dance, that some hopped headless, some cut by the knees, and some their arms and some their ears did lease. In vain it was their targets to oppose against the edge of his enchanted blade. No steel had forced to bear those fatal blows. Unto the quick the sword a passage made. But yet with numbers they do him enclose. Their multitude his force did overlay. He needs at least Briarius hundred arms to foil the foes that still about him swarms. 
had he remembered to unfold the shield atlanta carried at his saddle-bow he might have quickly overcome the field and caused them all without receiving blow like men dismayed and blind themselves to yield but he perhaps that virtue did not know or if he did perhaps he would disdain where force did fail by fraud his will to gain but being full resolved not to yield unto such beasts but ere he parted thence he would his carcass leave amid the field and manfully would die in his defence then lo good hap that fails the forward seld provided him a mean to rid him hence there came two ladies either like a queen and each of them most stately to be seen for each of them an unicorn did ride as white as lilies or unmolten snow and each of them was decked with so great pride as might most richly set them forth to show but each of them was so divinely eyed would move a man in love with them to grow and each of them in all points was so choice as in their sight a man would much rejoice then both of them unto the meadow came whereas rogero fought with all that rout and both of them those brutish beasts did blame that sought to harm a knight so strong and stout rogero blushing now with modest shame thanked them that had of danger helped him out and straight consented with those ladies fair unto alcina's castle to repair those ornaments that do set forth the gate embossed a little bigger than the rest all are enriched with stones of great estate the best and richest growing in the east in parted quadrants with a seemly rate the columns diamonds as may be guessed i say not whether counterfeit or true but shine they did like diamonds in view about these stately pillars and between are wanton damsels gadding to and fro and as their age so are their garments green the black ox hath not yet trod on their toe had virtue with that beauty tempered been it would have made the substance like the show these maids with courteous speech and manners nice welcome rogero to this paradise if so i may a paradise it name where love and lust have built their habitation where time well spent is counted but a shame no wise staid thought no care of estimation nor naught but courting dancing play and game disguised clothes each day a sundry fashion no virtuous labour doth this people please but nice apparel belly cheer and ease their air is alway temperate and clear and wants both winter storms and summer's heat as though that april lasted all the year some one by fountain's side doth take his seat and there with faded voice and careless cheer some sonnet made of love he doth repeat some others otherwhere with other fashions describe unto their loves their loving passions and cupid then the captain of the crew triumphs upon the captives he hath got and more and more his forces to renew supplies with fresh the arrows he hath shot with which he hits his level is so true and wounds full deep although it bleedeth not this is the place to which rogero went and these the things to which our youth is bent then straight a stately steed of colour bay well limbed and strong was to rogero brought and decked with fair caparison most gay with gold and pearl and jewels richly wrought the griffith horse that while on to obey the spur and bit was by atlanta taught because his journey long required rest was carried to a stable to be dressed the ladies fair that had the knight defended from that same wicked and ungracious band which as you heard at large before pretended rogero's passage stoutly to the stand told now rogero how they had intended because his value great they understand of him to crave his furtherance and aid against their foe that made them oft afraid there is quoth they a bridge amid our way to which we are already very nigh where one eryphala doth all she may to damage and annoy the passers-by a giantess she is she lives by prey her fashions are to fight deceive and lie her teeth be long her visage rough with hair her nails be sharp and scratching like a bear 
the harm is great this monster vile doth do to stop the way that but for her were free she spills and spoils she cares not what nor who that grief to hear and pity is to see and for to add more hatred hereunto know this that all yon monsters you did see are to this monster either sons or daughters and live like her by robberies and slaughters rogero thus in courteous sort replied fair ladies gladly i accept your motion if other service i may do beside you may command i stand at your devotion for this i wear this coat and blade well tried not to procure me riches or promotion but to defend from injury and wrong all such as have their enemies too strong the ladies did rogero greatly thank as well deserved so stout and brave a knight that proffered at the first request so frank against the giantess for them to fight now they drew nigh unto the river's bank whereas eriphala came out in sight but they that in this story take some pleasure may hear the rest of it at further leisure end of book six the seventh book of orlando furioso this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland orlando furioso by ludovico ariosto translated by sir john harrington book seven the argument when foul eriphala was overcome rogero guarded by two stately dames unto alcina's sumptuous court doth come where he his time in pleasure spends in games melissa him rebukes he standeth dumb and at her true reproof he greatly shames in fine by her good counsel and direction he frees himself from that most foul subjection all they that to far countries do resort shall see strange sights in earth in seas in skies which when again at home they shall report their solemn tales esteemed are as lies for why the fond and simple common sort believe but what they feel or see with eyes therefore to them my tale may seem a fable whose wits to understand it are not able but careless what the simple sot surmise if they shall deem it a device or deed yet sure to those that are discreet and wise it will no wonder nor no passion breed wherefore my tale to such i do devise and wish them to the same to take good heed for there are some may fortune in this book as in a glass their acts and haps to look for many men with hope and show of pleasure are carried far in foolish fond conceit and waste their precious time and spend their treasure before they can discover this deceit o oh, happy they that keep within their measure to turn their course in time and sound retreat before that wit with late repentance taught were better never had than so dear bought a little while before i did rehearse how that rogero with two dames was brought to combat with a riffle of the fierce who for to stop the bridge and passage sought in vain it were for to declare in verse how sumptuously her armour all was wrought all set with stones and gilt with indian gold both fit for use and pleasant to behold she mounted was but not upon a steed instead whereof she on a wolf doth sit a wolf whose match apulia doth not breed well taught to hand although she used no bit and all of sandy colour was her weed her arms were thus for such a champion fit an ugly toad was painted on her shield with poison swole and in a sable field now each the other forthwith had descried and each with other then prepared to fight when each the other scornfully defied each seeks to hurt the other all he might but she unable his fierce blows to bide beneath the visor smitten was so right that from her seat six paces she was heaved and lay like one of life and sense bereaved rogero ready was to draw his sword to head the monster lying on the sand until those dames with many a gentle word assuaged his heat and made him hold his hand he might in honour now her life afford sith at his mercy holy she would stand wherefore sir knight put up your blade say they let's pass the bridge and follow on our way the way as yet unpleasant was and ill among the thorny bushes and between all stony steep 
ascending up the hill a way less pleasant seldom hath been seen but this once passed according to their will and they now mounted up upon the green they saw the fairest castle standing by that e'er was seen by any mortal eye alcina met them at the outer gate and came before the rest a little space and with a countenance full of high estate salutes rogero with a goodly grace and all the other courtiers in like rate do bid rogero welcome to the place with so great shows of duty and of love as if some god descended from above nor only was this palace for the sight most goodly fair and stately to behold but that the people's curtsy bred delight which was as great as could with tongue be told all were of youth and beauty shining bright yet to confirm this thing i dare be bold that fair alcina passed the rest as far as doth the sun another little star the shape whose like in wax were hard to frame or to express by skill of painters rare her hair was long and yellow to the same as might with wire of beaten gold compare her lovely cheeks with show of modest shame with roses and with lilies painted are her forehead fair and full of seemly cheer as smooth as polished ivory doth appear within two arches of most curious fashion stand two gray eyes that like to clear suns shined of steady look but apt to take compassion amid which lights the naked boy and blind doth cast his darts that cause so many a passion and leave a sweet and cureless wound behind from thence the nose in such good sort descended as envy knows not how it may be mended conjoined to which in due and comely space doth stand the mouth stained with vermilion hue two rows of precious pearls serve in their place to show and shut a lip right fair to view hence some the courteous words and full of grace that mollify hard hearts and make them new from hence proceed those smilings sweet and nice that seem to make an earthly paradise her breast as milk her neck as white as snow her neck was round most plump and large her breasts two ivory apples seemed there to grow full tender smooth and fittest to be pressed they wave like seas when winds most calm do blow but argus self might not discern the rest yet by presumption well it might be guessed that that which was concealed was the best her arms due measure of proportion bare her fair white hand was to be viewed plain the fingers long the joints so curious are as neither not appeared nor swelling vain and full to perfect all those features rare the foot that to be seen doth so remain both slender short little it was and round a finer foot might nowhere well be found she had on every side prepared a net if so she walk or laugh or sing or stand rogero now the council doth forget he had received late at astolfo's hand he doth at not those wholesome precepts set that warned him to shun alcina's land he thought no fraud no treason nor no guile could be accompanied with so sweet a smile the dame of france whom he so loved erst he quite forgets so far arrived he swore his tale astolfo had to him rehearsed he thinketh false or else by him dissolved alcina's goodly shape his heart so pursed she only seemed a mistress to be sarved ne must you blame rogero's inclination but rather blame the force of incantation now as abroad the stately courts did sound of trumpets shagbok cornets and of flutes even so within there wants no pleasing sound of virginals of viols and of lutes upon the which persons not few were found that did record their loves and loving suits and in some song of love and wanton verse their good or ill successes did rehearse as for the sumptuous and luxurious fair i think not they that ninus did succeed nor cleopatra fair whose riot rare to antony such love and loss did breed might with alcina's any way compare whose love did all the others far exceed so deeply was she ravished 
in the sight of this so valiant and so comely knight the supper done and tables ta'en away to purposes and such like toys they went each one to other secretly to say some word by which some pretty toy is meant this helped the lovers better to bewray each unto other what was their intent for when the word was hither tossed and thither their last conclusion was to lie together these pretty kinds of amorous sports once ended with torches to his chamber he was brought on him a crew of gallant squires attended that every way to do him honour sought the chamber's furniture could not be mended it seemed a rachne had the hangings wrought a blanket new was made the which once finished the company by one and one diminished now was rogero couched in his bed between a pair of cambric sheets perfumed and oft he hearkens with his wakeful head for her whose love his heart and soul consumed each little noise hope of her coming bred which finding false against himself he fumed and cursed the cause that did him so much wrong to cause alcina tarry then so long sometime from bed he softly doth arise and look abroad if he might her espy sometime he with himself doth thus devise now is she coming now she draws thus nigh sometime for very anger out he cries what meaneth she she doth no faster hide Sometimes he casts, lest any let should be between his hand and this desired tree. But fair Alcina, when with odours sweet she was perfumed according to her skill, the time once come she deemeth fit and meet, when all the house were now asleep and still, with rich embroidered slippers on her feet, she goes to give and take of joys her fill to him whom hope and fear so long assailed till sleep drew on and hope and fear both failed now when astolfo successor espied those earthly stars her fair and heavenly eyes as sulphur once inflamed cannot hide even so the metal in his veins that lies so flamed that in the skin its end could bide but of a sudden straight it doth arise leaps out of bed and her in arms embraced ne would he stay till she herself unlaced so utterly impatient of all stay that though her mantle was but citrus light and next upon her smock of lawn it lay yet so the champion hasted to the fight the mantle with his fury fell away and now the smock remained alone in sight which smock as plain her beauty is all discloses as doth a glass the lilies fair he roses and look how close the ivy doth embrace the tree or branch about the which it grows so close the lovers couched in the place each drawing in the breath the other blows but how great joys they found that little space ye well may guess but none for certain knows their sport was such so well their leer they coop that oft they had two tongues within one mouth now though they keep this close with great regard yet not so close but some did find the same for though that virtue oft wants due reward yet seldom vice wants due deserved blame rogero still was more and more preferred each one to him with cap and curtsy came for fair alcina being now in love would have him placed the others all above in pleasure here they spend the night and day they change their clothes so often as they lust within they feast they dance to sport and play abroad they hunt they hawk they ride they just and so while sensual life doth bear the sway all discipline is trodden in the dust thus while rogero here his time misspends he quite forgets his duty and his friends for while rogero bides in feast and joy king agramant doth take great care and pain dame bradamant doth suffer great annoy and travelled far to find him all in vain she little knew alcina did enjoy her due delights yet doth she moan and plain to think how strangely the same flying horse bear him away against his will by force in towns in fields in hills in dales she sought in tents in camps 
in lodgings and in caves. Oft she inquired, but yet she learned not. She passed the river's fresh and salt sea waves. Among the Turks she leaves him not unsought, for a mercy ring that her from danger saves, a ring whose virtue works a thing scant possible, which, holding in her mouth, she goes invisible. She will not, nor she cannot, think him dead, for if a man of so great worth should die, it would some great report or fame have bred from east unto the west, both far and nigh. It cannot sink, nor settle in her head, whether he be in seas, in earth or sky, yet still she seeks, and her companions are sorrows and sighs and fears and loving care. At last she means to turn unto the cave where lie the great and learned Merlin's bones, and at that tomb to cry so loud and rave as shall with pity move the marble stones, nor till she may some certain notice have of her beloved to stay her plaints and moans, in hope to bring her purpose to effect by doing as that prophet should direct. Now as her course to Poitiers' way she bent, Melissa, using wanted skill and art, encountered her, her journey to prevent, who knew full well and did to her impart both where he was and how his time was spent, which grieved the venturous damsel to the heart that such a knight so valiant erst and wise should so be drowned in pleasure and in vice. O oh, poisoned hook that lurks in sugared bait, O oh, pleasures vain that in this world are found, which, like a subtle thief, do lie in wait to swallow man in sink of sin profound. O oh, kings and peers, beware of this deceit, and be not in this gulf of pleasure drowned. The time will come, and must I tell you all, when these your joys shall bitter seem as gall. Then turn your cloth of gold to clothes of hairs, your feasts to fasts, to sorrow turn your songs, your wanton toys and smilings into tears, to restitution turn your doing wrongs, your fond secureness turn to godly fears, and know that vengeance unto God belongs, who, when he comes to judge the souls of men, it will be late, alas, to mend it then. Then shall the virtuous man shine like the sun. Then shall the vicious man repent his pleasure. Then one good deed of alms sincerely done shall be more worth than mines of Indian treasure. Then sentence shall be given, which none shall shun. Then God shall weigh and pay our deeds by measure. Unfortunate and thrice accursed they whom fond delights to make forget that day. But to return unto my tale again, I say Melissa took no little care to draw Rogero by some honest train from this same place of feasts and dainty fare, and like a faithful friend refused no pain to set him free from her sweet senseless snare to which his uncle brought him with intent his destiny thereby for to prevent. As oft we see men are so fond and blind to carry to their sons too much affection, that when they seem to love they are unkind, for they do hate a child that's fair correction. So did Atlanta, not with evil mind, give to Rogero this so bad direction, but of a purpose thereby to withdraw his fatal end that he before foresaw. For this he sent him past so many seas, unto the isle that I before did name, esteeming less his honour than his ease, a few years' life than everlasting fame. For this he caused him so well to please Alcina, that same rich lascivious dame, that, though his time old Nestor's life had finished, yet her affection should not be diminished. But good Melissa, on a ground more sure, that loved his honour better than his weal, by sound persuasions, means him to procure from pleasure's court to virtues to appeal, as leeches good that in a desperate cure with steel, with flame, and oft with poison, heal, of which, although the patient do complain, yet at the last he thanks him for his pain. And thus Melissa promised her aid, and helped Rogero back again to bring, which much recomforted the noble maid that loved this knight above each earthly thing. But for the better doing this, she said, 
it were behooveful that he had her ring whose virtue was that whoso did it wear should never need the force of charms to fear but bradamant that would not only spare her ring to do him good but eke her heart commends the ring and him unto her care and so these ladies take their leave and part melissa for her journey doth prepare by her well-tried skill in magic art a beast that might supply her present lack that had one red foot and another black such haste she made that by the break of day she was arrived in alcina's isle but straight she changed her shape and her array that she rogero better might beguile her stature tall she makes her head all gray a long white beard she takes to hide the while in fine she doth so cunningly dissemble that she the old atlanta doth resemble and in this sort she waiteth till she might by fortune find rogero in fit place which very seldom hath for day and night he stood so high in fair alcina's grace that she could least abide of any wight to have him absent but a minute's space at last full early in a morning fair she spied him walk abroad to take the air about his neck a cark neat rich he wear of precious stones all set in gold well tried his arms that erst all warlike weapons bear in golden bracelets wantonly were tied into his ears two rings conveyed are golden wire at which on either side two indian pearls in making like two pairs of passing price were pendant at his ears his locks bedewed with waters of sweet savour stood curled round in order on his head he had such wanton womanish behaviour as though in valence he had long been bred so changed in speech in manners and in favour so from himself beyond all reason led by these enchantments of this amorous dame he was himself in nothing but in name which when the wise and kind melissa saw resembling still atlanta's person sage of whom rogero always stood in awe even from his tender youth to elder age she toward him with look austere did draw and with a voice abrupt as half in rage is this quoth she the guerdon and the gain i find for all my travel and my pain what was for this that i in youth thee fed with marrow of the bears and lions fell that i through caves and deserts have thee led where serpents of most ugly shape do dwell where tigers fierce and cruel leopards bred and taught thee how their forces all to quell an attis or adonis for to be unto alcina as i now thee see was this foreshowed by those observed stars by figures and nativities oft cast by dreams by oracles that never ours by those vain arts i studied in times past that thou shouldst prove so rare a man in wars whose famous deeds to endless praise should last whose acts should honoured be both far and near and not be matched with such another peer is this a mean or ready way do trow which other worthy men have trod before a caesar or a scipio to grow and to increase in honour more and more but to the end a man may certain know how thrall thou art unto alcina's lore thou wearest here her chains and slavish bands with which she binds thy warlike arms and hands if thou regard not thine own estimation to which the heavens ordain thee if thou would defraud not yet thine heirs and generation of which i have thee oftentime foretold appointed by a turn predestination except thou do their due from them withhold out of thy loins and bowels to proceed such men whose match the world did never breed let not so many a worthy soul and mind framed by the wisdom of the heavenly king be hindered of the bodies them assigned whose offspring chief must of thy issue spring be not unto thine own blood so unkind of whose great triumphs all the world shall ring whose successors whose children and posterity shall help our country to her old prosperity what good hath this great queen unto thee done but many other queens can do the same what certain gain is by her service won that soon doth fancy sooner doth defame wherefore to make thee know what thou hast done 
that of thy doings thou mayst have some shame but wear this ring and next time you repair to your alcina mark if she be fair rogero all abashed and mute did stand with silent tongue and look for shame downcast the good enchantress took him by the hand and on his finger straight the ring she placed but when this ring had made him understand his own estate he was so sore aghast he wished himself half buried underground much rather than in such place once be found but she that saw her speech took good effect and that rogero shamed of his sin she doth her person and her name detect and as herself not atland doth begin by counsel and advice him to direct to rid himself of this so dangerous gin and gives him perfect notice and instruction how these deceits do bring men to destruction she showed him plainly she was thither sent by bradamant that loved him in sincerity who to deliver him from bondage meant of her that blinded him with false prosperity how she took atlan's person to the intent her countenance might carry more austerity but finding now him home reduced again she saith she will declare the matter plain and unto him forthwith she doth impart how that fair dame that best deserved his love did send that ring and would have sent her heart if so her heart his good so far might move the ring this virtue had it could subvert all magic frauds and make them vain to prove Rogero, as I said, no time did linger, but put the ring upon his little finger. When truth appeared, Rogero hated more Alcina's trumperies, and did them detest, than he was late enamoured before. O oh, happy ring that makes the bearer blessed! Now saw he that he could not see before, how with deceits Alcina had been dressed, her borrowed beauties all appeared stained, the painting gone, nothing but filth remained even as a child that taking from the tree an apple ripe and hides it in some place when he returns the same again to see after a samite or fortnight's space doth scant believe it should the same fruit be when rottenness that ripeness doth deface and where before delight in it he took now scant he bides upon the same to look even so Ruggiero plainly now descried Alcina's foul disgraces and enormity. Because of this his ring, she could not hide by all her painting any one deformity. He saw most plainly that in her did bide unto her former beauties no conformity, but looked so ugly that from east to west was not a fouler o oh, misshapen beast. Her face was wan, a lean and rivaled skin. Her stature scant three horse-loaves did exceed. Her hair was grey of hue and very thin. Her teeth were gone, her gums served in their steed. No space there was between her nose and chin. Her noisome breath contagion would breed. In fine, of her it might have well been said, In Nestor's youth she was a pretty maid. I fear her arts are learned nowadays, To counterfeit their hair and paint their skin. But reasons ring their crafts and guiles berets. No wise man of their paintings pass a pin. Those virtues that in women merit raise are sober shows without chaste thoughts within. True faith and due obedience to their make, and of their children honest care to take. Now, though Ruggiero, as before I said, detested sore the ugly witch's sight, yet by melissa's counsel wisely led he doth conceal the matter for a night till of provision he were better sped with which he might more safely take his flight and taking care his meaning close to hide he doth forthwith his armour all provide and tells alcina he would go and try if that he were not waxen gross or no because that idle he so long did lie and never fought with any armoured foe his sword unto his girdle he would tie with armour on a walking he doth go and with a scarf about his arm he lapped the shield that in the cypress case was wrapped and thus arrayed he cometh to the stable and took a horse as wise melissa taught a horse as black as any jet or sable so made as if in wax he had been wrought most swift 
for course, and strong of limbs and able. This horse, hight Rabican, was thither brought by Duke Astolfo, who by sorcery was turned late into a myrtle tree. As for the Griffith horse that there was by, Melissa wisheth him to let him stand, and saith that she herself ere long would try to make him gentle to the spur and hand, and that she would hereafter time a spy to bring at him, and let him understand how he should do with very little pain to make him yield to spur, to rod, and rein. She further saith, his flight would be suspected except he let the flying horse to stay. Rogero none of all her words neglected, but did her counsel wise and sage obey. And so, before his meaning was detected, from this misshapen hag he stole away, and means, if God will grant him so much grace, to be at Logistilla's in short space. Such men of arms as watched at the gate he slew, the rest he suddenly assailed, good was his hap that scaped with broken pate. They took their heels, when as their hearts them failed. Alcina now had notice all too late. Rogero was so far it not availed, but in another book shall be contained how him Dame Logistilla entertained. End of Book Seven. The Eighth Book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Eight. The Argument. Rogero fled. Melissa after stayed a stalfo with some others to the store. Rinaldo Muster's soldiers sent for aid to Charles the Great, who never needed more. Angelica, by drowsy hermit laid, is pain and bound all naked to the shore. Orlando is so troubled with his dream, he leaves the service of his king and reigns. O oh, strange enchantments used nowadays! O oh, charmers strange among us daily found, that find so many charms and subtle ways, wherewith they hold fond lovers' hearts fast bound! Not with conjured spirits that they raise, nor knowledge of the stars and skill profound, but blinding men's conceits, and them fast trying with simulation, fraud, deceit, and lying. But he that had the rule and ring of reason should soon their frauds, their crafts, and guiles discover, and find a horde of foul and loathsome treason to lurk within the show of such a lover. Well may they seem most lovely for a season, when all their wrinkles they with painting cover, but unto men of wit and reason learned, their subtlety shall quickly be discerned. Rogero, as I said, in secret sort with Rabican out of the castle went, and made the watch and guard unpleasant sport that most of them his coming might repent. Some had their arms and some their heads cut short, all put to flight, the gates in pieces rent, and then unto the wood he entered when he met by chance one of Alcina's men. This man did bear a falcon on his fist, with which he went on hawking day by day to fly in field or river as he list. The country full of game still yielded prey. He had a spaniel, could not well be missed, and eke a hawking nag not very gay, and meeting good Rogero half disguised, that he was fled away, he straight surmised. The servant rideth on, and at their meeting he asked Rogero why he rode so fast. Rogero gave him very slender greeting, as though on such a squire he little passed. Well, quoth the Faulkner, though thou now art fleeting, I trust ere long to show thee such a cast that with my dog, my falcon, and my horse I do not doubt to fetch thee back by force. And first he lets the falcon take her flight, but Rabican as fast as she did fly. Then from his horse the Faulkner doth alight. His horse flew like an arrow by and by. Then went the dog, who was of course so light, as is the wind that bloweth in the sky. And last of all himself ran with such shift it seemed the lightning's flame was not so swift. Rogero thinketh it a foul disgrace that any man should think he fled for fear, and more because he now was had in chase. Wherefore he doth a while the flight forbear, and manfully to them he turns his face, and seeing no man but the Faulkner there, and that no weapon in his hand he saw, he much disdained on him his sword to draw. But straight the dog doth bite his horse's heels, 
the hawk his head amazed with her wings when ravican such strange foes forces feels he riseth up before behind he flings rogero thought the world had run on wheels and belisarda out at once he brings but they it seemed so well were seen in fence that all his blows to them brought no offence both loath to stay resolved not to yield he takes his target from his saddle bow and with the dazzling light of that same shield whose force melissa lately made him know he made them fall as if their eyes were sealed so that no farther let from them did grow but having vanquished them this wise with ease he now may ride at leisure where he please these foes once foiled their forces overcome alcinous straight had notice of his flight for of the watchman one to her was come that while these things were done did stand in sight this made her stand like one half dead or dumb and after put her into such a fright that forthwith for avoiding further harm through all the town she made them cry alarm and calling oft herself a foolish beast because rogero so from her was slipped sometimes she beats her head her face and breast sometime in rage her garments all she ripped she calleth all her men from most to least a part of whom under the sea she shipped, and of the rest she makes a mighty band to fetch Rogero back again by land. All were so busy to this service bent that none remained the palace there to guard, which greatly helped Melissa's good intent, which chiefly was, as you before have hard, to set at large poor prisoners so long pent, which now to do, she absent, was not hard, dissolving all her circles and her knots, and destroying all her figures and her lot and thus in fields in houses and in woods she set at large as many as she found that had been turned to trees to stones and floods and in that state by magic art fast bound likewise to them she rendered all their goods who when they saw themselves so clear unbound departing thence with all the haste they might to logistilla they arrived that night and first of all the chief of all the rest the english duke came to himself again because Rogero loved and wished him best, and lends the ring that makes enchantments vain. But good Melissa could by no means rest until she could his armor eke regain, and that same famous worthy gilded lance that had to him such honor done in France, with which Argalia got no little fame, who used it oft the same in fight to bear. Now when Melissa to the castle came, she found his other armor with the spear, and this achieved, the sage and friendly dame mounts on the Griffith horse without all fear, and Duke Astolfo mounting on his crupper, to Logistilla's came that night to supper. Now was Rogero with no small ado tiring himself amid those craggy ways, and striving all that he with pain may do to cut off all those loathsome long delays that hindered him for sooner coming to that lady fair whose virtues merit praise till near the southern sea with mickle pain he came unto a sandy desert plain here was he plagued with thirst and parching heat and with the sun reflecting on the sand which from the south upon the banks did beat and flaming still the air on either hand but leaving now rogero in this sweat that still i may not in one matter stand to scotland now i will return again and of rinaldo take a word or twain Great was his entertainment, and his cheer, made by the king and people of the land, which feasts once done, the worthy valiant peer, as was his charge, doth let them understand how Charles the Great, whose state doth touch them near, in no small need of their good aid did stand, and how for this he sent him to their nation, and to this tale he adds an exhortation. Then was it answered him without delay, that for King Charles and for the empire's sake they all were ready to do all they may and would for this behoof short order take and offered him to show if he would stay what store of horse and footman he could make namely the king himself would be right glad to go in person uh, but his age forbade nor yet should age with him so much have done as make him from the battle to abide save that he had a wise and valiant son note zerbino well able such a band of men to guide 
whose value had already praises won, and of his youth was now in flower and pride. This noble toward him he doth intend as captain of his armed men to send. Wherefore about his realm forthwith he sent to get of horses and of men good store, with ships and things to war most pertinent, as needful meat, and money needful more. The while Rinaldo unto England went, the king to Barwick company him bore, and men report that when they should depart the king was seen to weep for tender heart. Rinaldo went with fair and prosperous wind, and passed along upon the English coast, until he happed the noble Thames to find, of which all London justly make their boast. Here he took land, as first he had assigned, and in twelve hours' journey riding post, under the Prince of Wales he was conducted, whom of these matters fully he instructed. The prince, that was vice chairman to the king, that Oton hight, who sojourned now in France, from whom Rinaldo did commission bring to take up horse and men and ordnance, when he had once true knowledge of that thing which, of all other, he would most advance, he marshalled men of arms without delay, and points them meet at Callis by a day. Uh, but here I must a while from hence digress, lest to one tale my pen should still be bound, as good musicians do their skill express by playing on the strings of diverse sound, while Reynold here is cheered with great excess, as ever in the English land is found, I mean to tell how that fair lady sped, that twice before from this Rinaldo fled. I told you how Angelica the Bright fled from Rinaldo in a thick dark wood, how on a hermit there she hapt to light, and how her sight revived his aged blood. But she that took in him but small delight, whose hoary hairs could do her little good, with this good hermit made but little stay, but turned her horse's reins and went away. The hermit, seeing he contemned was, whom age long since, and love did newly blind, doth spur a thousand times his silly ass, who still remained more and more behind, and sith he saw he could not bring to pass to stop her course, afflicted much in mind, in vain he doth his poor ass beat and curse. His trot was very bad, his gallop worse, and being out of hope of coming nigher, as having almost lost her horse's track, he studies how to compass his desire with some rare stratagem to bring her back. Unto that art forthwith he doth retire, that damned art that is surnamed Black, and by his books of magic he doth make a little sprite the lady overtake. And as the hound that men the tumbler name, when he a hare or cunny doth espy, doth seem another way his course to frame, as though he meant not to approach more nigh, but yet he meeteth at the last his game, and shaketh it until he make it die. So doth the hermit traverse all about, at every turn to find the damsel out. What he intends to do, for well I wot, and mean ere long the same to you to show. The damsel travelled still that knew it not. The sprite, to do his office, was not slow, for straight within the horse himself he got, as she on sands of Gascoigne seas did go. The sprite that fully had possessed the horse did drive her to the sea with all his force, which when the fair and fearful damsel saw, although she tried full oft with rod and rein her palfrey from his dangerous course to draw, yet, seeing plainly she did strive in vain, with colour changed for anguish and for awe, and casting off her look to land again, at last she sitteth still, nor further striveth, for needs they must go whom the devil driveth. In vain it was to strike the horse her bare, it was not done by that poor palfrey's fault. Wherefore she tucked her garments, taking care lest they should be bedewed with water salt. Upon her hair, which then all loose she wear, the air doth make an amorous assault. The greater wines were still, I think, of beauty that they acknowledge to so rare a beauty. The waters more, the land still less she sees. At last she saw but one small piece of land, and that small piece in small time she doth lease. Now sees she neither shore nor any sand, 
Then cold despair all lively hope did freeze, When as her horse did turn to the right hand, And at the twilight, for not long before, Did bring her to a solitary shore. Here, she remaining helpless and alone, Among the fruitless trees and senseless rocks, Standing herself all like the marble stone, Save that sometimes she tear her golden locks, At last, her eyes to tears, her tongue to moan she doth resolve, Her fair soft breast she knocks and blames the God of heaven And power divine that did the fates unto her fall incline. O oh, fortune, fortune, thus the damsel cried, Fill now thy rage and execute thine ire, And take this life that takest all beside, And let my death accomplish thy desire. I have and daily do thy force abide. Fear still my mind, travel my limbs doth tire, And makes me think in this great storm and strife That death were sweet to shorten such a life. Can all thy malice do me further spite? Can any state be worse or more unsteady? That am from princely scepter banished quite, A helpless hap and hurt past all remedy. And worse than this, mine honour, shining bright, is stained sore, and even defaced already. For though in act no ill I ever wrought, yet wandering thus will make men think me not. What can a woman hold of any price if once she leaves her honour and good name? Alas, I hate this beauty, and despise, and wish it never had been of such fame. Ne do I for this gift now thank the skies by which my spoil and utter ruin came, which caused my brother Argel shed his blood, ne could his arms enchanted do him good. For this the king of Tartar, Agrican, sought of my father Galifron the spoil, who while Om was in India called Great Cain, and after died with sorrow of the foil. For this I daily doubting to be ta'en from place to place to pass with endless toil, and now to lose, alas, what hast thou left me since fame and goods and friends are all bereft me? If drowning in the sea were not a death severe enough to quench thy raging spite, then send some beast out of this desert heap to tear my limbs and to devour me quite. I shall thee thank for stopping of my breath if to torment me thou have no delight. These woeful words uttered the lady bright, When straight the hermit came within her sight, Who all the while had in a corner stood And heard her make this piteous plaint and moan, Proceeding from her sad and mourning mood, Enough to move a heart as hard as stone. It did the Senex fornicate her good To think that he was there with her alone, Yet so devoutly cometh this old carrion, As though it had been Paul or Saint Hilarion, when, as the damsel saw a man appear in such a desert solitary place, she straight began to be of better cheer, though fear and dread appear still in her face, and with a voice so loud as he might hear, she prayed him pity this her woeful case, recounting all her dangers overblown to him to whom they were already known. No sooner had the hermit heard her out, but straight to comfort her he doth begin, and shows by many reasons and devout how all these plagues were sent her for her sin, the while he puts his saucy hands about sometime her breast, sometime her neck and chin, and more and more still gathering heart of grace he offers boldly her for to embrace. But she, that much disdained this homely fashion, doth stain her cheeks with red for very shame, thrust back his Karen corpse without compassion, reviling him with many a spiteful name, who, testy with old age and with new passion, that did him now with wrath and love inflame, draws out a bottle of a strange confection that sleep procureth by a strong infection. With this he sprinkleth both the damsel's eyes, those eyes whence Cupid oft his arrows shot, straight Sound asleep the goodly damsel lies, Subjected to the will of such a sot. Nay, yet for aught he did or could devise, He could procure his kirtle, stir a jot. Yet oft he kissed her lips, her cheeks, her breast, And felt and saw the beauties of the rest. 
the dullard jade still hangeth down his head stirring or spurring could not make him prance the sundrier ways he said the worse he sped his youthful days were done he could not dance his strength was gone his courage all was dead his weapon looked like a broken lance and while himself in vain he thus doth cumber he falleth down by her into a slumber but now another evil chance befell for one ill turn alone is seldom done the which to thend i may the better tell know this about the setting of the sun there is an isle a buddha as men tell whose habitants are well nigh all undone by means that mighty proteus to the sent an orc that doth the people tear and rent within this isle as ancient stories tell i not affirm how false they are or true sometime a king of mighty power did dwell that had a daughter passing fair of hue the which fair lady proteus liked so well when her on sands in walking he did view that though he dwelt in water salt and cold yet fresh hot love on him had taken hold which heat when all the sea could not assuage he thought her milk-warm flesh could only quench and for he saw she was of lawful age with her consent he forced the princely wench which sin did set her father in such rage that straight condemning her in open bench her of her life he publicly bereaved nor spared the infant in her womb conceived this cruel act her lover so inflamed on king and island he doth wreak his spite he sends that monster that before i named with other beasts destroy the island quite these monsters hurt their men beat killed and lamed in fine put all the people in such fright that to escape the beast devoid of pity they left their fields and fled unto their city and though men armed the gates and walls defend yet they within scant thought themselves secure and sith their harms have neither ease nor end and tired these tedious travels to endure unto apollo's oracle they send to know how they their safety might procure who after humble suit and sacrifice answered them of a buddha in this wise blood guiltless spilt did breed great proteus ire inflamed with love and fed with beauties rare blood guiltless must be spilt to quench this fire till one be found may with the first compare this you must do and if you peace desire to take of damsels those that fairest are and offered one a day upon the shore till he find one like unto that before this woeful answer breeding much despair and more dislike within their careful heart to think that every day a damsel fair must for a prey be given without desert this is the cause that maketh them repair to find sufficient store to sundry parts to get them virgins fair and undeflowered of this most ugly orc to be devoured now if this be a proteus true or not i mean not in defence of it to stand but this is certain so for well i wot men use this cruel custom in that land and day by day a maid is drawn by lot and left for prey upon the rock or sand unto the monster that doth them devour even in their prime of youth and tender flower o wretched whites whom subtle snares have brought unto this unfortunate and fatal isle where damsels fair and handsome out are sought to serve for food unto a monster vile there pirates bring them home there vessels fraught with such they take by force or trap with wile with which they fill their prisons and their towers to have them ready at appointed hours thus sending out their vessels day by day it chanced that one of them with tempest tossed haps to arrive whereas the hermit lay with that fair lady hard upon the coast o oh, cruel chance o oh, precious fearless prey among the pirates either to be lost or to be carried to the fatal isle to be devoured of a monster vile that beauty rare that sacripant a deemed more dear than living liberty or life that beauty rare that to orlando seemed most fit of all the world to be his wife 
that beauty rare in India so esteemed, that bred so many a blow and bloody strife, is now so quite of aid and comfort reft, not one to speak a word for her is left. The damsel fair, drowned in a deadly sleep, was ta'en and bound before she could awake. Also the drowsy friar, to make him keep her company, away with them they take. This done, they launched out into the deep, and with this precious prey they homeward make, where in a castle they detained her thrall, until to die her luckless lot should fall. Yet such great force her passing beauty had among these barbarous and savage whites, that they appeared sorrowful and sad to weigh the danger of her doleful plight. It seemed all of them would have been glad to have preserved her many days and nights, but such small store of others there remained, at last to offer her they were constrained. Who can the woes, the tears, the plaints rehearse, the lamentations, and the mourning sound that seemed the heavens themselves with noise to pierce, to rend the rocks and stir the steady ground, her ivory corpse conveyed, as in a hearse by wailing whites, where they must leave it bound, the thought hereof in me such pang doth breed, I can no further in this tale proceed. Wherefore I must some other matter find until my muse her sorrow may assuage, for sure no cruel beast was so unkind, nor tiger in their greatest wrath and rage, nor any cruel tyrant can we find, although there are good store in every age, that could behold or think without compassion a lady bounden in so vile a fashion. Oh, had Orlando notice of her smart, who was to Paris gone to seek her out, or those two knights whom late the fiends did part, the which for love of her together fought, they would for her use all pain, care, and art, of death nor danger they would put no doubt, but if they help not now it is no wonder, sith they and she were placed so far asunder. Now in this time to Paris siege was laid, by famous Agramant, Trojano's son, of which at last they grew so sore afraid, the town had almost of the Turks been won. Had not their vows procured them heavenly aid, they had been ruined all and quite undone. The force of France had well nigh then been foiled, the holy empire had almost been spoiled. For when that now the city was on fire, and when all hope of human help was past, then mighty God, forgetting wrath and ire, upon their tears, repentance true and fast, at Charles's humble prayer and desire, with help from heaven, relieved them at the last, and sent such rain to aid the noble prince, as seld was seen before and never since. Now lay Orlando in his restless bed, and thinks with sleep to rest his troubled sprite. But still a thousand thoughts possessed his head, troubling his mind and sleep expelling quite, as circles in a water clear are spread when sun doth shine by day and moon by night, succeeding one another in a rank till all by one and one do touch the bank. So when his mistress entered in his thought, as lightly she was never thence away, the thought of her in him such circles wrought as kept him waking ever night and day to think how he from India had her brought, and that she should thus on the sudden stray, nor that he could of her true notice know, since Charles at Burdell had the overthrow. The grief hereof did him most nearly touch, and caused him often to himself to say, What beast would have been overruled so much, that when I might have made her with me stay, for why her love and zeal to me was such that in her life she never said me nay, Yet I must suffer Namath for to guard her, as though myself but little did regard her. I should to Charles myself have rather excused, and as I did have kept the damsel still, or if excuses all had been refused, I might instead of reason pleaded will, and rather than have been so much abused, all those that should resist me slay and kill, at least I might have got her safer keeping, and not have let her thus be lost with sleeping. Where bidest thou? Where wanderest thou, my dear, so young, so lovely, and so fair of you? Even like a lamb, when stars do first appear, her dame and shepherd being out of view, bleateth aloud, 
to make the shepherd hear, and in her kind her evil hap doth rue, until the wolf doth find her to her pain, the silly shepherd seeking her in vain. Where is my love, my joy, my life's delight? Wanderst thou still? Do not the wolves offend thee? Or needst thou not the service of thy night? And keepest thou the flower did so commend thee? That flower that me may make a happy white, that flower for which I ever did defend thee, that I forbear to please thy mind too chaste, is not that flower last now gone and past? O oh, most unfortunate and wretched I, if they have ta'en that sweet and precious flower, what can I do in such a case but die? Yea, I would kill myself this present hour. I would this world and that to come defy. Earth first my course and hell my soul devour. And this unto himself Orlando said, with care and sorrows being overlaid. Now was the time when man and bird and beast gives to his travelled body due repose, when some on beds and some on boards do rest, sleep making them forget both friends and foes. But cares do thee, Orlando, so molest that scarce thou canst thine eyes a little close, and yet that fugitive and little slumber with dreams unpleasant thee doth vex and cumber. He dreamt that standing by a pleasant green upon a bank with fragrant flowers all painted, he saw the fairest sight that erst was seen, I mean that face with which he was acquainted, and those two stars that Cupid sits between, whence came that shaft whose head his heart hath painted. The sight whereof did breed in him that pleasure that he preferred before all worldly treasure. He thought himself the fortunatest wight that ever was, and he the blessed lover, but lo, a storm destroyed the flowers quite, and all the pleasant bank with hail did cover. Then suddenly departed his delight, which he remained all hopeless to recover. She, being of this tempest so afraid, that in the wood to save herself she strayed. And there, unhappy wretch, against his will, he lost his lady in unlucky hour. But her to find again he travelled still, employing to her safety all his power. The woods and deserts he with plaints doth fill, and cried, Alas, turned is my sweet to sour. And while these same and such like words he said, he thought he heard her voice demanding aid. At the same voice, well known, a while he stayed, then followed as the sound him guided most. With this mischance, his mind was much dismayed, his body sore with toil and travel tossed. Then straight he heard another voice that said, Now hope no more, for all thy hope is lost. And of the sudden waking with the sound, his eyes all full of watery tears he found. So sore he was affrighted at this vision, that even as though it had been so indeed, and not a fancy vain or apparition, Thinking his lady stood of him in need, in secret sort he getteth all provision to make repair unto her aid with speed. And, for he would not willingly be known, he took no man nor armor of his own. His coat of arms of color white and red he left behind, for doubt of ill success. And, if it fortuned he but evil sped, at least the loss and foil should be the less. Upon his armor cypress black he spread with color sad his sorrow to express, and thus disguised in sad and mourning hue he parts and biddeth not his friends adieu. Not of King Charles, whose kinsman he is near, nor taketh he his leave of Brandemart, nor yet to kinsman kind or friend most dear doth he his meaning open or impart, nor until day did all abroad appear was Charles advised that he did depart. But in great rage and choler when he knew it, he swear and vowed Orlando sore should rue it. At which good Brandemart was greatly grieved, as one that deemed it was without his art, and that his friend by him might be relieved, to find him out, and then he straight the part. For by his words he certainly believed that he could ease his friend Orlando's smart, but this to Fjordaledge he not imparted, 
for fear that she his purpose would have thwarted. This Yordalege of him was dearly loved, a lady of great beauty and clear fame, of parents good, of manners unreproved, both wealthy, wise, and modest to the same. Yet taketh he no leave of his beloved, but early in the morning from her came. To turn that night was his determination, but was deceived of his expectation. And when she waited had a month or more, expecting his return, and all in vain, for love of him she was inflamed so sore, alone she goes to find him out again. And many sorry haps she bid, therefore, as in the story shall be showed plain. For of Orlando now I have to say, that is of more importance than both they, who, having changed the arms he late did wear, directly to the city gate he went, and told the sentinel softly in his ear that what was his name, and what was his intent, who straight abased the bridge without all fear, supposing sure his uncle had him sent, and straight upon the pagan camp he lighted, as in the book ensuing is recited. End of Book Eight The Ninth Book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Nine. The Argument. Orlando hastes his journey when he hears what costly food Proteus his orc allows. But by the way, Moved with Olympia's tears, that did lament her late captived spouse, his hasty journey he a while forbears, to wreak her wrong upon her foe he vows, which done, no longer in the place he tarries, by Reno false at the fair Olympia marries. Alas, what damage cannot Cupid bring a noble heart once thralled to his lore? That makes Orlando careless of his king to whom of late most faithful love he bore, who erst so grave and wise in everything, and of the church a champion was before, now that in love's blind paths he learns to plod, forgets himself, his country, and his God. Fain would I him disburden of this blame, glad in my faults a fellow such to find, for to my good I feel me dull and lame, but prompt to ill and swifter than the wind. He, not bethinking him how great a shame it was to leave his helpless friends behind, went where the kings of Africa and of Spain did lie in field encamped with all their train. Yet not encamped, I can them call, for why they lay abroad dispersed with the rain. Some twenty, ten, or eight together lie, or six, or five, or four, or three, or twain. Some farther off, and some are lodged nigh, all weary with their former taken pain. He might have killed of them a worthy crew, ne yet his Duradena once he drew. The cause was this. So noble was his mind, to murder men asleep he thought it base. He lets them rest, and seeks his love to find, by every person and in every place. And those he meets, with words and speeches kind, describing her apparel and her face, he prays of all good fellowship to show, or where she is, or whither she did go. When light approached and day began to break, by day he seeks her in the host of Turks, his passion strong to make his reason weak yield to the fit that in his fancy works. Some help it was he could their language speak, by which the safer he among them lurks. His words, his weeds, so like to theirs were seen, as though he bred in Tripoli had been. But when he saw his staying was for naught, at three days' end, away from thence he flang. He left no town of France and Spain unsought, Nay, yet this pain could not assuage that pang. Him autumn first this wandering humour brought, When fruits do fade, his fruitless love first sprang, And lasted still, his force and rage renewing, Both all the spring and summer next ensuing. Now, having travelled as his custom was from realm to realm, He came upon a day, where as the river clear sometime as glass, that twixt the Britons and the Normans lay, was grown so high as now he could not pass. The snow and rain had borne so great a sway. 
by force whereof the bridge was overthrown the passage stopped the fords were overflown and looking round about the shore at large devising how to pass to the other side he saw a little way from thence a barge that seemed toward him the course to guide of which a certain damsel had the charge to whom with voice aloud orlando cried entreating her because his haste was great within the barge him to afford a seat the maid affirmed no price the barge could hire and to command it he had no commission but promised she would grant him his desire upon a certain covenant and condition which was to undertake by sword and fire for to destroy an isle without remission a cruel isle a buddha called by name the wicked's place where ever creature came for no quoth she beyond the irish land there lies among the rest this graceless isle that yearly sends a wicked whites a band to rob to spoil to fraud and to beguile all women kind that happen in their hand they give for food unto a monster vile a monster vile that useth every day to have a maid or woman for his prey of merchants and of pirates that do come they get them store and of the fairest most now guess by one a day how great a sum of women kind within this isle are lost if then of love you ever tasted crumb make one within the king of ireland's hosts that make them ready shortly to proceed to take a fair revenge of this foul deed no sooner had orlando heard her out but vowed to be as forward as the first to join himself with that same worthy rout and now for love doth ever cast the worst within himself begins to cast this doubt lest that this wicked monster and accursed had got his lady for a dainty bit because he heard no news of her as yet and this conceit his mind so much possessed and in his heart made such a deep impression for both in nature he did still detest all such as unto others do oppression and much he feared his love among the rest might fall into the monster's vile possession that straight he shipped and by their due account within three days he passed st michael's mount but having passed now the milk-white sand of which the isle of albion takes his name the wind that in the south before did stand with so great fury to the northwest came in vain it was against the same to stand and therefore to retire it was no shame back in one night the tempest drave them more than they had sailed three days and nights before for when they saw it was no boot to strive against the fury of so fierce a wind they went even as the weather did them drive until the stream of antwerp they did find where they to land with safety did arrive there lo an aged man with years half blind who deemed orlando of that crew the chief to this effect uttered to him his grief how that a certain dame of noble blood of virtue very great of beauty rare of sober cheer and of behaviour good though now oppressed with misery and care requested him except his haste withstood that she to him a matter might declare in which to ask his wise advice she meant to which orlando quickly did consent the lady's palace stood within the land to which the earl conducted was with speed where at the entry did the lady stand in mourning show and sorrowful indeed who brought orlando sadly by the hand into a chamber hanged with mournful weed first him by her to sit she doth beseech and then in rueful sort she used this speech first were they knight i would you understood i was the earl of holland's daughter dear who was to me so tender and so good that though my brothers both were him as near yet my desire in nothing he withstood nor spake the word that i was loath to hear thus whiles in state most steady i did stand a certain duke arrived in this land the duke of zealand and his arrant was to bisky there against the moors to fight his age and beauty that did others pass moved me that had not tasted love's delight nor armed against his darts with steel or brass to yield myself his prisoner without fight believing then as still i do and shall that he to me doth carry love not small for while the wine's contrary hear him stay though not for his yet excellent for my drift what time meseemed each week was but a day the pleasant hours did slide away so swift we kept ourselves together day by day till at the last we made us so good shift that ere we parted we had so procured each was to other man and wife assured 
by Reno was from hence but newly gone, so is my dear beloved husband's name, but that a great ambassador anon directly from the king of Friesland came to treat a certain marriage upon with other of that nation of good fame that to my sire from Holland did repair, that I might marry with his son and heir. But I, in whom faith took so deep a root, I could not change my new-made choice, and though I would, to strive with love it was no boot, that wounded me so lately with his bow. To stop the motions newly set on foot, before they might to farther matter grow, I would not go. I flatly told my father that I to die a thousand deaths had rather. My loving sire, that chiefest care did take, that all he did might me his daughter please, agreeing to my will, and for my sake my grief so new conceived to appease, straightway the motion of this marriage break which did so sore the Friesland king displease, he made sharp wars on Holland in short space, by force whereof he ruined all my race. For first he is of limbs and body strong to meet his enemies in open field, and then so politic in doing wrong he makes their force unto his fraud to yield. He hath his other weapons strange among, a weapon strange before this seen but sealed, a trunk of iron hollow made within, and there he puts powder and pellet in, all closed save a little hole behind, whereat no sooner taken is the flame, the bullet flies with such a furious wind, that though from clouds a bolt of thunder came, and whatsoever in the way it find it burns, it breaks, it tears, and spoils the same. No doubt some fiend of hell or devilish wight devised it to do mankind a spite. And thus... With this device and many other, in open field our battles twice he break, and first in fight he slew mine elder brother, the bullet through his curate way did make, and next in flight he took and killed the t'other, which caused my father's aged heart to quake, who notwithstanding stoutly did intend his honour and my safety to defend, but in a hold that only now was left him, they him besieged, that all the rest had won, and by sharp battle all the rest had reft him, where to a loop one level so a gun, the blow thereof of life and sense bereft him, so swift it came, as none the same may shun. A weapon vile, wherewith a foolish boy may worthy captain's mischief and annoy. Thus was my father and my brothers slain, before this furious king his war would cease, and I, sole heir of Holland, did remain, which made his former fancy more increase. He thinks by match with me my land to gain, and offered to my people rest and peace, if I, Arbante, marry would, his son, which I before refused to have done. And I, as well for hatred I did bear, most just to him and all his generation, by whom my sire and brothers killed were, by whom was spoiled and robbed all our nation, as that to break my promise I did fear, which I by Reno made with protestation, that howsoever fortune's wheel should turn, yet none should marry me till his return, made answer this, that if for every ill I now abide, I should have thousands more, though they my corpse with cruel torments kill, I would not break my promise given before. My countrymen persuade me change this will, first praying me, then threatening me full sore, except I do to yield me and my land, desired prey, into mine enemy's hand. But finding still their threats and prayers vain, and still that in my former mind I stayed, me and my country, by a privy train, unto the king of Friesland they betrayed who, thinking now with flattery me to gain, first bid me not to fear or be dismayed, then offered free to give me lands and life if I would be his son Arbante's wife. Then I, that see myself enforced so, although I meant that death should set me free, yet loath as unrevenged hence to go on those that had so greatly injured me, did muse on many means to help my woe. At last I thought dissembling best to be, Wherefore I feigned that I was relented, and that to have his son I was contented. Among some servants that my father had, two brethren strong and hardy I did choose, most apt to do whatever I them bad, and for my sake no danger to refuse, for each of them was brought up of a lad within our house. I did their service use in war and peace, and found their faiths as great as were their hearts to any hardy feat. To these two men I open made my mind. They promised me their service and their aid. 
one into flanders went a bark to find the other with myself in holland stayed now is our day for marriage assigned when flying news the strangers made afraid with many sails by reno was reported into these parts newly to have resorted for when the first conflict and broil was fought wherein my brother cruelly was slain i straight by letters with by reno wrought to make all speed to succour us from spain but while provision for each thing was sought the friesland king gat all that did remain by reno hearing not what late was past conducts his navy hither in great haste the friesland king that heard of his repair doth leave the marriage for his eldest son and to the sea he goes with navy fair they meet they fight the king of friesland won and to expel all comfort with despair by reno prisoner tain i quite undone abroad by reno captive like was carried at home unto his enemy i was married but when he thought in arms me to embrace and have that due that wives their husbands owe my servant standing in a secret place which i to him did for this purpose show affords him to his sport but little space but with a pole-axe strake him such a blow that staggering straight and making little strife he left his love his living and his life and thus this youth born in unhappy hour came to his death as he deserved well in spite of all his sire Kaimosco's power, whose tyranny all others did excel, whose sword my sire and brothers did devour, and from my native soil did me expel, and meant to enter upon all my lands, while I by marriage should be in their hands. But when we once performed had this deed, and taken things of greatest price away, before that any noise or tumult breed out of the window we devised a way and packing thence with all expedient speed we came to sea before the break of day whereas my servant waited with a barge as he before received of me in charge i know not if kaimosco took more grief or wrath or rancor kindled in his mind to see his son that lay past all relief to find no thing of value left behind then when his pride and glory should be chief then when to make a triumph he assigned and hoping all were at a wedding glad he finds them all as at a burial sad his hate of me and pity of his son torment him night and day with endless grief but sith by tears no good the deed is done and sharp revenge assuageth malice chief from doleful tears to rage he straight doth run and seeks of all his sorrow this relief to get me in his hands with subtle trains then me to kill with torments and with pains those of my friends or servants he could find or that to me did any way retain he all destroyed and left not one behind some hanged some burned and some with torment slain to kill by reno once he had assigned of purpose only to procure my pain but that he thought his life would be a net the sooner me into his hands to get wherefore he set a hard and cruel law except by reno could in twelve months space find means by fraud or forces me to draw to yield myself a prisoner in his place such princes are that have of god no awe then die he should without all hope of grace so that to save his life my death alone must be the means for other can be none all that by pain or cost procure i could with diligence i have already done six castles fair in flanders i have sold the money spent and yet no profit won i sought to bribe those that him kept in hold but they my craft with greater craft did shun i also moved our neighbors near and far english and dutch on him to make sharp war but those i sent when they long time had stayed i think they would not for they could not speed they brought me many words but little aid my store decreased greater grew my need and now the thought whereof makes me afraid that time draws nigh when neither force nor meed as soon as full expired is the year from cruel death can safe preserve my dear for him my father and his sons were slain for him my state and living all is lost for him those little goods that did remain i have consumed to my great care and cost for him with heart's dis-ease and body's pain with troublous waves of fortune i am tossed now last of all i must lay down my life to save my spouse from blow of bloody knife 
and finding that my fortune is so bad, I must, to save his life, lay down mine own. To lease mine own I shall be fain and glad, where sorrow springs of seeds that love had sown. This only fear and doubt doth make me sad, because I know not how it may be known, if I shall sure release by Reno's bands by yielding me into the tyrant's hands. I fear when he hath shut me in his cage, if all the torments I shall then endure his fury to by Reno may assuage, whose liberty I study to procure. I rather fear lest following his rage, when he shall find he hath us both so sure, he will not care his oath and vow to break, upon us both at once his wrath to wreak. Behold the cause for I did long so sore to speak with you, demanding your advice, as I have oft of others done before, yet found I none so hardy nor so wise that would assure his freedom to restore whose love doth me to hate myself entice. The cause, no doubt, is this. They stand in fear of those his guns, whose force no steel can bear. But if your virtue do not disagree with this your comely shape and manly show, let me request you, sir, to go with me, where I myself in prison shall bestow, and promise me to set by Reno free, if so the tyrant from his promise go, for I shall die with great content and joy, if by my death by Reno scape annoy. Her doleful tale the damsel here did end, which oft was interrupted with her tears. Orlando, loving not the time to spend in idle talk, all answers long forbears, but in his mind he fully doth intend to foil her foes and rid her of her fears. He briefly said that she should him command to do much more than she did him demand. He means not, though, that she herself should yield unto the cruel tyrant as a pledge, except his sword, that failed him but sealed, had on the sudden lost his force and edge. He means like common birders in the field, to catch the birds and never hurt the hedge, and thus resolved to do this worthy deed, from Flanders now by sea they go with speed. The skilful pilot doth the vessel steer some time on one, some time on the other side. The isles of Zealand, some before appear and some behind, as fast themselves do hide, and straight to Holland they approached near. Orlando went to land, but bids her by. His meaning is that she shall understand the tyrant's death before she come on land. Himself, forthwith, was mounted on a steed, a dark brown bay with white star in his face, both large and strongly limbed like Flemish breed, but not so full of life nor swift of pace, yet good enough to serve him at his need when as his brilliador was not in place. And thus he came to Dordrecht, where he found with men of arms the gates environed round, the ways, the walls, with armed men watched were, for tyrants still are most of such condition, and chiefly knew, that ere they stand in fear, and further now some news had bred suspicion, how that an army great approached near, well stored with men, and stuffed with munition, the which, they said, by Reno's cousin brought, by force his kinsman freedom to have wrought. Orlando wills a watchman carry word unto their king how that a wandering knight desires to prove his force with spear and sword, whom if the king could overcome in fight, then he should have the lady by a cord that slew Arbante on his wedding night, for he had taken her into protection, and could deliver her to his subjection. But craved, eke the king should bounden be by promise firm, if he were overcome, to set his prisoner, called by Reno, free and of his message this was all the sum, and this was told unto the king. But he that of true virtue never tasted crumb, bent all his will and wit against all reason to falsehood foul, to false deceit and treason. He makes account, if he this night can stay, the which to do he means great means to make, that then the lady quickly get he may, and make him yield her for his safety's sake. He sendeth thirty men a privy way him to enclose about and prisoner take, who, fetching compass to avoid suspicion, at last arrived where they had commission. In this meantime, with words, he foded out the worthy earl, until he saw his men, according as he bade them, come about and closing all the way behind. And then, out of the gates, he rusheth with a rout of men on horse and foot, of three times ten, as hunters do enclose the beasts in woods, or fishers do enclose the fish in floods. So doth the king Kaimosco care and strive to stop the ways, with all foresight and heed, and meaneth sure to have him ta'en alive, 
and thinks the same is such an easy deed that of those guns with which he did deprive so many lives he thinks there is no need for such a weapon serveth very ill where he did mean to take and not to kill as cunning fowlers do the birds reserve that first they take in hope of greater prey and makes them for a bait and stale to serve to take the rest by sport and pretty play so means the king alive him to preserve but unto this orlando's force said nay he means not to be handled in that sort but breaks the nets and marreth all the sport the noble earl with couched spear in hand doth ride whereas he finds the thickest press two three and four that in his way did stand the spear doth pierce nor at the fifth doth cease it passed the sixth the broadness of a hand nor that same hand bread maketh any peace the seventh so great a blow therewith he strake that down he fell and never after spake even as a boy that shoots abroad for sport and finds some frogs that in a ditch have bred doth prick them with an arrow in such sort one after other until such store be dead as that for more his shaft may seem too short from feathers filled already to the head so with his spear orlando him bestirred and that once left he draweth out his sword that sword that never yet was drawn in vain against whose edge doth armour little boot at every thrust or blow he gave was slain a man on horse or else a man on foot the edge whereof with crimson still doth stain and where it lights it pierceth to the root the friesland king repents him now too late that he for haste his guns behind forgate with voice aloud and many boisterous threat he bids them bring his gun but none doth hear who once within the gate his foot can get he dare not once peep out again for fear but when he saw none by his words did set and that almost they all departed were he thought it best to save himself by flight from so great force of this same furious night he back retires and draws the bridge for haste because orlando now approached so nigh and had not then his horse him speeded fast as though he did not run but rather fly orlando would have made him sore aghast who caring not to make the poor sort die passed by the rest and kept the king in chase that saved himself by his good horse's pace but yet ere long again he doth return and brings with him his iron cane and fire wherewith he doth beat down and bruise and burn all those whom he to mischief doth desire he hopes this weapon well shall serve his turn yet for all this he means to come no nigher but like a hunter privily doth watch where he the heedless beast may safest catch the king with this his engine lieth in wait a weapon tearing trees and rending rocks whose force no fence can ward with any slight it gives so sound and unexpected knocks thus having lain a little at recite and watched his vantage like a crafty fox when once the earl within his reach he spied he setteth fire unto his piece's side straight like a lamp of lightning out it flies and sendeth forth withal so great a sound as seemed to shake the everlasting skies and to remove the unremoved ground the shot against which no armour can suffice but breaketh all that in the way is found doth whiz and sing and kindles as it went yet did not that effect the tyrant meant for whether twere his over hasty speed or too great will to hurt did make him swarve or whether fear possessed him in the deed that not to guide his hand his heart could sarve or whether god of mercy near and mead was pleased his champion longer to preserve it only straked the horse with so great pain that down he fell and never rose again the horse and horseman down together fell down lay the horse up quickly rose the knight and on his feet was straight recovered well more earnestly bent than before to fight and as the stories of antaeus tell in whom each fall increased more his might so though orlando with his fall was troubled his force and fury seemed to be doubled but when the king of friesland plainly saw how this bold knight grew fiercer than before he thought it best by flight himself withdraw his fainting heart with fear was pierced so sore aside he turns the horse's foaming jaw now full resolved to prove his force no more 
orlando with such speed doth him pursue as doth an arrow from a bow of yew and what he could not riding erst achieve he doth the same and more upon his feet and runs so swift as few men would believe except themselves had present been to see it until at last so hard he him to drive he overtook him in a narrow street and with his sword he cleft his head in twain the senseless corpse doth on the ground remain now as orlando did this feat contrive there grew new broils from thence a little distance for then by reno's cousin did arrive with men on horse and foot for his assistance and finding none that durst against him strive he entered had the gates without resistance so late a fear was in the people bred that none of them durst come to make a head the silly burghers knew not what to say nor who these were nor what was their desire until the zealanders themselves bewray both by their speech and manner of attire then made they peace and promised them straightway to do whate'er the captain should require against the men of friesland then to aid who yet in prison still by reno stayed for why that people always had in hate the king of friesland and his men of war their duke's late death and altering their estate had moved their minds but that that all did mar was overtaxing them in such a rate as always breeds a great dislike and jar orlando twixt these men made such conclusion as turned unto the friesland men's confusion for straight to ground they threw the prison gate they fetched the prisoners out without a k by reno to the earl is not ungreat with thanks a part of his due debt to pay and then they go to show by reno's state to fair olympia that at anchor lay for so they call the lady chaste and fair that of that country was undoubted heir she that was thither by orlando brought without all hope of any such success who lately silly creature only sought her death might bring her lover from distress now was her safety and by reno's wrought when she supposed and looked for nothing less the joy cannot with many words be told wherewith the ton to t'other did behold the people do the damsel fair restore unto the state that unto her was due but she that vowed herself for evermore to be unto bereno lover true persisting now as faithful as before nor fearing any harm that might ensue doth grant to him for love and mere affection of her and her estate the full protection Bireno leaves his cousin in his place to guide that country with sufficient guard his loving wife in zealand he will place that done with forces march to frieslandward and hopes to conquer it in little space if that his fortune were not over hard and that which most assured him of this thing he had in hold the daughter of their king whom he did mean to marry as men say unto a younger brother of his name orlando shipped himself that present day Bireno with him to his shipping came and offered him a large part of the prey because his valour chiefly won the same who nothing took but that same engine rare which we before to lightning did compare ne took he this away because he meant to prove the force thereof upon his foe or use the same when he to battle went his courage would not suffer him do so to hurl away the same was his intent where it mankind might never damage mo he lets nor powder nor the shot remain nor aught that did unto the same pertain and when that now the shelves and shallow shore some twenty leagues or thereabout was left no land discerned behind nor yet before upon the right hand or upon the left because said he hereafter never more may any knight of life limb bereft by thee or coward vaunt him with the stout lie there alow until i fetch thee out o oh, cursed device found out by some foul fiend and framed below by beelzebub in hell who by thy mean did purpose and intend to ruin all that on the earth do dwell from whence thou camest i thither thee do send this said the peace unto the bottom fell orlando maketh all the speed he may himself unto ibuda to convey i say the noble earl in haste him hide unto that cruel isle to find that wight whom he more loved than all the world beside on whom his thoughts were running day and night 
nor would he by the way one whit abide lest of new stay might new occasion light and cause him when he had his purpose missed to cry with late repentance had i wist his course he means of neither side to bend nor south nor north such haste he means to make but goes as that blind archer doth him send that deep with dart of golden head him strake and here a while to leave him i intend returning to the match of which i spake for you may think i lost it in the carriage if you should hear no more news of the marriage great feasts were made in holland and great sport because of this new match and copulation but greater shall in zealand by report for which there was great care and preparation yet would i not you thither should resort except you knew by reno's inclination for chances fell that spoiled all the cheer as in the book ensuing you shall hear end of book nine The Tenth Book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Ten. The Argument. Wicked by Reno falls in love of new, and in an isle his kind Olympia leaves. Rogero bids Alcina's realm adieu but Logestilla gently him receives. She shows him how to rule the horse that flew. He, flying in the air, from thence perceives Rinaldo's musters, after which he found Angelica unto the rock fast bound. Among the mirrors rare of loyal love that present are or have been in time past, whose faith no force of fortune could remove, with fawning cheer nor yet with frowning blast, Olympia fair, all others far above, by just desert requireth to be placed, whose steadfast love, to say I dare be bold, doth pass the patterns of the new or old. How could she signs more evident impart unto by Reno of her loving mind? No, though she should have open laid her heart, yet could she not have proved herself more kind. And if such love and duty by desert may look of due like love again to find, her faith requires unto by Reno shown that he should seek her safety as his own, nor only not to leave her in annoy, or her reject for any other dame, no, not for her that bred the bane of Troy, but her prefer before all worldly joy, before his senses five, before his fame, or any other thing of greater price to be expressed by word or by device. Now, if by Reno did her well requite, if that he showed to her the like good will, if he regarded as he ought of right to bend unto her liking all his skill, nay, if, forgetting all her merits quite, ungrate, unkind, he sought her life to spill, behold, I shall a tale to you recite, would make a man his lip for anger bite. And when that I shall have declared plain his cruelty, her love's unkind reward, I think you ladies never will again believe men's words, your hearts will wax so hard. For lovers, loved ladies, loves to gain, do promise, vow, and swear without regard, that God doth see and know their falsehood still, and can and shall revenge it at his will. Their oaths but words, their words are all but wind, uttered in haste, and with like haste forgotten, with which their faiths, they do as firmly bind as bundles are trussed up with cords all rotten. Coyness is not, but worse to be too kind. Men care not for the good that soon is gotten. But women of their wits may justly boast that are made wiser by another's cost. Wherefore, I wish you lovely dames beware these beardless youths whose faces shine so neat whose fancies soon like strong fire kindled are and sooner quenched amid their flaming heat the hunter chaseth still the flying hare by hill by dale with labour and with sweat but when at last the wished prey is taken they seek new game the old is quite forsaken even so these youths the while you say them nay in humble sort they seek they sue they serve 
they like, they love, they honor and obey, they wait, they watch, your favor to deserve. Apart they plain, in presence oft they pray, for love of you they mourn, they pine and starve, but having got that earth they sought so sore, they turn their sails into another shore. Though this be true, I not persuade you, though, to leave to love, for that were open wrong, to cause you, like a vine undressed, to grow uncared for the briars and thorns among. But lest on youths you should yourselves bestow that never in one fancy tarry long, the mean is best. Young fruits the stomach gripe, the elder cloy when they are overripe. I showed you in the tale I told you last how that by Reno had Chimosco's daughter to marry, whom a motion late was passed because his brother loved and greatly sought her. But his own mouth was of too liquorish taste to leave so sweet a morsel having caught her. He thought it were a point of foolish kindness to part with all a piece of so rare fineness. A damsel little passed fourteen year, most tender, sweet and lovely, fresh and fair as when the budding rose doth first appear, when sunny beams in May make temperate air. By Reno likes a face so sober cheer, and used to her to make so oft repair, that even as brimstone quickly taketh flame, so love took him to his perpetual shame. The stream of tears that for her sire she shed, a flaming furnace spread within his breast. The plaint she made, and doleful word she said, doth breed his hope of getting his request. Thus foul desires with hopes as foul are fed, as water hot from boiling straight doth rest when liquor cold is poured in the pot. So with new love his old was quite forgot. From flow to ebb thus turned was the tide. His late beloved Olympia loathsome grew, to look on her his heart could scant abide. His thoughts were also settled on the new, Yet still the time might serve, he thinks, to hide his filthy hate with fair and painted hue. And though in fancy he did her detest, yet still great kindness he in show professed. And if he showed the other signs of love, although such love was worse than any hate, yet none there was herein did him reprove, but took his meaning in another rate. They thought some good remorse his mind did move in gracious sort to pity her estate and that to her he charitably meant because she was so young and innocent. O oh, mighty God, how much are men mistain, how oft with feigned shows they are deceived. By Reno's wicked meaning and profane, for good and godly was of men received. The mariners their oars in hand had ta'en, and from the shore the ship was quickly heaved. To Zealand were the duke with all his train, with help of oars and sails doth pass amain. Now had they lost the sight of Holland shore, and marched with gentle gale in comely rank, and, for the wind was westerly, they bore to come within the lieu of Scottish bank, when, as a sudden tempest rose so sore, the force thereof their ships had well nigh sank. Three days they bear it out, the fourth, at night, a barren island happened in their sight. Here fair Olympia from her ship to sand, from sand she passeth to the higher ground, by Reno kindly led her by the hand, although his heart another harbour found. They supped in their pavilion, pitched on land, environed with a tent about them round. The supper done, to bed to go they twain, the rest unto their ships return again. The travel great she lately did endure, and had three days before her waking kept, and being now upon the shore secure, now glad of that for which ere long she wept, and taking her amid his arms, secure, all this did cause that she the sounder slept. Ah, silly soul, when she was least afraid of her false husband thus to be betrayed, the treacherous Pyreno, whom deceit and thought of lewd intent doth waking keep, now having time for which he long did wait, supposing fair Olympia sound asleep, Unto his ships he hies with short retreat, And makes them all launch forth into the deep, And thus with wicked practice and unjust He her forsook that chiefly him did trust. Now were the sails well charged with the wind, And bear him lighter than the wind away. 
the poor olympia now was left behind who never waked till that break of day to lightsomeness had changed the darkness blind and sunny beams had driven the mist away she stretched her arms betwixt her sleep and wake and thinks by reno in her arms to take she findeth none and drawing back again again she reached them out but findeth none her leg likewise she reached out in vain in vain for he for whom she feels is gone fear sleep expels her eyes she opens plain nor yet she hears she sees nor feels not one with which amazed the clothes away she cast and to the shore she runneth in great haste with heart dismayed and seeing her before her fatal hap unto the sea she hies she smote her breast her heart she rent and tore now looking for all lightsome were the skies if aught she could discern but even the shore but even the shore no other thing she spies then once or twice she called by reno's name then once or twice the caves resound the same and boldly then she mounted on the rocks all rough and steep such courage sorrow brought her woeful words might move the stones and stocks but when she saw or at the least she thought she saw the ships her guiltless breast she knocks by signs and cries to bring them back she sought but signs and cries but little now avails the wind bear them away that filled their sails what meanest thou thus poor olympia spake so cruelly without me to depart bend back thy course and cease such speed to make thy vessel of her lading lacks a part it little is the carcass poor to take since that it doth already bear the heart thus having by the shore cried long in vain unto the tent she back returns again and lying groveling on her restless bed moistening the same with water of her eyes sith two on thee did couch last night she said why did not two from thee together rise accursed the womb that false by reno bred accursed the day that first i saw the skies what shall i do what can i hear alone or who woe me can mitigate my moan i see no man nor any sign i see that any man within this isle doth dwell i see no ship that hence may carry me with at the least some hope of being well i here shall starve it cannot other be and buried how to be i cannot tell ah how if wolves that wander in this wood devour my flesh or drink my guiltless blood alas i doubt and stand even now in fear lest that some ravenous wolf that here abides some lion tiger or some ugly bear with teeth and claws shall pierce my tender sides yet what beast could with greater torment tear than thou more fierce than any beast besides for they contented are but once to kill that thou my life a thousand times dost spill but presuppose some vessel here arrive and take me from this place for pity's sake and so perchance i may be left alive the bears nor lions never shall me take yet will it be in vain for me to strive again to holland my repair to make thou keep'st by force the place where i was born whence by deceit thou brought'st me false forsworn thou took'st from me my living by pretence and colour of thy friendship and alliance thy men of arms were paid by my expense i gave thee all such was my fond defiance or shall i turn to flanders sith for thence i sold myself and am at flat defiance with all the nation whom to set thee free i quite forsook that now ah woe is me is there for me in friesland any place where i refused for thee to be a queen the which refusal ruined all my race as by the sequel was too plainly seen o oh, cruel hap o oh, strange and monstrous case the righteous god judge thee and me between was ever tiger carried heart so hard for so firm love to pay so foul reward but what and if some pirate wanting fear of god and man shall take me as a slave thou god forbid let tiger wolf and bear first carry me a prey into their cave and there my flesh in pieces all to tear the dying i my chastity may save this said her raging grief her hands addresses 
to offer force unto her golden tresses. And even as Hecuba fell raging mad with grief of mind and sorrow sore oppressed to see her Polydorus, little lad, by kinsman's fraud and cruelty distressed, so raved Olympia fair as though she had with twenty thousand devils been possessed. At last she sitteth on the rocks alone and seems as senseless as the senseless stone. And in this state I mean to let her stay, till of Rogero I have talked a while, who travelled in the hot and sandy way full many a weary and unpleasant mile. And now it was the middle of the day, when as upon the south side of the isle he saw three ladies near a little tower did sport themselves within a pleasant bower. These ladies fair were of Alcina's crew, and there refreshed themselves a little space. They had great store of wines, both old and new, and sundry kind of junkets in like case. A pretty bark there lay within their view that did attend their pleasures in the place, and wait when any little gale should blow, for now was none, that they might homeward go. Then one of these, that had espied the night, at such a time, and in such way to ride, with courteous speech invites him to alight. The second brings him wine on the other side, and makes him far more thirsty with the sight but these enticements could not cause him bide he fears alcina prisoner so might take him if by this day she hapt to overtake him even a salt peter mixed with brimstone pure inflameth straight when once it feels the fire or as the sea with winds and air obscure doth work and swell and ever riseth higher so they that saw their words could not allure his noble mind to follow their desire took high disdain that they were so contemned, and him of great discourtesy condemned. And straight the third, as in a raging mood, said thus, O creature, void of all gentility, and born, no doubt, of base unworthy blood, and bred where never used was civility, a during life fro thee depart all good, nor mayst thou die in quiet and tranquillity, but burned mayst thou be, or cut in quarters, or driven to hang thyself in thine own garters. With these and many bitter speeches mo they rail on him, and then they take their bark and coast along upon the southern shore, that they his passage and his course might mark. But he that now was gotten far before did little to their threats or curses hark, and notwithstanding all they had contrived, yet to his ship in safety he arrived. The pilot doth Rogero much commend, that from Alcina so himself did save, and as a wise and well-experienced friend, sound counsel and good precepts him he gave, and wished that he his time would better spend, and leave fond toys, embracing wisdom grave, and from the good the evil to discern, as Logistilla used men to learn. There is the food that fills and never cloyeth. There is the love, the beauty, and the grace that maketh him most blessed that them enjoyeth, to which compared all other joys are base. There hope nor fear nor care the mind annoyeth, respect of persons nor regard of place, the mind still finding perfect contentation that rests itself in virtuous contemplation. There are, said he, some better lessons taught than dancings, dallyings, or dainty diet. There shall you learn to frame your mind and thought from will to wit, to temperance from riot. There is the path by which you may be brought into the perfect paradise of quiet. This tale the pilot to Brigero told, and all the while their course they forward hold. But lo, they see a navy under sail of ships that toward them in haste did bend. Alcina, wrathful, striving tooth and nail, doth think to fetch again her fleeting friend. But all her diligence could not avail. Ruggero to return doth not intend, and of her forces he was not afraid, because that Logistilla sent him aid. For straight a watchman, standing in a tower so high that all the hills and shore was under, did ring the larum bell that present hour. He saw her fleet, though distant far asunder, and when that now approached was their power, with cannon shot they made them such a thunder that though Elsina threatened much and braved, yet was Rogero from her malice saved. Then at his first arrival to the shore, four damsels met him sent by Logistilla. Andronica, that wisely sees before, and Phronesis, the just, and chaste Drusilla, 
and she that boldly fights for virtue's lore descending from the roman race camilla and straight rushed out of men a worthy band i pressed to meet their foes on sea and land within a large and very quiet bay a navy was of vessels big and tall that ready at an hour's warning lay to go to fight at any little call and now there was begun a great affray by land and sea the conflict was not small which did the realm in hurly-burly set alcina late did from her sister get tis strange to see of wars the strange success she that of late was counted of such might is now so driven in danger and distress that scant she could preserve herself by flight rogero's parting brought her grief no less than did the foil which both bred such despite and such despair to die she had intended if so she might to have her torments ended and as herself the dame of carthage killed when as the trojan duke did her forsake or as her blood the queen of egypt spilled for that so famous roman captain's sake even so Alcina, with like sorrows filled, wished of herself with like death end to make. But either ancient folk believed a lie, or this is true, a fairy cannot die. But leave we now Alcina in this pain, that from her eldest sister fled apace, and to Vergero let us turn again, that was conducted to a better place where finding now that he did safe remain he thanked god that gave him so much grace to see his foes of forces all deprived himself within the castle safe arrived and such a castle that in stately show and costly substance others all surmounted the value of the walls can no man know except he first upon the same had mounted men have not jewels of such price below for diamonds are to these but dross accounted, and pearls but pelf, and rubies all are rotten, where stones of such rare virtue can be gotten. These walls are built of stones of so great price, all other unto these come far behind. In these men see the virtue and the vice that cleaveth to the inward soul and mind. Who looks in such a glass may grow so wise, as neither flattering praises shall him blind with tickling words nor undeserved blame with forged fault shall work him any shame from hence doth come the everlasting light that may with phoebus beam so clear compare that when the sun is down there is no night with those that of these jewels stored are these gems do teach us to discern aright these gems are wrought with workmanship so rare that hard it were to make true estimation which is more worth the substance or the fashion on arches raised of porphyry passing high so high that to ascend them seemed a pain were gardens fair and pleasant to the eye few found so fair below upon a plain sweet-smelling trees in order standing by with fountains watering them in steed of rain which do the same so naturally nourish as all the year both flowers and fruits do flourish no weeds or fruitless trees are in this place but herbs whose virtues are of highest price as sovereign sage and thrift and herb of grace and time which well bestowed maketh wise and lowly patience proud thoughts to abase and heart's ease that can never grow with vice these are the herbs that in this garden grew whose virtues do their beauties still renew the lady of the castle greatly joyed to see the safe arrival of this knight and all her care and travel she employed that honour might be done him in her sight astolfo in his passage less annoyed doth take in his acquaintance great delight and all the other his good favour sought that by melissa to themselves were brought now having all themselves some days reposed in logestilla's house and taken rest and finding all themselves right well disposed to make return again unto the west the good melissa for them all proposed unto the mighty lady this request that by her leave without incurring blame they might return them all from whence they came to whom dame logestilla thus replied that after they a day or two had stayed she would for them most carefully provide for all their journey furniture and aid and first she taught rogero how to ride the flying horse of whom he was afraid 
to make him pace or pass a full career as readily as other horses here. When all was ready now for him to part, Rogero bids this worthy dame farewell, whom all his lifetime after from his heart he highly honoured and loved well. First I will shew how well he played his part, then of the English duke I mean to tell, how in more time and with far greater pain he did return to Charles his court again. Rogero, mounted on the winged steed which he had learned obedient now to make, doth deem it were a brave and noble deed about the world his voyage home to take. Forthwith beginneth eastward to proceed, and though the thing were much to undertake, yet hope of praise makes men no travel shun to say another day we this have done. And, leaving first the Indian river Tanna, he guides his journey to the great Catay. From thence he passeth unto Mangiana, and came within the sight huge Quinzay, upon the right hand leaving Saracana, and turning from the Scythians away, where Asia from Europe first doth draw Promeria, Russia, Prutina, he saw. His horse, that hath the use of wings and feet, did help with greater haste home to retire, and though with speed to turn he thought it meet, because his bradament did so desire, Yet, having now of travel felt the sweet, most sweet to those to knowledge that aspire, when Germany and Hungary he had passed, he means to visit England at the last, where in a meadow, on a morning fair, fast by the Thames at London he did light, delighted with the water and the air, and that fair city standing in his sight, when straight he saw that soldiers did repair to muster there, and asking of a knight that in the meadow he had met by chance, he understood that they were bound for France. These be the suckers, thus the knight him told, Rinaldo sued for at his coming hither, with Irish men and Scots of courage bold, to join in hearts and hands and purse together. The musters tain, and each man's name enrolled, their only stay is but for wind and weather. But as they pass, I mean to you to show them their names and arms, that you may better know them. You see the standard that so great doth show, that joins the leopard and the fleur de luce? That chiefest is, the rest to come below, and reverence this according to our use. Duke Leonel, Lord General, doth it owe, a famous man in time of war and truce, and nephew dear unto the king my master, who gave to him the dukedom of Lancaster. This banner that stands next unto the king's, with glittering show that shakes the rest among, and bears in azure field three argent wings, to Richard, Earl of Warwick, doth belong. This man the Duke of Gloucester's banner brings, Actaeon's head, except my guess be wrong. The firebrand the Duke of Clarence is, the tree the Duke of York doth claim for his. The lance, into three sundry pieces rent, belongs unto the worthy Duke of Norfolk. The lightning longs unto the Earl of Kent. The griffin longs unto the Earl of Pembroke. The balance, even by which just doom is meant, belongs unto the noble Duke of Suffolk. The dragon to the valiant Earl of Cumberland. The garland is the brave Earls of Northumberland. The Earl of Arundel, a ship half drowned. The Marquis Barclay gives an argent hill. The gallant Earl of Essex hath the hound, the bay tree Darby that doth flourish still, the wheel hath Dorset ever running round, the Earl of March his banner all doth fill with cedar trees, the Duke of Somerset a broken chair doth in his ensign set, the falcon hovering upon her nest the Earl of Devonshire doth in banner bear, and brings a sturdy crew from out the west, the Earl of Oxenford doth give the bear, the banner, all with black and yellow dress, belongs unto the Earl of Winchester. He that the crystal cross in banner hath is sent from the rich bishop of the bath. With archers on horse, with other armed men, are two and forty thousand, more or less. The other footman's number doubles them, or wants thereof but little, as I guess. The banners show their captain's noble stem, a cross, a wreath, an azure bar, a fess. Geoffrey and Ermont, Edward Bold and Harry, under their guide the footmen all do carry. The Duke of Buckingham that first appears, the next to him the Earl of Salisbury, Burgundy next, 
a man well stricken years, and Edward next, the Earl of Shrewsbury. Now turn about, and lo, the Scottish peers, brave men and well appointed you shall see, where Zerbin, son unto the Scottish king, unto the field doth thirty thousand bring, all chosen men from many a shire and town, all ready to resist a sail invade. Their standard is the beast of most renown that in his paw doth hold a glittering blade. This is the heir apparent to the crown. This is the goodly imp whom nature made to show her chiefest workmanship and skill, and after break the mould against her will. The Earl of Oton cometh after him, that in his banner bears the golden bar, the spotted leopard that looks so grim, that is the ensign of the Duke of Mar. Not far from him there cometh Alcabrin, a man of mighty strength and fierce in war, no duke, nor earl, nor marquis, as men say, but of the savages he bears the sway. The duke of Trafford bears in ensign bright the bird whose young ones stare in Phoebus' face. Lucanio, lord of Angus, valiant knight, doth give a bull whom two dogs hold in chase. The duke of Albany gives blue and white, since he obtained fair Ginevra's grace. Earl Bohune in his stately banner bears a vulture, that with claws a dragon tears. Their horsemen are with jacks for most part clad, their horses are both swift and coarse and strong. They run on horseback with a slender gad, and like a spear, but that it is more long. Their people are of war than peace more glad, more apt to offer than to suffer wrong. These are the suckers out of Scotland sent, that with the noble prince Zerbino went. Then come the Irishmen of valiant hearts and active limbs in personages tall. They naked used to go in many parts, but with a mantle yet they cover all. Short swords they used to carry and long darts to fight both near and far, aloof with all. And of these bands the lords and leaders are the noble earls of Ormond and Kildare. Some sixteen thousand men are thereabout, out of the Irish Isle at this time went, beside the other islands thereabout. Sweeverland and Iceland other succors sent to good King Charles, for why they stood in doubt, if he were conquered, they should all repent. And still their numbers daily did increase of those that better like of war than peace. Now while Rogero learns the arms and name of every British lord, behold, a rout of citizens and folk of all sorts came, some with delight and some with dread and doubt, to see a beast so strange, so strong, so tame, and wondering much they compassed him about. They thought it was a strange and monstrous thing to see a horse that had a griffin's wing. Wherefore, to make the people marvel more, and as it were to sport himself and play, he spurred his beast, who straight aloft did soar, and bear his master westward quite away, and straight he was beyond our English shore, and means to pass the Irish seas that day. St. George's Channel in a little while he passed, and after saw the Irish Isle, where men do tell strange tales that long ago St. Patrick built a solitary cave, into the which they that devoutly go, by purging of their sins their souls may save. Now, whether this report be true or no, I not affirm, and yet I not deprave. But crossing from hence to Iceland word, he found Angelica unto the rock fast bound, both naked and bound as this same Isle of Woe, for Isle of Woe it may be justly called, where peerless pieces are abused so by monster vile to be devoured and thralled, where pirates still by land and sea do go assaulting forts that are but weakly walled, and whom they take by flattery or by force, they give a monster quite without remorse. I did declare not many books before, if you the same in memory do keep, how certain pirates took her at a shore, where that chaste hermit lay by her asleep, and how at last, for want of other store, although their hearts did melt and eyes did weep, moved with a helpless and a vain compassion, perforce they bound her on this woeful fashion, and thus the caitiffs left her all forlorn, with nothing but the rocks and seas in sight, as naked as of nature she was born, and void of succor, and all comfort quite. No veil of lawn as then by her was worn, to shade the damask rose and lilies white, whose colors were so mixed in every member, like fragrant both 
in July and December. Rogero at the first had surely thought she was some image made of alabaster, or of white marble curiously wrought, to show the skilful hand of some great master. But, viewing nearer, he was quickly taught she had some parts that were not made of plaster, both that her eyes did shed such woeful tears, and that the wind did wave her golden hairs. To see her bound, to hear her mourn and plain, not only made that he his journey stayed, but caused that he from tears could scant abstain. Both love and pity so his heart assayed. At last, with words to mitigate her pain, thus much to her in loving sort he said, O lady, worthy only of those bands wherewith love binds the hearts and not the hands, and far unfit for these or any such, what wight was found so cruel and unkind to banish all humanity so much those polished ivory hands in chains to bind about that corpse whom none can worthily touch with hurtful hands unworthy bands to wind this said she blushed seeing those parts were spied the which though fair yet nature strives to hide fain would she with her hand have hid her eyes but that her hands were bound into the stone which made her oft to break to woeful cries sole remedy where remedy is not at last with sobbing voice she doth devise to tell the knight the cause of all her moan but from the sea a sudden noise was heard that this her speech and all the matter marred Behold, there now appeared the monster great half underneath and half above the wave, as when a ship with wind and weather beat doth hasten to the haven itself to save, so doth the monster haste in hope to eat the dainty morsel he was wont to have, which sight so sore the damsel did appall, Rogero could not comfort her at all. Yet with his spear in hand, though not in rest, the ugly orc upon the brow he strake. I call him orc, because I know no beast nor fish from whence comparison to take. His head and teeth were like a boar, the rest a mass of which I know not what to make. He gave him on the brow a mighty knock, but pierced no more than if it were a rock, and finding that his blow so small hurt brings, he turns again on fresh him to essay. The orc that saw the shadow of great wings upon the water up and down to play, with fury great and rage away he flings, and on the shore doth leave the certain prey. The shadow vain he up and down doth chase, the while Rogero layeth on him apace. Even as an eagle that espies from high among the herbs a party-coloured snake, or on a bank sunning herself to lie to cast the elder skin anew to make, lies hovering warily till she may spy a vantage sure the venomed worm to take then takes him by the back and beats her wings moger the poison of his forked stings so doth rogero both with sword and spear the cruel monster warily assail not where he fenced is with grisly hair so hard as that no weapon could prevail but sometime pricks him near unto his ear, sometimes his sides, sometimes his ugly tail. But nature had with such strong fences armed him, as all his blows but small or nothing harmed him. So have I seen ere this a silly fly, with mastiff dog in summer's heat to play, sometime to sting him in his nose or eye, sometime about his grisly jaws to stay, and buzzing round about his ears to fly, he snaps in vain, for still she whips away, and oft so long she dallies in this sort, till one snap comes and marreth all her sport. But now Rogero doth this slight devise, sith that by force he cannot make him yield, he means to dazzle both the monster's eyes by hidden force of his enchanted shield, and being thus resolved to land he flies and from all harm the lady fair to shield he puts the precious ring upon her hand whose virtue was enchantments to withstand that ring that worthy bradamant him sent when she from false brunello had it ta'en with which melissa into india went and wrought his freedom and alcina's bane 
that ring he lends the damsel with intent to save her eyes by virtue of the same then takes he forth the shield whose light so dazed the lookers-on they fell down all amazed the monster now approaching to the shore amazed at this resistance none did make rogero hews upon him more and more but his hard scales no harm thereby did take oh sir said she unloosen me before out of this maze the monster to awake and let your sword slay me this present hour so as this monster may not me devour these woeful words moved so rogero's mind that straight he did unloose the lady fair and caused her by and by to get behind upon his horse then mounting in the air he leaves his spanish journey first assigned and unto little britain doth repair uh, but by the way be sure he did not miss to give her many a sweet and friendly kiss and having found a solitary place a pleasant grove well watered with a spring which never heard nor herdsman did deface where philomela used still to sing here he alights minding to stay a space and hither he the lady fair did bring but sure it seemed he made his full account ere long upon a better beast to mount his armor made him yet a while to bide which forced stay a more desire did breed but now in him it was most truly tried oft times the greater haste the worst speed he knits with haste two knots while one untied but soft tis best no further to proceed i now cut off abruptly here my rhyme and keep my tale unto another time end of book ten The Eleventh Book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Eleven. The Argument. Angelica doth hide herself away by virtue of the ring Rogero lent her. Rogero sees a giant bear away his spouse half dead and greatly doth lament her. Orlando at the Isle of Woe doth stay, where many women meet but hard adventure. Here he the monster killed, Olympia freed, to marry whom Oberto soon agreed. The gallant courser in his full career is made by man to stop with slender rein, but man himself, his lust and fond desire, is seldom drawn by reason to refrain. Tis hard to stop but harder to retire when youthful course ensueth pleasure vain as bears do break the hives and weak defences when smell of honey cometh to their senses no marvel if rogero could not hold but that he would now take a little sport that naked did angelica behold within a grove alone from all resort his love to bradamant now waxeth cold or at the least is tempered in such sort he means therewith at this time to dispense and not to let this go a maiden hence whose beauty was so rare as well it might have made xenocrates an epicure no marvel then if this same gentle knight could not so great temptation well endure but while he hastened to his hope delight of which he thought him in possession sure there fell a strange and unexpected thing by means angelica did know the ring this was the ring that she had with her brought to france the very first time she was there what time by aid thereof so well she wrought she hold her brother to the enchanted spear by virtue of this ring she set at naught those magic arts that men so greatly fear with this orlando county paladine she did release from wicked dragontine by help of this invisible she went out of the tower where atlant had her set for this same ring brunello false was sent by agramant who longed the same to get to tell that story is not my intent for fear it might my other matter let but certain tis that when this ring was lost in fortune's waves she had been ever tossed now when she saw this ring was on her hand she was so struck with marvel and with joy that scarce she could discern and understand if she were wake or if she dreamed some toy 
but to make trial how the case doth stand, and know if she this treasure doth enjoy, into her mouth the ring she doth convey, and straight invisible she goeth away. Rogero, that each minute thought an hour, his armor off and ready for the play, expecting now the damsel in a bower where he had pointed her for him to stay, found all too late that by the ring's strange power she had unseen conveyed herself away. He lent it her to save her eyes from blindness, and for reward she quits him with unkindness. With which her act displeased and ill appaid, he cursed himself and chafed in his mind, O oh, cruel and unthankful wench, he said, is this the love that I deserve to find? Dost thou reward him thus that brought the aid? To thy preserver art thou so unkind? Take ring and shield and flying horse and me, this only, bar me not thy face to see. This said, he goeth about where she had been, still groping, as the weather had been dark, embracing of the air his arms between and steed of her. Then heedful he doth hark to find her by the sound that was not seen, and whence the same doth come he well doth mark. But on went she until it was her lot to come into a silly shepherd's cot, and though this same were far from any town, yet there she quickly did herself provide of meat and drink and of a simple gown sufficient for the time her bear to hide not suiting for a lady of renown that had been ever clad in pomp and pride had gowns of crimson purple and carnation of every colour and of every fashion but yet no kind of weed so base or ill is her of her princely beauty to bereave they that so much extol fair amaryllis or gality do but themselves deceive. Cease, Titterus, to praise thy golden Phyllis. Peace, Melaby, this passes by your leave. Ye soldiers all that serve in Cupid's garrison may not presume with this to make comparison. Now here the damsel fair a palfrey hired, with other things most needful for her way, and means to her own home to have retired from whence she had been absent many a day the while rogero now with travel tired lamenting he had lost so fair a prey doth seek his horse who had not long been idle but in his master's absence break his bridle which when he found the reins and pieces torn the horse soared far away with mighty wing how could such haps with patientness be borne of one great loss to find another spring he sitteth in a dump like one forlorn for loss of her his horse and of his ring whose virtue great did make him much repented but yet much more her virtue that had sent it and in this rage he puts his armor on and on his shoulder carrieth his shield pursuing that first path he lights upon he found it brought him to a goodly field on side whereof when he a while had gone it seemed the wood adjoined some sound did yield and still the near and nearer that he goes the plainer sound he heard of sturdy blows a combat twixt a giant and a knight he sees hard by most furiously begun the giant with a club doth think by might the battle of the t'other to have won the t'other with his sword and nimble fight his furious blows with watchful eye doth shun rogero seeing this great inequality yet standeth still and shows no partiality but in his mind he wished the knight to win when lo the giant with new fury fed to lay on load with both hands doth begin and with one blow he lays him down for dead and straight in cruel sort he steppeth in for to disarm him and cut off his head but when the giant had the face disarmed rogero knew the party he had harmed he saw it was his bradamant most dear whom this same giant would have made to die wherefore with courage stout he steppeth near the giant to new combat to defy who either hears him not or would not hear or meaneth not a conflict new to try but took her up and on his shoulders laid her and so in haste away from thence conveyed her so have i seen a wolf to bear away a lamb from shepherd's fold so have i seen an eagle on a silly dove to prey and soar aloft the sky and earth between rogero hies him after as he may until he came unto a goodly green but thother every step so much outstepped him that in his view rogero scantly kept him 
but now a while if him i speak no more and to orlando i return again who having lost the sight of holland shore did hasten to a buddha with much pain i did declare not many books before how he kemosko's engine strange did gain and to the bottom of the sea did throw it that none might find it out again or know it and though his meaning and intent was so yet vain it was as after was perceived for why that serpent vile our ancient foe that eva first in paradise deceived not much above two hundred years ago as we from our forefathers have received from out the sea by necromancy brought it and then in almany afresh they wrought it they wrought it both in iron and in brass the cunning and the art increasing still as oft by proof we find it comes to pass the worse the work the greater grows the skill and to each kind a name assigned there was according to the first inventor's will to tell the names of all were but a trouble some demi-cannons some are called a double the culverings to shoot a bullet far the falcon sacker minion and the sling not armed men but walled towns to mar such devilish force is in this hellish thing ye soldiers brave and valiant men of war now cease to field your manly darts to bring and get a hargebush upon your shoulder or else in vain you sue to be a soldier how didst thou find o filthy foul invention a harbour safe in any human heart thou makest a coward get the soldier's pension and soldiers brave thou robst of due desert whole millions have been slain as stories mention since first devised was this wicked art france italy and england chief may rue it since first they used this art and first they knew it the english bowmen may go burn their bows and break their shafts and cut in two the string that weapon now may keep the corn from crows that did the french at agincourt so sting but to that white i wish a world of woes that did to light device so devilish bring let him be given into the hands of satan to be tormented a with core and dathan now good orlando though he greatly strived with speed to get him to the isle of woe yet first the irish king was there arrived by chance or else that god would have it so because it might the better be contrived on wrongful whites his judgments just to show but when ebuda once in sight appeared orlando all the company straight cheered and putting off his arms of colour sable he bids the master out to launch his boat and in the same an anchor strong and cable with which he means unto this isle to float not doubting if luck serve he will be able to put the anchor in the monster's throat and thus alone the noble knight doth venter into the isle ibuda then to enter now was the time when as aurora fair began to show the world her golden head and look abroad to take the cool fresh air tithono lying still in jealous bed when as orlando hither did repair with two blind guides cupid and fortune led when lo unto the shore his shipboat turning he seemed to hear a noise as one were mourning at which strange sound casting his eye aside he might discern a goodly damsel naked with arms abroad unto the rocks fast tied that what with cold and what with terror shaked eftsoons the hideous monster he espied whose sight might well have made stout hearts have quaked orlando's mind therewith is not amated nor his high courage any whit abated he gets between the monster and his prey that prey that he so hotly doth pursue and for before he was resolved what way he would attempt the monster to subdue upon his shoulder doth the anchor lay and when he came within his ugly view even mogor all his malice might and rancor into his open jaws he bears the anchor as they that dig in mine of coal or stone the same in sundry places under prop lest it should fall when least they think thereon and so their breath or else their passage stop so is this anchor fastened in the bone both in the bottom of his mouth and top that though he would again he could not close it nor wider open it for to unloose it now having gauged his hideous chap so sure that out and in he can with safety go he enters 
with his sword the place obscure, and there bestoweth many a thrust and blow, and as that city cannot be secure that hath within her walls received her foe, no safer could this orc be now from danger that in his entrails hath received a stranger. But griped now with pangs of inward pain, sometime he plungeth up unto the sky, sometime he diveth to the deep again, and makes the troubled sands to mount on high. Orlando feels the sea come in amain, that forced him at last his swimming dry. He swims to shore with body strong and able, and bears upon his neck the anchor's cable. And as a savage bull that unaware about his horns hath now a cord fast bound, doth strive in vain to break the hunter's snare, and skips and leaps and flings and runneth round, so, though Orlando with his strength so rare essayed to draw him nearer to the ground, yet doth he fetch an hundred frisks and more, ere he could draw him up upon the shore. His wounded bowels shed such store of blood, they call that sea the Red Sea to this hour. Sometime he breathed with a sudden flood, and made the clearest weather seem to lower. The hideous noise filled every cave and wood, so that God Proteus, doubting his own power, fled straight for thence, himself in corners hiding, not daring longer here to make abiding. And all the gods that dwell in surging waves, with this same tumult, grew in such a fear, they hid themselves in rocks and hollow caves, lest that Orlando should have found them there. Neptune, with triple mace, by flight him saves, his chariot drawn with dolphins doth him bear. Nor yet behind Glaucus or Triton tarried, for fear in these new broils to have miscarried. Those islanders that all this while attended, and saw the monster drawn to land and tain, with superstition moved much, condemned this godly work, for wicked and profane, as though that Proteus would be new offended, that had before, and now might work their bane. They doubt he would, thus fools their good hapt consters, send to their land his flock of ugly monsters. And therefore, Proteus' anger to appease, they mean to drown Orlando if they can, whose deed they deem his godhead did displease. And even as fire doth creep from bran to bran, until the pile of wood it wholly sees, so doth this fury grow from man to man, that they concluded all upon the matter to throw Orlando bound into the water. One takes a sling, another takes a bow, this with a sword is armed, he with a spear, and some afore and some behind him go, some near approach, some stand aloof for fear. He museth much what his ungrateful foe should mean, for benefits such mind to bear, and inwardly he was displeased and sorry to find such wrong where he deserved glory. As little curs that bark at greatest bear, yet cannot cause him once his way to shun, no more doth he these cur-like creatures fear than like a sort of madmen on him run. And, for they saw he did no armor wear, they thought the feat would have been easily done. They knew not that his skin, from head to foot, was such to strike on it it was no boot. But... When that he his Duradena drew, he laid therewith about him in such sort that straight their faintness and his force they knew. They found to fight with him it was no sport, thrice ten of them at blows but ten he slew. Their fellows fled that saw them cut so short, which foes thus foiled, Orlando now intended, to unloose the lady whom he had defended. But now this while, behold, the Irish band arrived near unto their chiefest city, who had no sooner set their foot on land, but that forthwith they put apart all pity, and slew all sorts that came into their hand, the fierce, the faint, the foolish, and the witty. Thus, were it just doom, or were it cruel rage, they spared of neither sex nor neither age. Thus the isle of woe is made a woeful isle, and for the people's sake they plague the place. Orlando sets the lady free the while that there was bound in that unseemly case to have been given unto the monster vile, and viewing well he called to mind her face, and that it should Olympia be he guessed, but twas Olympia that had thus been dressed. Distressed Olympia, thus unkindly served, 
whom love and fortune made a double scorn for first of him of whom she best deserved she was forsaken quite and left forlorn and next by pirates taken and reserved of monster vile to be in pieces torn and in this case the good orlando found her and then with great compassion he unbound her and thus he said now tell what strange annoy or evil hap hath hurt thy happy reign whom late i left in solace and in joy why do i find in danger and in pain how is the bliss that thou didst then enjoy so changed and turned to misery again and she in woeful manner thus replied when shame her cheeks with crimson first had dyed i know not if my chance or else my choice if fortune or my folly be in blame shall i lament or shall i now rejoice that live in woe and should have died in shame and as she spake the tears did stop her voice but when again unto herself she came she told him all the woeful story weeping how false by reno had betrayed her sleeping and how from that same isle where he betrayed her a crew of cursed pirates did her take and to this wicked island had conveyed her for that same foul and ugly monster's sake where now it was orlando's hap to aid her she walked naked when these words she spake look how diana painted is in tables among the rest of ovid's pleasant fables of whose sharp doom the poet there doth tell how she with horns actaeon did invest because he saw her naked at the well so stands olympia fair with face and breast and sides and thighs to be discerned well and legs and feet but yet she hides the rest and as they two were talking thus together oberto king of irish isle came thither who being moved at the strange report that one alone the monster should assail and gag him with an anchor in such sort to make his strength and life and all to fail then draw him to the shore a ship to port is towed with ropes without or oars or sail this made him go to find orlando out the while his soldiers spoil it all about now when the king this worthy knight did see though all with blood and water foul disdained yet straight he guessed it should orlando be for in his youth in france he had remained and knew the lords and knights of best degree in charles's court a page of honour trained their old acquaintance caused at this new meeting they had a loving and a friendly greeting and then orlando told the irish king how and by whom olympia was abused by one whom out of danger great to bring she had no pain nor death itself refused how he himself was witness of the thing while they thus talk oberto her perused whose sorrows past renewed with present fears did fill her lovely eyes with watery tears such colour had her face as when the sun doth shine on watery cloud in pleasant spring and even as when the summer is begun the nightingales in boughs do sit and sing so that blind god whose force can no man shun sits in her eyes and thence his darts doth fling and bathes his wings in her clear crystal streams and sunneth them in her rare beauty's beams in these he heats his golden-headed dart in those he cooleth it and tempered so he levels thence at good oberto's heart and to the head he draweth it in his bow thus is he wounded deep and feels no smart his armour cannot fend so fierce a blow for while on her fair eyes and limbs he gaped the arrow came that could not be escaped and sure olympia's beauties were so rare as might well move a man the same to note her hair her eyes her cheeks most amorous are her nose her mouth her shoulders and her throat as for her other parts that then were bare which she was wont to cover with her coat were made in such a mould as might have moved the chaste hippolytus her to have loved a man would think them framed by phidias arts their colour and proportion good was such and unto them her shamefastness imparts a greater grace to that before was much i cease to praise those other secret parts as not so fit to talk of as to touch in general all was as white as milk as smooth as ivory and as soft as silk 
Had she in valley of idea been, When pastor Paris hap did so befall To be a judge three goddesses between, She should have got, and they forgone the ball. Had she but once of them been naked seen, For Helena he had not cared at all, Nor broke the bonds of sacred hospitality That bred his country wars and great mortality. Had she but then been in Crotana town, When Zeuxis, for the goddess Juno's sake, To paint a picture of most rare renown, Did many of the fairest damsels make To stand before him bare from foot to crown, A pattern of their perfect parts to take, No doubt he would have all the rest refused, And her alone, instead of all, have chosen. I doubtless deem by Reno, Never viewed her naked corpse, For certain if he had, he could not so all human sense exclude To leave her thus alone in state so bad. But briefly all this matter to conclude, It seemed Oberto would have been full glad In this her woe, her misery and need, To comfort her by either word or deed. And straight he promised that he would attend her, And set her in her country if he may, And moger all her enemies defend her, And take revenge on him did her betray and that he might both men and money lend her, he would to pawn his realm of Ireland lay, nor till she were restored ask no repayment, and straight he sought about to get her raiment. They need not travel far to find a gown, for why immediately they found good store by sending to the next adjoining town, the which his men of war had spoiled before, where many a worthy lady of renown that had been naked tied unto the shore, and many a tender virgin and unsoiled were of their raiment and their lives despoiled. And yet, for all they were so richly gowned, Oberto could not clothe her as he would. No, not in Florence, though it doth abound with rich embroideries of pearl and gold, could any piece of precious stuff be found of worth to serve to keep her from the cold, whose shape was so exact in every part even hard to match by nature or by art. Orlando with this love was well content, as one that hither came with other end, for sith he missed Angelica, he meant his journey back to France again to bend. With them by ship to Ireland first he went, as in his way, and with the king his friend, not hearing had his love been here or no, for all were dead that could have told him so. At both their suits he scant stayed there one day, His passing love such passions in him bred. But ere he went he doth Oberto pray To do for her as much as he had said, And parting so from thence he took his way, Even as his fortune and his fancy led. But good Oberto need not be desired To do as much or more than he required. For few days passed, but that with her he went to Holland, where he raised such commotion that straight by Reno taken was and shent, receiving on three trees a just promotion. And all those countries did forthwith consent to swear them faith and be at their devotion. Thus, of a countess, she is made a prince, and lives in joy and solace ever since. Orlando bends his course to British shore, whence he not long before to ship did mount, where he had left his famous Brilliador, a goodly courser, and of good account. No doubt of valiant acts he did good store, though what they were I cannot here recount, for such a mind he carried still unto them, he cared not to tell them, but to do them. But in what fashion he did pass the rest of that unfortunate and fatal year, I say by me it cannot be expressed, because thereof no record doth appear. But when the spring did ground with green invest, and sun in Gemini made weather clear, then did he acts both worthy of reciting, and to be kept in everlasting writing. From hills to dales, from woods to pastures wide, from waters fresh unto the salt sea shore, to seek his love he up and down doth ride, the less he finds, he seeketh still the more. At last he heard a voice for help that cried. He draws his sword and spurs his brilliador. But to refresh the reader now, tis reason, and stay my story to a better season. End of Book Eleven. The Twelfth Book of Orlando Furioso. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Thomas Copeland. Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Translated by Sir John Harrington. Book Twelve. The Argument Orlando doth pursue with great disdain one that did seem his love by force to carry. Rogero, led by such another train, with him doth in the charmed palace tarry. Orlando, parting from the place again, he sees indeed her whom he fain would marry, fights with Farah, and foils two Turkish bands, and finds fair Isabel in outlaw's hands. Fair Ceres, when she hastened back again from great Idea homeward to return, there where Enceladus with endless pain doth bear Mount Etna that doth ever burn, when she had sought her daughter long in vain, whose loss so strange did make the mother mourn, she spoils for spite her breast, cheeks, eyes, and hair. At last two boughs from pine tree she doth tear. In Vulcan's forge she sets on fire the brands, and gives them power for ever to be light. And taking one apiece in both her hands, and drawn in coach by yoked serpent's might, she searcheth woods and fields and seas and lands, and brooks and streams and dens devoid of light. And hearing here on earth no news to like her, at last she went to hell itself to seek her. Were good Orlando's power to be compared as well with Ceres as his loving mind? he would no pain no place nor time have spared his dear beloved angelica to find to go to rocks and caves he would have dared and place to saints and place to fiends assigned he only wanted one of ceres wagons in which she carried was with flying dragons how he did search all france before i told now Italy to search is his intent, and Germany and Castile new and old, and then to Africa to pass he meant, and as he thus determined, behold, he heard a voice that seemed to lament, and drawing nigh to understand what tiding, on a great horse he saw a horseman riding. Her force he bare upon his saddle bow, a lady sorrowful and sore afraid, that cried aloud, still making open show of inward grief, and thus to him she said, O oh, worthy wight, lord of Anglante, no, I die, I die, without you bring me aid. And then he thought, coming more nigh to view her, it was Angelica, and that he knew her. I say not that it was, but that it seemed to be Angelica, that thus was carried. But he, that justly great disgrace it deemed thus in his sight to have his mistress harried, whose love above all treasures he esteemed, to take revenge hereof he nothing tarried, but put his spurs to Brilliador's sides, and in great haste to that same horseman rides. With many bloody words and cruel threats he bids that horseman to come back again. But he at naught his words and speeches sets, rejoicing in so rich a gotten gain. The villain still ground of Orlando gets, until they came into a fair large plain, wherein a house of great estate was built, the gate hereof in gorgeous sort was gilt. The building all of marble fair was wrought, most costly carved and cunningly contrived. To this fair house his prey the foul thief brought. Straight after him Orlando there arrived, then he alights, and all about he sought for him that had him of his joy deprived. He maketh search in chambers all about, and galleries, and halls to find them out. Each room he finds set forth with rich array, with beds of silk and gold of curious art. But yet he finds not that desired prey, the want whereof did sore torment his heart. There might he find with like affliction stray Gradasso, Sacrapent, and Brandemart, and fierce Farah possessed with strange confusion, procured in that place by strong illusion. They all complain in anger and in rage how of this house the master them hath used. One lost his horse, another lost his page, another doubts his mistress is abused. Thus are they kept like birds within a cage, and stand with sense and wits and words confused. And many with this strange deception carried, within this place both weeks and months had tarried. Orlando, when he saw he could not learn where this same thief his mistress had conveyed, thought she was carried out at some postern, wherefore within no longer time he stayed, but walks about the castle to discern if that were true of which he was afraid. But as he walked up and down the plain, he thought he heard her call him back again, 
and to a window casting up his eye he thought he saw her face full of divinity and that he heard her plainly thus to cry o noble wight of proved magnanimity help now o never help alas shall i in mine orlando's sight lease my virginity kill me or let a thousand deaths befall me rather than let a villain so to thrall me these woeful speeches once or twice repeated caused him return into the house again and searching once again he chafed and fretted hope still assuaging somewhat of his pain and oft he heard the voice that counterfeited the speech of his angelica most plain from side to side he followed still the sound but of angelica no sign he found now while orlando tarried in this trance in hope for to avenge his mistress harms rogero who i told you had this chance to see his bradamant in giant's arms drawn to this place with such another dance namely by force of some unusual charms saw first the giant in this castle enter and after him he boldly doth adventure but when he came within the castle walls and made much narrow search as in such case in garrets towers in parlors and in halls and under stairs and many a homely place oft casting doubts what hurt his love befalls or lest the thief were gone in this mean space forthwith he walketh out into the plain and hears a voice recall him back again that voice that lately did orlando make return in hope angelica to find rogero now for bradamant doth take whose love no less possessed his careful mind and when the voice unto gradasso spake or sacripant or brandemart most kind to every one of these it plainly seemed to be the voice whom each one best esteemed atlanta had procured this strange invention thereby to keep rogero from mischance because he saw it was the heaven's intention that he by treason should be killed in france ferrat and those of whom i last made mention with all whom value highest did advance to keep him company he here detained with good provision while they here remained and while these knights with strange enchantments bound do here abide behold the indian queen angelica that late her ring had found whose virtue can her cause to go unseen and also frustrate magic skill profound now longing home where long she had not been and being of needful things provided yet wants she one that her might home have guided orlando's company she would have had or sacripant she cared not which of twain not that of either's love she would be glad for them and all the world she did disdain but for the way was dangerous and bad in time of war to travel france and spain she wished for her own safety and her ease to have the company of one of these wherefore while she travels up and down to seek for them that long in vain had sought her and passing many woods and many a town unto this place at last good fortune brought her where when she saw these knights of great renown thus seek for her, she scant abstains from laughter to see Atlanta's cunning and dissembling, her person and her voice so right resembling. Herself unseen sees them and all the rest. Now means she sure to take one of them too, but yet she knows not which. Her doubtful breast did stay as unresolved what to do. Orlando's valor could defend her best, but then this doubt is added thereunto, that when she once so highly had preferred him, she shall not know again how to discard him. But sacripant, although she should him lift high up to heaven, yet maketh she no doubt, but she will find some slight and pretty shift with her accustomed coyness, him to lout. To him she goes, resolved of this drift, and straight the precious ring she taketh out from of her mouth, which made her go concealed, with mind to him alone to be revealed but straight came in orlando and ferrar that both desired her to have enjoyed thus all of them at once their goddess saw not being now by magic art annoyed for when the ring on finger she did draw she made unwares all their enchantments void these three were all in complete armor save ferrar no headpiece had nor none would have the cause was this he solemnly had sworn upon his head no helmet should be set but that that was by stout orlando worn which he did erst from trajan's brother get ferrar 
to where a helmet had forborne since with the ghost of argyll he had met thus in this sort they came together armed by virtue of her ring now all uncharmed all three at once do now the damsel view all three at once on her would straight have seized all three her faithful lovers were she knew yet with all three at once she is displeased and from all three she straight herself withdrew who haply one at once would her have pleased from henceforth none of them she thinks to need but that the ring shall serve in all their steed she hastens hence and will no longer stay disdain and fear together make her swift into a wood she leads them all the way but when she saw there was none other shift into her mouth the ring she doth convey that ever holp her at the deadest lift and out of all their sights forthwith she vanished and leaves them all with wonder half astonished only one path there was and that not wide in this they followed her with no small haste but she first caused her horse to step aside and standeth still a while till they were past and then at better leisure she doth ride a far more easy pace and not so fast until they three continuing still the riding came to a way in sundry parts dividing and coming where they found no further track for all that was before the other two in choler and in fury great turned back and asked the other what they meant to do and as his manner was to brag and crack demanded how they durst presume to woe or follow her whose property he claimed except they would of him be slain or maimed orlando straight replied thou foolish beast save that i see thou dost an helmet want i would ere this have taught thee at the least hereafter with thy betters not to vaunt for all doth thank him for his care in jest and said it showed his wits were very scant for as he was he would not be afraid to prove against them both that he had said sir said orlando to the pagan king lend him your headpiece and ere we go hence i will this beast in better order bring or sharply punish him for this offence nay soft said sacrament that were a thing the which to grant might show i had no sense lend you him yours for i'll not go to school to know as well as you to bob a fool tush quoth fra fools to your faces both as though if i had been disposed to wear one i would have suffered were you lief or loath the best and proudest of your both to bear one the truth is this that i by solemn oath upon a certain chance did once forswear one that on my head no helmet should be done until i had orlando's helmet won what quoth the earl then seems it unto thee thy force so much orlando's doth surmount that thou couldst do the same to him that he unto almonta did in aspermount rather i think if thou his face should see thou wouldst so far be wide of thine account that thou wouldst tremble over all thy body and yield thyself and armor like a noddy the spanish vaunter like to all the nation said he had often with orlando met and had him at advantage in such fashion that had he list he might his helmet get but thus quoth he the time brings alteration that now i seek i then at naught did set to take his helmet from him then i spared because as then for it i little cared then straight orlando moved in rightful anger made answer thus thou fool and murrin liar i cannot now forbear thee any longer i am whom thou to find dost so desire when met we two that thou didst part the stronger thou thought'st me farther thou shalt feel me nigher try now if thou beest able me to foil or i can thee of all thine armor spoil nor do i seek to take this odds of thee this said forthwith his helmet he untied and hung the same fast by upon a tree then drew his duradana from his side and in like sort you might the spaniard see that was no whit abated of his pride how he his sword and target straight prepared and laid most manfully unto his ward and thus these champions do the fight begin upon their coursers fierce themselves more fierce and where the armor joins and is most thin there still they strive with sturdy strokes to pierce 
search all the world and two such men therein could not be found for as old books rehearse their skins were such as had they been unarmed yet could they not with weapons have been harmed ferrah had in his youth enchantment such that but his navel hard was all the rest unto orlando there was done as much by prayer of some saint as may be guessed save in his feet which he let no man touch take it for truth or take it for a jest thus have i found it wrote that they indeed wear armor more for show than any need thus twixt them two the fight continues still yet not so sharp in substance as in show ferrah employing all his art and skill sharp thrusts upon the t'other to bestow orlando that hath ever strength at will layeth on the spaniard many a lusty blow angelica doth stand fast by unseen and sees alone the battle then between for why the pagan prince was gone the while to find her out when they together fought and by their strife that he might both beguile he hopes and had conceived in his thought he rides away and travels many a mile and still his dear beloved mistress sought and thus it came to pass that she that day was only present at so great a fray which when she saw continue in such sort nor yet could guess by aught that she did see which was most like to cut the other short she takes away the helmet from the tree and thinks by this to make herself some sport or they by this might sooner sundered be not meaning in such sort a way to set it but that the worthy earl again may get it and with the same away from hence she goes the while they too with pain and travel tired in giving and in taking deadly blows for all that missed the headpiece first retired and for he did most certainly suppose that sacrapent had taken it undesired good lord said he what mean we here to do this other knight hath cousined us two and unawares the helmet tain away orlando hearing this doth look aside and missing it he doth believe straightway as did ferrah and after him they ride they came at last unto a parted way that in two parts itself doth there divide fresh track in both of them was to be seen this of the knight that of the indian queen orlando's hap was to pursue the knight ferrah that was more lucky of the twain happened upon angelica to light who to refresh her former taken pain fast by a fountain did before alight and seeing suddenly the knight of spain straight like a shadow from his sight she passed and on the ground the helmet left with haste but as the sight of her did make him glad in hope by this good fortune her to get so thus again to lose her made him sad and showed that she did him at nothing set then cursed he as he had been raging mad blaspheming trivagant and mahomet and all the gods adored in turk's profession the grief in him did make so deep impression yet when he had orlando's helmet spied and knew it was by letters writ thereon the same for which trojano's brother died he takes it quickly up and puts it on and then in haste he after her doth ride that was out of his sight so strangely gone he takes the helmet thinking little shame although he came not truly by the same but seeing she away from him was fled nor where she was he knew not nor could guess himself from hence to paris ward he sped his hope to find her waxing less and less and yet the sorrow that her loss had bred was part assuaged the helmet to possess though afterward when as orlando knew it he sware great oaths that he would make him rue it but how orlando did again it get and how ferrah was plagued for that crime and how they two between two bridges met whereas ferrah was killed at that time and my purpose is not to declare as yet but to another story turn my rhyme now i must tell you of that indian queen by virtue of her ring that goeth unseen who parted thence all sad and discontented that by her means ferrah his will had got that she with this unlooked-for hap prevented left him the helmet though she meant it not and in her heart her act she sore repented and with herself she said alas god wot i silly fool took it with good intention thereby to break their strife and sharp contention not that thereby this filthy spaniard might by help of my deceit and doing wrong keep that by fraud he could not win by might 
alas to thy true love and service long a better recompense than this of right from me my good orlando should belong and thus in this most kind and doleful fashion she doth continue long her lamentation now meaneth she to travel to the east unto her native soil and country ground her journey doth her other griefs digest, her ring doth in her journey keep her sound. Yet chanced she, ere she forsook the west, to travel near a wood, whereas she found a fine young man between two dead men lying, with wound in bleeding breast, even then a-dying. But here a while I cease of her to treat, or sacrapent, or of the knight of Spain. First I must tell of many a hardy feat before I can return to them again. Orlando's actions I will now repeat that still endured such travel and such pain, nor time itself that sorrows doth appease could grant to this his grief an end or ease. And first the noble earl a headpiece bought, by late ill fortune having lost his own, for temper or the strength he never sought, so it did keep him but from being known. Now Phoebus' chariot had the daylight brought, and hid the stars that late before were shown, and fair Aurora was now risen, when Orlando met two bands of armed men. One band was led by worthy Manilard, a man, though stout, yet hoary-haired for age, who with his men did make to Paris word, he not for war, but fit for counsel sage. Alcirdo of the other had the guard, then in the prime and chief flower of his age, and one that passed all the Turkish warriors to fight at tilt, at tourney, or at barriers. These men, with other of the pagan host, had lain the winter past not far for thence, when Agrament did see his men were lost by vain assaults, unto his great expense, and therefore now he swears and maketh boast that he will never raise his siege for thence, till they within, that now had left the field, were forced by famine all their goods to yield. And for that cause, now summer comes again, he gets together all the men he may, with new supplies of Africa and of Spain, and some of France that did accept his pay. But that in order due they may remain, he points them all to meet him in one day, who by commandment hither came in clusters, to make appearance at the pointed musters. Now, when Alcirdo saw Orlando there, and flamed with pride and glory of his mind, he longed straight with him to break a spear, and spurs his horse, but quickly he doth find himself too weak so sturdy blows to bear, and wisheth now that he had stayed behind. He falleth from the horse's back down dead, the fearful horse without his master fled. Straight there was raised a mighty cry and shout by all the soldiers of Alcirdo's band, when, as they see their captain, late so stout, thrown down and killed by Orlando's hand. Then out of ray they compassed him about, on every side in number as the sand. They that are nigh with blows do him assail, and those aloof throw darts as thick as hail. Look what a noise and herd of savage swine do make, when as the wolf a pig hath caught, that doth in all their hearings cry and whine. They flock about as nature hath them taught, so do these soldiers murmur and repine to see their captain thus to mischief brought, and with great fury they do set upon him, all with one voice still crying on him, on him. I say, the nearer fight with sword and spear, and those aloof send shafts and many a dart, but he, that never yet admitted fear, to lodge in any harbor of his heart, upon his shield a thousand darts doth bear, and thousand more on every other part, yet of them all makes no more care nor keep than doth a lion of a flock of sheep. For when at once his fatal blade he drew, that blade so often bathed in pagan's blood, no steel there was of temper old or new, nor folded cloths the edge thereof withstood. About the field heads, legs, arms, shoulders flew, the froze all did flow with crimson blood. Death goeth about the field rejoicing mickle, to see a sword that so surpassed his sickle. This made the pagan rout so sore aghast, he that could swiftest run was best paid, and as they came, so fled they now as fast. One brother for another never stayed, no memory of love or friendship past could make one stay to give another aid. He that could gallop fastest was most glad, not asking if the ways were good or bad.
only one man there was in all the field that had so long in virtue school been bred that rather than to turn his back or yield he meaneth there to leave his carcass dead old manilard who taking up his shield even as his valiant heart and courage led sets spurs to horse and in his rest a lance and runs against the paladin of france Upon Orlando's shield his spear he brake, Who never stirred for all the manly blow, But with his naked sword again he strake, And made him tumble o'er the saddle-bow. Fortune on virtue did some pity take, For why Orlando's sword fell flattening though, That though it quite amazed and overthrew him, Yet by good hap it maimed him not, nor slew him. With great confusion all the other fled, and now of armed men the field was void save such as were or seemed to be dead so as orlando now no more annoyed went on his journey as his fancy led to seek her in whose sight he only joyed through plains and woods through sandy ways and miry he travels making still of her inquiry until it was his fortune toward night to come fast by a mountain, in whose side forth of a cave he saw a glimpse of light, and towards it he presently doth ride. Then at the mouth thereof he doth alight, and to a bush fast by his horse he tied. He doubts, as ever love is full of fear, that his beloved Angelica was there. Even as the hunters that desirous are some present pastime to their hounds to see, in stubble fields do seek the fearful hare, by every bush and under every tree, so he, with like desire and greater care, seeks her that soul of sorrow can him free. He enters boldly in the hollow cave, and thinks of her some tidings there to have. The entrance straight and narrow was to pass, descending steps into a place profound, whereas a certain fair young lady was kept by some outlaw's prisoner underground. Her beauty did the common sort surpass, so far as scant her match was to be found, so as that dark and solitary den might seem to be a paradise as then. On her an aged woman there did wait, the which, as oft with women doth befall, about some matter of but little weight did happen at that time to chide and brawl, but when they saw a stranger coming, straight they held their pieces, and were quiet all. Orlando doth salute them with good grace, and they do bid him welcome to the place. Then, after common words of salutation, although at first of him they were afraid, yet straight he entered in examination by whom in that same cave they had been stayed, and who they were in so unseemly fashion that kept a comely and a noble maid. He said he saw it written in her face, her nurture and her lineage were not base. She told him straight how long she there had been, and by what hap she had been thither brought. Amid her words, the sighs do pass between the coral and the pearl by nature wrought. Sweet tears upon her tender cheeks were seen that came from fountain of her bitter thought. But soft, lest I should do the reader wrong, I end this book that else would be too long. End of Book Twelve The Thirteenth Book of Orlando Furioso This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto Translated by Sir John Harrington Book Thirteen The Argument Orlando hears Zerbino's love to tell her strange misfortune and her hard adventure. These outlaws that in that vast cave did well, Orlando hanged, that had in prison pent her. Bradamant, though Melissa did her tell Atlanta's frauds, yet doth his palace enter, where she is stayed by force of Atlant's charms, while Agramant musters his men of arms. Full venturous were the noble knights of old, and worthy that their fame should a endure, that durst with valiant heart and courage bold find out in dens and places all obscure such as in courts we now but sealed behold fair dames of beauty mind and manners pure as erst i told you how orlando found a brave young lady hidden underground now in my former matter to proceed 
I say, when he had viewed her person well, and marked her face and haviour with great heed, he doth request the damsel fair to tell who was the author of so foul a deed to force her in so unfit place to dwell. And she, as plain and briefly as she can, in this sweet sort her woeful speech began. Most worthy knight, she said, although I know that I shall buy my speech to you full dear, for sure I am this woman here will show my words to him that first did place me here. Truth I will tell, though truth increase my woe, and make him look on me with angry cheer. Despair hath ever danger well contemned. What should she fear that is even now condemned? I am that Isabel that sometime was a daughter dear unto the king of Spain. Well did I say I was, for now, alas, I am the child of anguish and of pain. Love, only love, this great change brought to pass. Love, only love, of thee I may complain that flattering always in thy first beginnings yieldst certain loss instead of hoped winnings then in good state i spent my happy days noble and young honest and rich and fair now base despised poor and wanting praise drowned in a dungeon of most deep despair thus love throws down whom fortune high doth raise and mars the sport in which he is a player he that in art of love did show his skill, saith love and majesty agrees but ill. But that I plainly may declare my mind, thus it fell out. My father, twelve months since, to make her famous triumph had assigned, unto the which came many a lord and prince. Now, whether liking did mine eyes so blind, or that his virtue did itself convince, Zerbin methought the king of Scotland's son in this same triumph honour chief had won. The passing feats of arms I saw him do, in which he was compared with the best, his person and his beauty joined thereto, in which he far surpassed all the rest, did cause that he no sooner did me woo, but as I quickly granted his request. Interpreters nor other means none wanted to make the seeds to grow that love had planted. When as these feasts and solemn shows were ended, my Zerbin back again to Scotland hasted, wherewith how grievously i was offended well may you guess if ever love you tasted but he that cannot be too much commended whose love to me no less in absence lasted with purpose and with promise firm to marry me studied all means away from hence to carry me twere vain he thought to ask me of my sire zerbin a christian i a sarazine our country law contraried that desire to which our loves so wholly did incline this feat doth some new stratagem require more heedful secret circumspect and fine when love hath knit two hearts in perfect unity they seldom fail to find their opportunity an house of great estate in bion town my father had with gardens sweet and fair in which with large descents still going down into a river comes the garden stair here if ill fortune on us do not frown he means when i shall walk to take the air soon to surprise me walking in an alley and so convey me to his armoured galley but sith with him the case did then so stand not to be present at this enterprise he sent me letters written with his hand by oderic of biscay stout and wise expert in service both of sea and land and wills me do as he should me advise whose faith he nothing doubteth to be sound as one to him by benefits much bound this firm and fast and sure obliged friend of proved courage value and of skill against the time appointed either send and i that for their coming looked still against the time appointed did descend to give him scope to work his master's will and he accordingly came unespied with armed men unto the garden side i seeing them myself most fearful fain they seeing me soon of their purpose sped those that resistance made forthwith were slain and some afraid and faint like cowards fled the rest with me as prisoners to remain then straight we were unto the galley led and gone so far we could not be recovered before my father had the fact discovered of this departure i myself was glad in hope ere long my zerbin to have found but lo a sudden tempest made us sad and near to rochelle almost had us drowned the master of the ship no cunning had to keep the keel from striking on the ground 
it booted not against the waves to strive, upon sharp rocks the tempest doth us drive. In vain it was to pull down all our sails, and on the foreboard close to couch the mast, no pain against the raging sea prevails, on land we look each minute to be cast. Divine help oft doth come when human fails, and when in reason all relief is past, for doubtless I do deem by power divine we were preserved in this dangerous time. The biskin that the danger well doth note doth mean a desperate remedy to try. He straightway launcheth out a little boat, he and two more go down therein and I. This done, he cuts the rope and lets her float, threatening with naked sword that he should die that durst presume to give so bold adventure against our wills into the boat to enter. The rope now cut, away the boat was carried, by force of waves unto the shallow shore, and by great fortune none of us miscarried. So great a plunge I never scaped before, but they, poor souls, that in the galley tarried, were drowned, the vessel quite in pieces tore, where, though my loss of stuff and jewels grieved me, my hope to see my zerbin still relieved me. Now being come to land in luckless hour, and trusting only Oderick's direction, love, that doth ever love to show his power in tempering and distempering our affection, my good to ill, my sweet doth turn to sour, my hope to hurt, my health into infection. He in whose trust Zerbin so much relieth, freezeth in faith, and in new fancy frieth. Now whether first at sea this humour grew, or else he moved was with new occasion to have me here alone with so small crew, as from his will I could not make evasion, he bids all faith and honesty adieu, and yields himself unto this foul persuasion, and that he may his pleasure surely warrant, he sends the servants of a sleeveless errant. Two men there were, that had so lucky lot with us into the ship-boat to descend, one hight Almonio, by birth a Scot, a valiant man, and Zerbin's trusty friend. Odric tells him that it beseemed not so few upon a prince's to attend, and that the daughter of the king of Spain should go on foot, and with so small a train. Wherefore he wisheth him to go before to Rochelle, there a palfrey to provide and hire some men, a dozen or a score, me to my lodging mannerly to guide. Almonio went. Then there was left no more but Coreb, one of wit and courage tried, in whom the biskin put the more affiance, because that he was one of his alliance. Yet long he seemed in doubtful mind to hover, fain if he could he would have rid him thence. At last he thinks so fast a friend and lover will with his friend's iniquity dispense. Wherefore he doth to him his mind discover, in hope that he would further his offence, and do as friends in our days have a fashion advance their pleasure more than reputation. But he, whose honest mind could not suppose that Odric had had so little grace, the fact not only threatens to disclose, but calls him false and traitor to his face. From bitter words unto more bitter blows they came and fought together in this place, and I, in this prospect no whit delighting, fled to the wood while they two were fighting. Between them two the combat was not long, but lo, the worser cause the better sped. Whether he were more skilful or more strong, Odric doth lay Corebo there for dead. That done, he runs the woods and fern among, and follows fast the way that I had fled. I think that he God Cupid's wings did borrow, he made such haste to hasten on my sorrow. Fear made me swift, for I was sore afraid. Love made him swifter run to overtake me. Then sore against my will my course he stayed, then sundrily both foul and fair he spake me. Sometime he promised, sometime he prayed, sometime he threatened he by force would make me. With suit, with gifts, with threats, he oft did prove me. With suit, with gifts, with threats, he not did move me. But when he could not with his words prevail, he doth resolve no farther time to stay. With open force he then did me assail, as doth a hungry bear seize on his prey, and I defended me with tooth and nail and cries and shrieks and all the ways I may, nor was I in mine own defence afeard to scratch his eyes and pull away his beard. I know not if it were my screech and cry that might have well been heard a league and more, 
or if it were their use that dwell thereby to come to seek some shipwrecks on the shore but straight upon the hill we might descry come toward us of company good store which makes my bisky man a way to run and to surcease his enterprise begun thus this unlooked-for crew preserved me then and hindered him of his unjust desire but i was saved as is the flounder when he leapeth from the dish into the fire for though these barbarous and savage men to touch my person did not once aspire no virtuous thought did breed this moderation but hope of gain and greedy inclination the leader of this miserable band did think his market will be raised much in selling me when men shall understand he sells a maid whom none did ever touch and now i hear a merchant is in hand of him to buy me if his luck be such from whom into the east i shall be sent where to the soldan they will me present and in this sort her woeful tale she told and mingled sighs with tears in rueful fashion expressed with such doleful words as would have moved a stony heart to take compassion it eased in part her mind thus to unfold the bitter cause of her unpleasant passion now while orlando to this tale attended the crew of caitiffs to the cave descended a barbarous and foul misshapen crew armed one with a spit one with a prong mouths eyes and face most ugly were to view one had no nose another's was too long but when their leader somewhat nearer drew and saw orlando standing there among turning to his companion he said lo here a bird for whom no net we laid then to the earl he said i am right glad to find one so well armed in my cave for long for such an armor longed i have and surely now this i suppose to have how think you when my person shall be clad with this your coat shall i not then be brave wherefore good sir think not your welcome scant that comes so fitly to supply my want orlando turning with a sour smile answered his armor was a price too high and that he greatly did himself beguile that thought of him his armor there to buy and as they nearer came he stooped the while and took a brand that in the fire did lie and straight he threw it at the caitiff's head and laid him there along the floor for dead a short thick plank stood on a scrubby post that served them for a board to drink and eat this like a quoit at them orlando tossed and for the same full heavy was and great it fell down there among them to their cost they never saw before so strange a feat by which scarce one of them escaped harm in head in leg in breast in side or arm so shall you see a countryman that takes in time of spring a brick-bat or a stone and throws the same upon a knot of snakes that lie together clustered all in one how great a spoil the stone among them makes and those that scape how quickly they be gone so did orlando with these peasants play that glad they were that scaped to run away those that could scape the heavy tables fall unto their feet commended their defence which were as turpin writes but seven in all which seven were glad to run away from thence but yet their flying brought them help but small orlando means to punish their offence their feet nor yet their fence could them so guard but that he brought them to the hanging ward now when the foresaid aged woman saw in how bad sort these friends of hers were served she was afeard for well she knew by law that no less punishment she had deserved forthwith from thence she stale away for awe and up and down the desert wood she swarved until at last a warrior stout her met but who it was i may not tell as yet the tender damsel doth orlando pray her chastity and honour to protect who made her go with him and from that day had unto her a fatherly respect now as they went a prisoner by the way they saw whose name i may not now detect now should i speak a bradament by right whom erst i left in such a doleful plight the valorous lady looking long in vain when her rogero would to her return lay in marsilia to the pagan's pain where every day she did them some shrewd turn for some of them in provence did remain and languedoc where they did spoil and burn till with her value she did them rebuke supplying place of captain and of duke 
Now on a day, as she sat still and mused, the time of his appointment long expired, doubting lest she by him might be abused, or that her company he not desired, and often whom she blamed she straight excused. Thus, while with careful thought herself she tired, Melissa, whom she thought not to be near her, came suddenly of purpose for to cheer her. With pleasant countenance Melissa Sage, much like to those that carry welcome news, wills her her causeless sorrow to assuage, and good Rogero's absence doth excuse, swearing that she durst lay her life to gauge, he would not absent be if he might choose, and that he did now in his promise halt, was not by his, but by another's fault. Wherefore, quoth she, get you to horseback straight, if you would set your faithful lover free, and I myself intend on you to wait, till you his prison with your eye shall see, whereas Atlanta with a strange deceit detaineth men of base and high degree, and shows by strange illusion distressed each one the party whom he loveth best. Each one doth deem he sees in great distress his love, his friend, his fellow, or his page, according as men's reason more or less are weak or strong such passion to assuage. Thus do they follow this their foolish guess, until they come like birds into a cage, searching the palace with a pensive heart, the great desire not suffering them to part. Now then, said she, when you shall once draw nigh, where this same necromancer strange doth dwell, he will your coming and the cause descry, and to delude you, mark me what I tell, he straight will offer there unto your eye, by help of some inhabitants of hell, Rogero's person all in woeful plight, as though he had been conquered in fight. And if you follow, thinking him to aid, then will he stay you as he doth the rest. But kill him, therefore, and be not afraid, for so you shall your friend deliver best. So shall your foe Atlanta be betrayed in his own trap, when as he looketh lest, and fear not when he cometh by to strike him, though he your dear resemble and look like him. I know full well how hard twill be to try, and how your heart will fail and hand will tremble when you shall go about to make one die that shall Rogero's shape so right resemble. But in this case you may not trust your eye, but all your sprites and forces all assemble, for this assure you, if you let him go, you work your own and your Rogero's woe. The proverb saith, one that is warned is armed the which old saw doth prove by due construction that they that after warning had are harmed did ill regard or follow good instruction. Now Bradamant rides to the place so charmed, and vowed that old magician's destruction, and that they may the tedious way beguile, they spend the time in pleasant talk the while. And oft Melissa doth to her repeat the names of those that should be her posterity, that should in force and deeds of arms be great but greater in religion and sincerity, achieving many a strange and worthy feat, and use both head and hand with great dexterity, in ruling just and bountiful in giving, Caesars in fight, and saints in godly living. Now when Melissa Sage such things did show, the noble lady modestly replied, Sith God, quoth she, doth give you skill to know the things that shall in future times betide, and means on me unworthy to bestow, an issue such as few shall have beside. Tell me, among so many men of name, shall there no woman be of worthy fame? Yes, many a one, said she, both chaste and wise, mothers to such as bear imperial crowns pillars and stays of royal families, owners of realms, of countries, and of towns. Out of thy blessed offspring must arise such as shall be even in their sober gowns for chastity and modesty as glorious as shall their husbands be in war victorious. Nor can I well, or do I now, intend to take upon me all their names to tell, for then my speech would never have an end I find so many that deserve so well. Only I mean a word or two to spend of one or two that do the rest excel. Had you but talked hereof in Merlin's cave, you should have seen the shapes that they shall have. 
Shall I begin with her whose virtue rare shall with her husband live in happy strife, whether his valiant actions may compare, or be preferred before her honest life? He fights abroad against King Charles at tear. She stayed at home a chaste and sober wife, Penelope in spending chaste her days, as worthy as Ulysses was of praise. Then next Dame Beatrice, the wife sometime of Lodwick's Force, surnamed Eke the Moor, wise and discreet, and known without all crime, of fortune's gifts and virtues having store. Her husband lived most happy all her time, and in such state as few have lived before, but after fell from being Duke of Milan, to be a captive fettered like a villain. To pass the famous house I should be sorry of Aragon, and that most worthy queen, whose match in neither Greek nor Latin story, or any writer else hath ever been, and full to perfect her most worthy glory, three worthy children shall of her be seen, of whom the heavens have pointed her the mother, Isbel by name, Alfonso, and his brother. As silver is to tin, as gold to brass, as roses are to flowers and herbs more base, as diamonds and rubies are to glass, as cedars are to sallows, in like case shall famous Leonora others pass in virtue, beauty, modesty, and grace. But above all, in this she shall excel, in bringing up her children passing well. For as the vessel ever bears a taste of that same juice wherewith it first was filled, or as in fruitful ground the seed grows fast that first is sown when as the same is tilled, so look what lore in youthful years is placed by that they grow the worse or better willed when as they come to manly age and stature, sith education is another nature. Then next her niece, a fair and famous dame that hight Renata, I may not forget, daughter to lose the twelfth king of that name, whom of the Britain duchess he did get, whose virtue great shall merit lasting fame, while fire shall be warm and water wet, while wind shall blow and earth stand firm and sound, and heavenly spheres shall run their courses round. I pass all those that pass all these some deal whose souls aspiring to an higher praise, despising pomp and ease and worldly weal, in sacred right shall spend their blessed days, whose hearts and holy love and godly zeal to heavenly joys from earthly thoughts shall raise, that to good works, to prayer and pure divinity shall consecrate their lives and their virginity. Thus doth Melissa unto her discourse of those should come hereafter of her seed, and while they talk it oft by intercourse, they in their journey onward do proceed. And oftentimes Melissa hath recourse to will her of Atlanta take great heed, and lest she should with faint and foolish kindness be led unwares in error and in blindness. Now when they near approached to the place, then Bradamant departed from her guide, and after she had rode a little space, she saw one brought with hands together tied exceeding like Rogero in the face, in voice, in stature, hair, and all beside, bound fast with chains between two giants led, that threatened him ere long he should be dead. But when the damsel saw within her view the lamentable state and hard condition of him whose face she certain thought she knew, she changeth straight her trust into suspicion, doubting Melissa, of some malice new or hidden hate, had given her such commission to make Rogero for a greater spite be slain by her in whom he doth delight. Is not this he, thus to herself she spake, whom still mine heart and now mine eyes do see? If, my Rogero, I can so mistake, I never shall have knowledge which is he. I either dream, and am not now awake, or else no doubt it can no other be. Melissa? What? May not Melissa lie? Shall I believe her tale, and not mine eye? Now, while that thus she thought, and thus she said, and in this unwise thought did thus persever, she thought she heard him speak and ask for aid, saying, My love, assist me now or never. What, shall I in thy sight be so betrayed? Dost thou forsake me? Then farewell for ever. These unkind words her heart so greatly daunted, she follows him 
into the house enchanted. No sooner was she entered in the gate but that the common error her possessed. Wandering about the house betimes and late, nor night nor day she taketh any rest. The strange enchantment brought her in that state that, though she saw the man that loved her best, and spake with him and met him every hour, to know the tongue the t'other had no power. But let not now the reader be displeased, although I leave her in this charmed place. I mean ere long her travel shall be eased, and she shall see and know Rogero's face. Even as the taste with diverse meats is pleased, so think I by this story in like case the friendly reader shall be less annoyed, if with one matter long he be not cloyed. With sundry threads a man had need to weave to make so large a web as I intend. Wherefore all other matters I must leave of agrament a little time to spend, who sorely at the flower de luce did heave, and all his might to mar the same did bend, sending for men to Africa and to Spain, those to supply that in the field were slain. Thus all on war his heart was wholly fixed, his new supplies with sundry captains led, were come with men of sundry nations mixed, with whom, that no disorder may be bred, a day for views and musters was prefixed, that every one might know his guide and head. Then fell they to their mustering and their viewing, as shall be showed you in the book ensuing. End of Book Thirteen The Fourteenth Book of Orlando Furioso This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto Translated by Sir John Harrington Book Fourteen The Argument Agrament, mustering of his men, doth miss two bands that by Orlando late were slain. Mandricard vows to be revenged of this, but by the way he haps to entertain Dame Doralis, whose beauty was his bliss. An angel brings Rinaldo and his train unseen there where the pagan did encamp, and sendeth discord to the Turkish camp. Among the fierce assaults and cruel blows that France hath felt from Africa and from Spain, in which so many men fed wolves and crows that were on both sides in the battle slain, although the French were foiled by their foes, that long they came not to the field again, yet was this foil sore to the pagans' cost, for diverse lords and princes that they lost. So bloody was the victory they gate, that scant this joy did countervail that woe. And if we may compare things done of late renowned Alphonse to things done long ago, Ravenna's fall by fortune or by fate, in which your virtue great did flourish so to win that field so bloody and so hard, with this of theirs, may justly be compared. For when the soldiers of the Spanish band, whom then the Pope retained in his pay, had almost got the victory in hand, the Frenchman, ready now to run away, thou camest to succor with that noble band of valiant youths that merited that day the honor of the gilded spur and hilt in recompense of blood so bravely spilt. So didst thou bruise the acorns rich of gold, so didst thou break the yellow staff and red, so didst thou then the flower de luce uphold, when as the captain was in battle dead. For which the laurel crown they wear of old by just desert belongeth to thy head, and civil crown no less in honor precious for saving unto Rome her own Fabricius. Colonna, named a column true indeed, unto the state of Rome and Roman name, whom you by value took and saved by meed, by which more honor true and worthy fame unto yourself you did procure and breed, than in the overcoming all that came from Aragon, from Castile and Navarre, for all their spears and new devised car. Now, though we all our lives and safeties owe to you that this great conquest did achieve, yet our side did receive so great a blow, as scarce that joy the sorrow did relieve, and that the dames of France most plainly show whom this so bloody triumph still doth grieve. Witness their widows in their mourning gowns, and watery eyes in villages and towns. 
King Louis of France had need in time prepare for captains new to these unruly bands that wickedly, without all fear or care, of laws of God, of nature, or of lands, no sort, nor sex, nor age, nor order spare from force of their unchaste and bloody hands. Christ's body in the sacrament they tear it to bear away the silver plate that bear it. Wretched Ravenna, better had it been that thou the French shouldst not at all resist. Thou mightst by Bresci have been warned, I ween. Now thou a warning art for such as list to shun like loss by thy mishaps foreseen, not stubbornly in folly to persist. So Rimini and Fiennes were preserved by marking in what sort thou hadst been served. As now King Lou's, I say, had need to send new captains to supply their rooms were dead, so then the pagan princes did intend to see their men from sundry countries led, and all disorders and defects to mend, to point them captains that do lack a head. First then Marsilio all his soldiers vieweth, and agrament next after him ensueth. The chief of those are of Marsilio's train, are first the Catalans, men of great land, and of the best and noblest blood of Spain. The next that do to them in order stand are of Navarre, whose king was lately slain at Bertels by Rinaldo's valiant hand. Marsilio sore laments the sorry case, and pointeth Isolier, supply his place. Bulligant governeth those of Lyon. Grandonius, full lol garbies, doth provide. Marsilio's brother, called Falziran, doth those of lesser castle rule and guide. Those of Malaga do attend upon Madrasso. So doth civil all beside. There, whereas Betis water so abounds, and all about it makes them fruitful grounds. Tessira, Barracond, and Stordalan unto the field do bring their forces in. Granado this, Majoric he hath ta'en. The first to rule in Lisbon doth begin, where Larban late was brought unto his bane, to Syra, unto Larban next of kin. Those of Galicia serpentine doth guide, since valiant Maricold in battle died. Those of Toledo and of Calatrave, whom Synagon did lead not long ago, now Matalus to their government must have, because that he was slain by Christian foe. Then Pisardin, a man in battle brave, with all the band of Salamance doth go, with many other soldiers of Pagenza, of Avila, Zamora, and Palenza. Those of the court, and of Marsilio's train, with those of Saragos, Ferrar doth guide, the chiefest flower, and the chief host of Spain, well armed, well horsed, well furnished beside. Morgant and Mausites did there abide, and in the state of private men remained, and were by him most friendly entertained. The name of many a duke and lord and knight for brevity I purpose to omit, such as were stout and hardy men in fight, such as were wise and politic in wit, with the Earl of Sagant, Archident at height, Langiron, Amarant, and Malagit. There was great Fulleron, Marsilio's bastard, that in that fight did show himself no dastard. After the Spanish host was viewed and passed before King Agrament, the next that came was one that all the rest in stature passed, the governor and king of great Orain. Then came a band whose leader, small time past, at Bertel's field was brought into his bane, lamenting that the king of Garamant was conquered by the lady Bradamant. Then came the third, and that a headless crew, whose captain, Argus, was in battle slain. To this the second and the fourth, a new King Agrament doth leaders fresh ordain. But few there were that for these rooms did sue, so few sufficient men there did remain. Buraldo and Argonio for the best, and Ormeda he chose among the rest. Then came Brunello with a cheerless face, and look for shame still fixed on the ground, for late he fell in Agrament's disgrace, 
who doubted that his faith had not been sound ere since he went into the enchanted place where to a tree dame bradamant him bound because he lost his ring whose loss so grieved him that though he told him true he not believed him but isolir the brother of farrah that was the first that found him and untied him avouched to agrament the thing he saw how that by force some enemy had tied him so as the king his anger did withdraw although he never after well could bide him but swore the next offence that he committed an halter should unto his neck be fitted with those of esbury came soridano and doraban did come with those of set with those of nazomani prusiano king agricult ammonios charged did get malabofers came with them of fisano the rest doth finadur in order set Balastro, those that followed erst tardoco those of canaria and of morocco from molga and arcilla others came the first their former captain still doth hold unto the next the king anew doth name one coroneus a trusty man and bold then balaves a man of evil fame clorindo next of whom great deeds are told sobrino next a man of elder age in all the camp was none more wise and sage those of getulia came with rimadont with maribaldo those of bolga went and those of cosca came with balnefront their former lord his life in battle spent then came the king of algier rodomont that lately into turkey had been sent to bring some new supplies of horse and men and back again was new returned as then in all the camp was not a man more stout in all the camp was not a man more strong nor one of whom the french stood more in doubt was there the turkish army all among in agreements nor in marsilio's rout nor all the followers did to them belong beside he was which made them dread him chief the greatest enemy to our belief then puliano came a gallant king and agramante's cousin dardanel whether some owl did at their window sing or other luckless bird i cannot tell as oft we see it is an usual thing that some presage one's mischief shall foretell but sure it was prefixed in heaven on high what time and hour next day they both should die now all their bands were mustered saving two those of norisha and of tremesen king agramant doth marvel what they do he knows not where to hear of them nor when now as he was dispatching hereunto some messenger behold one of the men that served the king of tremesen in haste came and discovered all that had been passed sir king quoth he by fortune and ill chance the noble kings alzird and manilard happened to meet a cruel knight of france while with their bands they travelled hitherward he overthrew them both o oh, hard mischance and killed and spoiled and drave away their guard and sure quoth he i think his force is such to all your camp he would have done as much among the rest that to this tale gave ear there was a prince that late from afric came to whom king agramant great love did bear and mandricardo was the prince's name his heart was stout and far from any fear his body strong and able to the same and that which greatest glory did him yield he had in sorry conquered hector's shield now that the messenger his tale had done which made the hearers hearts for sorrow cold this valiant prince king agricanus son straight was resolved with heart and courage bold that to win praise no pain did ever shun although his purpose secret he did hold to be revenged on this bloody knight that had so many slain and put to flight he asked the messenger what clothes he wear and in what colored garments he was clad black quoth the messenger his raiments are no plume nor bravery his helmet had and true it was orlando's inward care that made his heart so sorrowful and sad caused that his armor and his open shoes had like resemblance of his inward woes marsilio had before a day or twain given unto mandricard a gallant steed his color bay but black his tail and mane 
Of Friesland was the dame that did him breed, The sire was a villain brave of Spain. On this brave beast this brave man mounts with speed, Swearing he will not to the camp turn back Till he had found the champion all in black. He meets the silly people in the way, Halting or maimed or weeping for their friends. Their woeful looks their fearful hearts bewray, Weeping in such a loss but small amends. But when he came where the dead bodies lay, In viewing of their wounds, some time he spends, As witnesses of his strong hand that gave them, him he envies, and pities them that have them. Even as a wolf by pinching famine led, That in the field a carrion beast doth find, On which before the dogs and ravens have fed, And nothing left but horns and bones behind, Stands still and gazeth on the carcass dead. So at this sight the pagan prince repined, And curseth oft, and calls himself a beast, For coming tardy to so rich a feast. But when the morning night not here he found, From thence he travelled many a weary mile, Until he found a meadow compassed round With running streams that almost made an isle, Save one small entrance left of solid ground, Which guarded was with armed men that while, Of whom the pagan asketh why they stand To guard the place with weapons in their hand. Their captain, viewing well his brave attire, to think he was a man of great regard, And said King Stordelano did them hire Into these parts his daughter dear to guard, Espoused to King of Sarza by her sire, Who shortly for the marriage prepared. And here, quoth he, we do this passage keep, That none may trouble her while she doth sleep. Tomorrow to the camp we mind to go, Where she unto her father shall be brought, who means on Rodomont her to bestow, By whom this noble match is greatly sought. Now when the captain had him answered so, This prince that setteth all the world at naught, Why then, quoth he, this maid belike is fair, I pray thee cause her hither to repair, My haste is great, but were it greater far, Yet would I stay to see a pretty maid. Alas, you miss your mark, your aim doth are, gentle sir fool, to him the captain said. Thus first they gan with bitter words to jar, And then from blows but little time they stayed, For straight the prince did set its spear in rest, And smote therewith the captain through the breast, And straightways he recovered his spear, And at the next that came therewith doth run, For why none other weapon he did wear, Since he the Trojan Hector's armor won. At what time he most solemnly did swear To win the sword worn by Trojano's son, Called Duridan, a blade of temper rare, That Hector erst, and now Orlando bare. Great was the force of this Tartarian knight, That with his spear and weapon, None beside durst with so many join together fight. Yet sets he spurs to horse, and stoutly cried, Where is a man that dare withstand my might? Who dares forbid me where I list to ride? And with that spear himself he so bestirred That small prevailed against him bill or sword. But when his spear in pieces burst he saw, The truncheon huge he takes in both his hands. His blows were such, not blood, but life to draw. All dead or fled, not one his force withstands. As Ebrew Samson with the ass's jaw did heap on heaps the proud Philistine bands, so Mandricard smote oft with so great force, as one stroke killed both horseman and his horse. Now, though they took this thing in high disdain, to be thus conquered with a broken stick, yet when they learned had unto their pain, it was in vain against the wall to kick, Though unrevenged lie their fellows slain, They leave the dead rather than loose the quick. But he so eager was to kill and slay, That scant he suffered one to escape away. And as the reeds in marishes and lakes, Dried with the sun, or stubble in the field, When as by hap the fire among it takes, May not itself against that fury shield, Even so this crew but small resistance makes, and even a force is driven at last to yield, And leave her undefended to their shame, For whose defence they from Granata came. Now when the passage open did appear, He hastens in the lady fair to see, 
whom he doth find in sad and mourning cheer and leaning of her head against a tree all down her cheeks ran streams of crystal clear she makes such moan as greater could not be and in her countenance was plainly shown great grief for others harms fear for her own her fear increased when as he nearer drew with visage stern and all with blood disdained the cries were great of her and of her crew that to their gods of their ill haps complained for why beside the guard whom late he slew she had that privately with her remained launderers and nurses playfellows and teachers with learned physicians and heathenish preachers now when the pagan prince saw that fair face whose fairer was not to be found in spain he thinks if weeping give her such a grace what will she prove when she shall smile again he deemeth paradise not like this place and of his victory he seeks this gain to have his prisoner suffer him to woo her and yield himself a prisoner unto her howbeit he maketh her against her mind upon her ambling nag with him to ride her masters maids and servants left behind and promised them he will for her provide he will be servitor and nurse and hind and playfellow and governor and guide adieu my friends quoth he are you enlarged for of your mistress i will take the charge the woeful folk all morning part away with scalding sighs cold hearts and watery eyes and one unto another thus they say how deep revenge will her stout spouse devise how will he rage to leave so fair a prey oh that he had been at this enterprise no doubt but he would quickly wreak this slaughter and bring again king stordolano's daughter of this fair prey the prince was well appaid which fortune gave him joined to his might and now it seemed his haste was well allayed that late he made to meet the morning night before he rode in post but now he stayed bethinking where to rest himself that night to find a place was now his whole desire where he might quench his lately kindled fire and first to comfort and assuage the pain of lady dorilus so was her name he frames a tale and most thereof doth feign and swears that he allured by her fame had purposely forsook his home and reign and for her love into these quarters came not that he ought to france or spain that duty but only to the beams of her rare beauty if love deserveth love quoth he then i deserve your liking that have loved you long if stock you do esteem my stock is high sith i am son to agrican the strong if state may stand in steed who can deny to god alone our homage doth belong if value in your choice be of behoof i think this day thereof i have showed proof these words and such as love had then him taught who lent him eloquence to serve his turn so sweetly in her tender fancy wrought that in a little while she ceased to mourn and first her fear assuaged and then her thought a pleasing look doth to her eye return by which the prince in love no novice guessed that she ere long would grant him his request now doth the night approach and phoebus face in ocean's sea begins itself to hide the which did cause them somewhat mend their pace and on their way with greater speed to ride and now they travelled had but little space when first a smoke and then a light they spied then came they where they heard the band-dogs bark when as the air was now obscure and dark a few poor cottages where herdmen dwell they find and there together they alight the houses poor but such as very well might serve them to repose them for a night their fare was mean fit hunger to expel to which the herdmen friendly them invite as courtesy oft times in simple bowers is found as great as in the stately towers but after supper what did pass between dame dorilis and agricana's heir may not be told because it was not seen but they may guess that have with ladies fair by night alone in place convenient been where to disturb them no man did repair i doubt he did not so his passion bridle 
to let so fair a dame lie by him idle but sure i am when daylight did appear they both arose well pleased and well content and thanked the herdmen for their friendly cheer and so from thence they both together went until they came unto a river clear before the forenoon of the day was spent and riding down along the riverside two horsemen with a damsel they espied but let them go for why mine high conceit forbiddeth me long in one path to tread and calls me back of agrament to treat who being newly troubled in his head to hear there were from england succors great under the conduct of rinaldo led to counsel called the princes sage and wise some remedy for mischiefs to devise they all conclude the next ensuing day with scaling ladders on the walls to mount lest dangers new be bred by long delay and succors fresh hinder their first account thus agrament thus doth marsilio say sobrino sage and cruel rodomount who to destroy paris alone doth threat and to pull down the sacred roman seat and to this end they straight provide in haste innumerable ladders apt to scale with timber towers upon great wheels so placed as that they may approach the city wall from whence they may broad bridges safely cast and pass without all jeopardy to fall and throw their balls compact of fiery matter then have they rams the walls to bruise and batter but charles the day that went before the day the paynims meant to do their worst and best did cause the priests and friars mass to say did cause the people all to be confessed and humbly prostrate unto god to pray to save and pity them that were oppressed and then they all received in christian union the blessed sacrament that high communion his self with lords and barons of great fame and humble fear of god in him so wrought in person publicly performs the same and by example others duties taught and calling on our saviour's blessed name o lord said he though i myself be not let not my sin my wickedness and ill move thee thy faithful people's blood to spill and if it be thy sacred will o god to punish us for our so great transgression and make us feel thy hand and heavy rod at least defer this plague and just oppression that by thy foes we be not overtrod we that of thy true faith do make profession lest they blaspheme thy name we overthrown and say thou couldst not defend thine own so shall our fall make them thy law despise so shall their wicked number still increase so shall the power of babylon arise so shall thy sacraments and gospel cease look on this people lord with gracious eyes turn foils and wars to victories and peace that when these dogs and runagates be daunted thy tomb and temple may be daily haunted alas our merits are of none effect to pay a portion of our grievous debt except thy grace our weakness so protect that our misdeeds out of thy sight be set lord heal our souls with grievous vice infect forgive our faults our errors all forget and though our sins the sands in number pass yet let thy mercies greatness them surpass thus prayed the prince most sorrowful and sad with humbleness of heart and great contrition and to this prayer he then avowed doth add well suiting to his state and high condition nor small effect these vows and prayers had for presently without all intermission his angel good up to our saviour mounted and there his vows and prayers all recounted and thousand prayers alike at that same time by messengers alike to god were brought when lo the goodness and the power divine that never shall nor never vain was sought his gracious ear doth to their prayer incline those whom he made and whom he dear had bought then to the angel michael straight he beckoned who not a little of his calling reckoned and thus he said go thither straight in post where now in picardy the christians land and so to paris guide that english host let not their foes their coming understand in this attempt shall silence help you most will him this enterprise to take in hand 
this done, then see you find Dame Discord out, and will her haste unto the pagan rout, and charge her there according to her skill among the best to sow such foul dissension that they may one the other wound and kill, and fill their camp with brawls and with contention. Let some men like their entertainment ill, and grudge because they have no bigger pension, and let them all so vary out of measure that they may do their prince but little pleasure. The blessed angel not a word replies, but doth his maker's holy will obey. Forthwith, even in a moment, down he flies, and where he goes the clouds do fleet away. But by the way he thinks and doth devise of every place where silence find he may. Though he an angel were, he could not tell where this same enemy of speech doth dwell. At last he fully doth himself persuade to find him in some houses of devotion that first for life monastical were made, where godly men, despisers of promotion, dwell far from all this worldly wicked trade, with minds abhorring flesh and fleshly motion, where idle words should count be a shame, and where on every wall they write his name. Wherefore, into an abbey he doth go, and makes no question silence there to find, and peace and charity and love also, and lowly thoughts and well-contented mind. But soon he was aware it was not so. All contrary their humours were inclined, For silence in that abbey doth not host, His name was only writ upon a post, Nor quietness, nor humbleness, nor peace, nor charity, Nor godly love was there. They were sometimes, but now those times do cease. Now covetous and ease and belly cheer, Pride, envy, sloth, and anger so increase That silence banished is and comes not near. With wonder great the angel them doth view And findeth discord in this cursed crew. Her whom the heavenly king did will him find Next after silence, her he findeth first. To seek her out in hell he had assigned Among the spirits damned and accursed. It sore did grieve his pure unspotted mind, Where he expected best to find them worst. It seemed to him a thing uncouth and strange, In sacred place to find so great a change. He knew her by her weed of sundry hue, All patched with infinite unequal lists. Her skin in sundry places naked view, At diverse rents and cuts he made that lists. Her hair was gray and red and black and blue, And hard and soft. In laces some she twists, some hangeth down, Upright some standeth staring, As if each hair with other had been squaring. Her lap was full of writs and of citations, Of processes, of actions and arrests, Of bill, of answers, and of replications, In courts of delegates and of requests, To grieve the simple sort with great vexations. She had resorting to her as her guests, attending on her circuits and her journeys, scriveners and clerks, and lawyers and attorneys. The angel calleth her and bids her go unto the Turks, as fast as she can hie, among their kings such seeds of strife to sow, as one of them may cause the t'other die. Then he demandeth her, if she do know within what place silence doth use to lie. He thought that she that travelled much about in stirring strife might hap to find him out. I cannot call to mind, quoth she, as yet that I have talked with silence any time. I hear them talk of him and praise his wit and secretness to cover any crime, but my companion fraud can serve you fit, for she hath kept him company some time, and which was fraud she pointeth with her finger. Then hence she hies and doth no longer linger. Fraud showed in comely clothes a lovely look, and humble cast of eye a sober pace, and so sweet speech a man might have her took for him that said, Hail Mary, full of grace. But all the rest deformedly did look, full of all filthiness and foul disgrace, hid under long, large garments that she wear, close under which a poisoned knife she bear. The angel asketh her if she do know the place where silence makes his habitation. Forsooth, quoth Fraud, he dwelled long ago with the wise sages of the Greekish nation. Archytas and Pythagoras, I trow, that chief to virtue had their inclination. And afterward he spent these latter years 
with Carmelite and with St. Bennet Friars. But since these old philosophers did fail, and these new saints their saint-like life did change, he sought new places for his most avail, and secret and uncertain he doth range. Sometime with thieves that true men do assail, sometime with lovers that delight in change. Sometime with traitors he doth bide, and further I saw him late with one that did a murder. With clippers and with coiners he doth stay, sometime in secret dens and caves obscure. And oft he changeth places day by day, for long he cannot in a place endure. But I can tell you one most ready way, where you to find him out shall be most sure. Go whereas sleep doth dwell, and out of doubt, at midnight, you shall find him thereabout. Though fraud by custom used to lie and feign, yet was this tale so evidently true, the angel now no longer doth remain, but with his golden wings away he flew to Araby, where, in a country plain, far from all villages and cities view, there lieth a vale with wood so overgrown, as scarce at noon the daylight there is shown. Amid this dark, thick wood there is a cave whose entrance is with ivy overspread. They have no light within, nor none they crave. Here sleep doth couch his ever drowsy head, and sloth lies by that seems the gout to have, and idleness not so well taught as fed. They point forgetfulness the gate to keep that none come in nor out to hinder sleep. She knows no names of men, nor none will learn. Their messages she list not understand. She knows no business doth her concern. Silence is sentinel unto this band, and unto those he coming doth discern, to come no near he beckons with his hand. He treadeth soft, his shoes are made of felt, his garment short and girded with a belt. To him the angel goeth, and in his ear he tells him thus, Jehovah bids you guide Rinaldo, with the succors he doth bear to Paris walls, so as they be not spied, nor let the pagans once suspect or fear their coming, nor for it at all provide, and let them hear no inkling of these foes, until they find their force and feel their blows. No answer silence made, but with his head he made a sign as who should say he would, and with the angel straight himself he sped in greater haste than can be thought or told to Picardy, from whence the angel led that present day the bands of soldiers bold to Paris walls, an hundred miles asunder, yet no man was aware it was a wonder. And silence still surveyeth all the rout, before, beside, behind, with great regard, and with a cloud doth compass them about, no man of them was seen, no noise was heard. Then walketh he among the pagan scout, and unto them that kept their watch and ward, and brought them somewhat, what I do not find, that made them for the time both deaf and blind. Now while Rinaldo came with so great haste, as well it seemed an angel did him guide, and as he went with so great silence past, as by his foes his coming was not spied, King Agramant had now his footman placed by Paris walls fast by the ditch's side. He means the city to assail that day on every side, by all the means he may. He that would take upon him to declare of Agramantus' host the certain number, that to destroy the city did prepare, shall seem himself as fruitlessly to cumber as if he told what flowers in Hibble are, what fish in sea, what water drops in Humber what stars in sky at midnight when it covers the unchaste acts of close and secret lovers. The larum bell in every place doth ring about the town with strange disordered sound. In churches matins they do say and sing, some kneeling down, some groveling in the ground. If gold were unto God so grateful thing, as fond men think, no doubt there would be found enough in this extremity that would make all the saints new images of gold. There might you see godly old men and just lamenting that their lives so long did last, and call them happy that were laid in dust and buried many years and ages past. But gallant youths, devoid of all mistrust, 
not with these perils any whit aghast, whom enemies nor engines none appalls, go to defend right manfully the walls. Bold barons, earls, and dukes of great degree, with soldiers, foreigners, and of the town, did come to Charles and prayed him to agree to let them out and let the drawbridge down. Glad was King Charles their forward minds to see, to fight for Christ's religion at his crown. But yet, as then, he doth not think it best, in this one point, to grant them the request. He rather thinks it better them to place the forces of the fierce assault to break, with distant bands a great or little space according as the wall was strong or weak. Himself, with cheerful vigor in his face, unto them all most courteously doth speak. These he doth comfort, them he doth encourage, and fill the stout with hope, the faint with courage. Fair Paris lieth in a pleasant plain, even in the navel, rather in the heart of France. The river cuts the same in twain, and makes an island of the better part. The rest, that doth in greatness more contain, a ditch and wall doth from the plain depart. King Agramant assaults the western side, as having westward gotten all beside. Marsilio, with the warlike bands of Spain, he points to keep the field in armed ranks. Sabrino, Sage, and those with him remain, are placed upon Saquin's fruitful banks. Himself, with an innumerable train, with ladders, bridges, faggots, bars, and planks, doth think to fill the ditch and make it level, and at the walls to keep unruly revel. What should I speak of Rodamont, most fell blaspheming God, not only scorning men, that knew to use a glittering blade so well, as I so well know not to use my pen. His deeds alone would ask a day to tell, that in few hours he did perform as then. As for the rest, they came like swarms of flies, and filled the air with shouts and hideous cries. And they no less provided are within with rampers, bulwarks, and with double dikes. And where their foes to climb do once begin, they push them down with bills, with staves and pikes. If one be killed, another steppeth in. No man his place for fear of hurt mislikes. Some throw down bricks, some stone, some scalding water, and grieve them much with all, most with the latter. Some throw among them newly slaked lime that burneth most when most it seems to quench, with pots of brimstone, pitch, and turpentine, annoying them with heat and smoke and stench. The rest are still employed and leaves no time with wreathed stakes to fortify the trench. Thus all within were busy, all without, on both sides fortune standing still in doubt. The while the king of Sarza brought about his own and men of diverse other lands, himself to show his might and courage stout that made him counted valiant of his hands, from Cupid's camp was not excluded out, but rather solely subject to such bands. A lion jewels he gives in lofty banner, a lady bridling him in lowly manner. So by the beast he meant his own fierce mind, and by the dame his mistress fair was meant. The bridle was to show how love could bind his lofty heart and bow it to her bent. He little knew that showed himself so kind, how of his purchase others took the rent. He knew not Mandricar did plead possession of her, to whom he makes this kind profession. Straight to the walls a thousand ladders placed, with double ranks that two may climb at once, and up the soldiers get on them in haste, one shoulders up another for the nonce. He that goes slow, and he that climbs too fast, are each in peril of a broken sconce, their enemies assailing still the higher, their captains those that linger or retire. Thus every one do clamor up the wall, for value some, and other some for fear, and some are slain, and some are made to fall, repenting late that ever they came there. Fierce Rodamont alone, contemning all, no pain, no place, for peril doth forbear, but rusheth on more desperately than stoutly, blaspheming God, while others pray devoutly. A pair of currets passing hard he wear, made of an ugly dragon's scaly skin. This armor his great ancestor first bare, he that to build Babel did first begin, a tower whose height should with the clouds compare and thought from God the rule of heaven to win. 
and to the same effect likewise he made of passing proof an helmet, shield, and blade. Thus Rodamond, that came of Nimrod's kind, as proud and irreligious as was he, regardeth not a passage safe to find, or where the wall might weakest guarded be, but with a heart to mischief all inclined, where he the same defended best doth see, protected with his shield, makes he no bones to go through fire and water, darts and stones. When once upon the battlement he was, where all the wall was broad and largely paved, how did he slay the Christians then, alas, how fierce he unto them himself behaved! His blade doth pierce their plates of steel and brass. All were not priests whose crowns that day were shaved. He killed alone so many as their blood did cause the ditch to fill with crimson flood. Beside the baser sort, these men of name, at this same first conflict by him were slain, or Ghetto, Duke that late from Flanders came, Arnold and Hugo, two of Charles's train, and Luz that governed Provence with great fame, Walter and Dennis, haunts of Satelline. Some were thrust through, some had, past all relief, their helmets and their heads cloven to the teeth, and some by force from off the wall he cast, among the which was one, Moscino height, that by his will would never water taste, but still in wine did put his whole delight. But lo, his luck was to be drowned at last within this dirty ditch for further spite, and he that never water could abide in all his life, now here in water died. Thus, while that Rodamont did kill and slay all that he found upon the utmost wall, his band of men the while had found the way to pass the ditch and so the wall to scale. But now within another dyke there lay, the sight whereof their courage did appall. For while the Christians sent such store shot, as this same place did seem to them too hot. The dike was dry, the bottom even and plain, both sides were steep, but steepest next the town. At this the soldiers courtesy do strain, which of them first shall venture to go down. Within the citizens had made a train, with labor great, and cost of many a crown, that when the ditch with armed men was filled, with heat and smother they should all be killed. It cubits had in bread thrice ten and more, and in the bottom there were closely placed barrels of pitch, brimstone, and oil good store, all matter quick to kindle, long to last. The captain led them all the way before, and thousand soldiers followed them as fast. But Rodamont, as though he had had wings, quite o'er the dike, like to a greyhound springs, and being placed on the inner side, Armed and unarmed men to him are like. No steel there was his forces could abide. Death followeth every blow that he doth strike, Which, when a while to their great cost they tried, They do of force abandon quite the dike. He follows, slaying without all remorse, So sharp his sword, so furious is his force. But when the soldiers thought the bank to mount With scaling ladders, as they did the wall, they found themselves deceived of their account, for straight the fireworks were kindled all, whose sudden flames the clouds themselves surmount, which sight the pagans greatly did appall, and to increase their terror and their wonder, it made a noise like to continual thunder. The Christians do rejoice at this relief to see their practice had succeeded well. The pagans, plagued with heat and smother chief, in great despair do roar aloud and yell. Thus 